do have uh, four or five members though, so I think we're, if you're ready, Catherine, I think we're ready to get started here. Okay, I will call the Board of Finance to order on Monday, December 20th at 5 or 6 p.m. And um, uh, just anyone who's a little bit confused about what's going on, we have two members who are here in person, two members who are on the on the Zoom, and I believe uh, our fifth member, Tessa Jenny, will be joining us in person shortly. Uh, but we're going to get started. The uh, first item on the agenda is the agenda. Um, I would welcome a motion. Uh, I'll move the agenda. Okay, thanks, Professor Tracy. Do we have a second? Second by Councillor Hightower. Any discussion of the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Uh, are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We have an agenda, um, and that brings us to the public forum. Um, we do uh, not appear to have anyone here in person wishing to speak to the board. Um, but Tracy is looking to see if you can Is there anyone on Zoom um, who would like to speak? You may use the raise hand function. Okay. Seeing no one looking to be recognized, we will close the public forum. Professor Tracy, we will move to uh, 3.01, which is the reclassification of one role within the Human Resources Department. And um, are you maybe here to speak to this? If neither, uh, how the board like to proceed? Are we uh, ready for a motion or are we doing some discussion? Uh, Tracy. It seems like we've got the first three items. Uh, well, there's a lot of these. I don't know. I don't know if we want to go each individual here. I, I was thinking maybe there might be an option to discuss, just get an overview of everything, but that's a lot. So we've got a lot of room left. So I don't know what's suggested, but I would like to at least hear like a little bit of it. Each, each one does Okay. All right, let's try to, let's, let's try to move through each step, though. Uh, go ahead, Tony. Okay, so the first one uh, being human resources. Uh, we recently recruited uh, a role with less responsibility, a little more grade, a little more salary involved, and didn't feel that we were able to get the caliber of um, applicant that we were looking for. So we decided to bolster the job description, uh, reassess the human resources department, and we have. Um, a higher level goal to present them for your approval today. Catherine, speak to that. Um, Tony, that is great. I would just add that um, when we were unsuccessful in the recruit, um, we approached some of the human resources partners that we work with uh, both formally and informally um, to get some advice on why we weren't able to get a quality candidate. So it's not like we simply had an unsuccessful recruit and then immediately jumped to this. Uh, there was a pause um, and certainly a period um, of reflection and seeking input. Um, I also want to thank Tony for stepping in um, on this night when there are a lot of HR items. Director Jerfy intended to be here um, and has great family news because she's becoming a grandmother again as we speak, so she can't be here. And thank you, Tony, for stepping in. Um, are we ready for a motion? Questions? Councilor Paul. Uh, thanks, I'm not on mute, yes. Um, you know, I don't know if this is a, I mean, this is a question for certainly this position, but also, um, you know, President Tracy had mentioned, you know, just an overview of the others. It appears as though, 
and I don't know if this is a general generalization that you can make or not, but it appears as though, um, at least in this case and in several of the others, that um, it was either a reclass or a retitling, um, and in many cases, um, the position, um, like in this case, it went from uh, a benefits manager to a benefits and risk management. Um, and the grade increased from a 19 to a 23. Um, did the position change because you were having a difficult time finding someone at a 19 and by adding additional responsibilities, you were able to make the job more attractive to candidates? So that is a piece of it. Um, the other um, people that we spoke to, both um, our experts at Hickok and Boardman, and Tony, help me out. The other firm, everyone knows the big HR. Gallagher Flynn, thank you. Um, in talking to both of them, um, a big thing, um, challenge that we've been trying to overcome, um, not just in HR, but elsewhere in the city, is um, making sure that we have a clearly identified deputy position in each of the departments. And frankly, what we have seen in HR is that um, because it's a mayoral appointment, there are lags and we have a great HR team, but it is a team of equals. And so we really need to create more of a named deputy assistant director, not just to hire someone, but to keep this team going in between mayoral appointments and to really provide additional leadership. So that's the real driving force here was we decided this, we don't know when we'll get to create another um, position in such a small department. So we should take the opportunity to do that now. Um, okay, all right, that answers my question. Okay, I think we're still, uh, we have a motion. So, um, questions or are we ready for a motion? Council Paul. Thanks. So um, I'll make a motion to take the recommended action as listed on board docs for item 3.01. If we're doing these one at a time, and I assume we are. I'll second that. Thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are you opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to 3.02, creation and classification of one DCA position. Okay. Well, you want to give a quick, uh, might give a quick summary. Yes, yeah. Phil, Steve, Lorraine, or Sarah. I'm sure they can speak to this much better. Um, but basically, um, this was envisioned as a initially support for the sponsorship aspect of DCA in a service capacity or temporary role. And um, kind of after looking at the organization a little more strategically and kind of assessing the needs of uh, DCA as it currently sits, um, they decided to, to add this as a regular role that encompasses not only the support piece for the sponsorship um, and that arm of DCA, but also the marketing support that is needed. I believe there was quite a gap for like one full role for two positions, um, for, for one position. So kind of looking at the needs were to kind of combine that to this one. I would just add that um, when I first spoke with Doreen and Sarah about this, this was um, originally two positions and they have an incumbent candidate who um, is able to fill a full-time position to move from part-time to full-time. 
And this is obviously something that in our current climate, the need for um, development resources is only accelerating. So it does not seem that limited service um, is appropriate. So it's something we would want to, to make sure was regular. Um, so that was the thinking behind that. Yeah, thank you, Catherine and Tony. Uh, the floor is up. Just promoting Councillor Jang here. Hold on one second. Welcome, Councillor Jang. We are on. Item 3.02, we just had a quick introduction of it. Um, any discussion or are we ready for a motion? Councilor Paul. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll make a motion um, uh, to take the action as recommended on board docs. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Tracy. Um, discussion. Seeing none. We'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to uh, three point oh three, which is the classification reclassification of the CEDO assistant director of the administration and finance position. I need to do a quick uh, summary here. Also, excuse me, uh, Mayor Director Pine is also on the line. Okay, yes. Uh, Brian, um, would you like to take the lead on kicking this off? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'll be brief. The um, the reason for seeking uh, a reclassification of this position is, is because the duties of um, this assistant director really shifted um, in 2020 and took on um, significant additional responsibilities with respect to our department budget and continues to be um, a core function of this position. And as a result, um, that level of responsibility in addition to increased oversight of um, a number of new initiatives um, at, the, at the sort of managerial level uh, it just seemed like it was it was time to revisit, and so we, HR went through the reclassification and uh, using the Willis system, of course, and came came up with a um, a bump up from uh, from the previous classification to uh, what's being proposed here. So it's from a 22 to a 24, and um, we have um, we have the ability to absorb that in um, in our existing budget, so it doesn't require um, any budget amendment. But um, we felt that this was appropriate to bring this forward now. Very good, thank you, Councilor Pine. Um, floor is open. Uh, I would like to make the motion as indicated on board now. Thank you, Councilor Jang, is there a second? Second. Second from Councilor Paul. Uh, discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to 3.04, which is the reclassification of four clerk treasurer positions. Uh, Catherine, would you like to kick this off? Or Tony has also been offering excellent support on this. Um, I will just say, um, in this uh, motion, I am asking to reclassify two CT positions up and two CT positions down. Um, and this is uh, because, as I have mentioned previously, uh, we have had and are still having several members of CT retire. 
Um, and as we um, are looking at responsibilities, it is allowing for some members of our team to take on expanded roles. And that's what the reclassifying up is. And so as they take on more, um, we can hire for um, more entry level um, and hope to fill those positions and again, provide professional development. So that's what we're going for in CT. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Kat. Uh, board, like, um, just recognizing that these are community positions, just wondering what conversa the conversations look like with asking on this. Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, we follow the CPA to the letter here and want uh, to comment in advance of our grading and then also share the grading results with them after. There are no disagreements. So with what we ended up scoring. Thank you. Wait for a motion or further discussion. I would like to make the motion as indicated on Bondaha. Thank you, Councilor Chang. Second. Second by Councillor Hall. Um, further discussion. We're on three point oh four. Seeing, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, We'll move then to 3.05, reclassification of the limited assistant to limited service asset management coordinator to regular full-time asset management and GIS coordinator and move to I and C department. Now this one is very confusing, which is why I'm going to ask that uh, about who would speak to it. Surprisingly, it's Director Martha Keenan, who is the current supervisor, and she's joining us by Zoom. So I would ask that she give us a quick intro, please. So the asset management has been, was originally under my position when I was in public works. And um, it's over the time of the asset management program being implemented, uh, it has turned out that this position has done a lot with GIS and also with various software programs and ended up working with both Scott Duckworth and Jay Appleton extensively on this and really is a software-based position that deals with all of the various different departments. And therefore, uh, HR looked at where it might sit and came up with INT. And so that is the request. Uh, I would just <laughs> Sorry, I would just add that um, the other request is to take it from limited service to full time. Um, and we are so grateful to DPW, specifically um, our friends Chapin, Spencer, and Norm Baldwin um, for getting this asset management program up and running. Um, most of you know I was in the office for something like two to three weeks before COVID. During that time, Chapin um, harangued me into a lunch at the Great Northern and made me think like, life at the city is going to be so awesome. I love this place. I love these people. And got me all on board with asset management. And now, two years later, we have an actual program and it's um, doing really well, um, and we realize that you can't just have a software program. We will continue to need a coordinator to help us with the care and feeding, and that's what this is. Thank you for filling that out. That's a, that's a uh, thank, I, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to cut um, 
anyone off. Um, I would make a motion to the actions as recommended in board docs. Okay. Second by person Tracy, discussion. Yes, a um, couple, couple of questions. And I think the first one is, you know, I understand limited service to full time. I understand that and also to move it from a department to another one, but I did not understand why the pay grade has to change. Um, he is doing many more things than was in his original job description. There is actually a request for retro pay as he has been doing uh, duties above and beyond the actual job description. And when we asked him to list them and then had it graded, it came out at a higher grade. And also based on my understanding, oops, sorry. Based on my understanding also, we did hire a, an asset management consultant. And I remember them doing a presentation to the city council last year or two years ago. Um, so now that we have a full-time position, will we require in the future hiring a consultant to help support this type of work? No, um, we have actually, um, the consultant is still helping us finalize our implementation, but on completion of the uh, implementation, we will be on our own and working with our team within, within the city. For the question. Thank you. There uh, further discussion. We'll be a motion is that like ready. So if there's no further discussion, we will we will vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Creation, this elimination and creation. This is a more DPI item. Welcome, Director Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. See you look at my watch. I will keep it brief. <laughs> I have a hard time with it. But no, no, it's okay. No, I'm uh, no, wasn't right. excited about this because it's one of the biggest changes since we went to the uh, one stop shop and then got into the permit software, but we are in a position now to request the elimination of a position, a customer service position, and repurpose that and create a second electrical inspector. What we have is a new software system, a permitting software called OpenGov that has created a lot of efficiencies and allowed our staff to work a lot better together, not just with themselves, but with the public. As one of the great advantages, we have fewer lobby visits. Staff estimate that it's probably greater than 75% reduction in the number of customers that physically now come into the office. Many of the ones that physically still come in actually want to do that for some purpose or another or to meet with someone. But the financial changes have meant that about 90% of the financial transactions are now taking place online rather than in person. So we had a staff member who left to go into the uh, CEDO department, part of the LED program. And as a result, that customer service position was vacant. We asked our staff what the greatest need was. They almost unanimously said, Tim Hennessy, who's doing a great job as our electrical inspector, needs some help because he's regularly backed up for weeks for inspections. It's probably the number one complaint I get from customers that they'd like to have inspections faster. So this feels like a win-win that we can help Tim out, we can help customers out, reduce that wait time, and the result will be something that we can do in a budget neutral fashion for this year because we've had that vacancy from the current position and we're looking to fill a second position as a permit tech. That position's been open for a few months now. We have a little extra of revenue to be able to cover the difference between the grade 14 and grade 19 position that'll be created. And again, I think this will be a great benefit to all of our customers and particularly to our staff. Excellent. Uh, service Commissioner Hall, you have an area where we get a lot of requests for that's Paul. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Um, Phil, just wanted to say, um, you know, kudos to you for um, uh, seeing a tremendous opportunity and uh, 
um, and, and, and addressing it this way. I don't know how many times I've heard from people about the amount of wait time on electrical inspections and um, seeing this opportunity with a, a person who is resigning to take another job within the city and being able to get a second electrical inspector, I think is just awesome news. So um, congrats and um, um, if it's not inappropriate, I'm happy to make the motion as recommended on board docs at this time. Excellent, thank you, Councilor Paul. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Councilor Chang. Uh, further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Bill. It's a good way. Um, we will now move to the creation of one regular position in the Office of City Planning. Welcome to the table. Our still new, I think we can still call it that for a little while, Director of Planning, Megan Tuttle. Um, Megan, you want to give us a short preview here? Overview. Sure. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, really glad to be bringing this position to you tonight, and thanks to Tony for all of his help in uh, getting this position graded and um, all of the details associated with it to be able to bring forward to you tonight. Um, this position emerged out of the opportunity that was created by um, a position that was actually in our FY22 budget to create a senior policy advisor position. Uh, we were originally anticipating that that would be a 0.6 FTE position that would be filled at a high level of expertise. Uh, we were anticipating the transition of our previous director into that role. Um, with his departure, we reevaluated the needs of our department and the opportunities for creating capacity within the department and felt that we were much better positioned to bring on capacity at a level that could support a broad range of projects within the department and support the work of the principal planner as well. Um, so this position is to create a planner at a grade 18 within the department to support our long range plan planning policy and planning position work. Thank you, Megan. Um, the floor is open. I'll move the record to the board box. Thank you, Person Tracy. Is there a second? Second question. Sorry. Our tower discussion. Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now go to 3.08, our public works. Handling, classifying, eliminating, and many positions within the technical system. Open to you, Ben and Norm. Why would you like to kick us off, Norm? Go ahead. Yep, so uh, thank you for uh, indulging me in all this long list of items. Uh, public Works, Engineering, Tech Services team. I've seen a lot of changes over the years and continues to see more changes. And, uh, so uh, this is an attempt to reconcile all the issues that exist within the team as they exist today and with the work that will change in the future. So one of those is the uh, retitling of the Works engineer to Fort Works transportation engineer. As some of you may know, uh, we also have the engineering teams within the water resource team. So the retitling of this position is really kind of aligned with the work that my team does, which is primarily in the, in the right of way itself in the transportation system. That's the first thing. The second one is the reclassification of our two associate public works engineers from grade 17 to 19. So the associate public works engineer positions and many of the positions within our team, we're trying to create this um, ladder, career ladder in this team. And what we found when Sue, Susan uh, was on, that there were gaps between positions and there wasn't a great amount of overlap enough to have people move up within the team. So some of these descriptions really reflect a few things. One is 
the need desires to have some measure of overlap kind of positions for grilling, but also acknowledging with Susan's absence that we needed to cover many things with the existing team we had. And so uh, there, there was an increased responsibility with associate engineers in terms of financial management and also smaller contracts. Moving right along, uh, the reclassification and excavation inspector. That request comes from, uh, we are more strictly enforcing and managing our property rights within our right away. Traditionally, that's been a rule both by myself and uh, Laura Wheelock, the senior engineer, but clearly with all of the work that we've got going on, there's no way we can focus that kind of energy and effort. And so the excavation inspector has been asked to step into that role in meeting with the license committee and uh, company owners to reconcile any sort of property rights issues that remain or exist. There is uh, also, as you've seen, uh, the uh, parklets and those sort of things in the right of way that need to be uh, inspected, licensed, and uh, presented from the council. So those things total have added responsibilities to the excavation inspector. Uh, I would also note that uh, the next item is a vacant. We are looking to vacate the capital asset program manager from the responsibilities of this team to the equipped charger's office. It seems it, it, it makes sense that the general fund have a central office that has no vested interest in the decisions that relate to capital asset management and the priorities it sets. So we, we are in agreement with the equipped charger's office to have that position relocated. Martha had uh, obviously resigned her position and took an opportunity with the CT office. Um, and then one last item, and that is the, uh, we've heard from both the public and council in this last budget presentation that there was an interest in doing more active transportation, those, those sorts of activities. This does require a significant amount of civil support beyond the transportation planning that occurs. As a result, we're asking and requesting in lieu of uh, the loss of one position with the asset manager to add this public works transportation engineer to the to our org staff. So that is the long list of items. I'm certainly welcome to answer any questions you may have. Floor is open. So one one question that I had was with the the retype. Of the, uh, if, I, I guess I'm curious as to um, there's a number of people at a grade 21. Uh, it looks like they had birth in like they have different levels of support to them. So I'm just wondering with that retype, like why those decisions were when they were to keep them all at that same level. Looks like some people like like you have one who's at the grade twenty one who's just a who is not just who is a public uh, works transportation engineer and then it's a senior transportation planner. Is that uh, just the difference of the engineer and the owner? Yeah, so the engineering positions are different planning positions and degrees of responsibility and background experience. Okay, and do you think that this will help with the you know, one of the issues is like the, the Absolutely, that's the goal of why we would uh, seek to add this position to try to respond to those public okay. requests that are form that we are now. The other thing is, there's a lot of uh, quick builds out there that we need to focus some of our civil design to construct permanent. So transitioning from quick builds to more permanent solutions, as well as trying to deal with traffic problems. So, right, right. In the same way. Yeah, that's also important. Yes, sir. It's all the same. It works. Right. This is the hope that we'll, we'll uh, have a positive effect in trying to resolve some of those outstanding balance issues. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Further discussion? Motion. Is 
So I'll move to approve and recommend the, uh, the recommended action on the board docs. Good. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Council Jang. Uh, further discussion? We'll go to vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Very opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Reclass vacation positions within the city attorney's office. Good evening. Um, I'm here to talk about. Uh, Three uh, positions, two are reclassification, one is a retitling in the city attorney's office. Uh, the first two are uh, reorganization, re modification for existing positions. Uh, as specifically, we're creating a deputy city attorney position and we're creating what we've called the director of litigation. The first of which would be uh, Justin St. James' position, uh, the second is Kim Sturman's. Position. Uh, the reason for this is uh, this is sort of a long in the making uh, reclassification to create a sort of clear line of or chain of command such that when the city attorney is unavailable, who will lead the office? And that would be the deputy city attorney. Uh, but in doing that, we decided um, that we really needed sort of a, a twofold uh, examination. The deputy city attorney is really sort of inwardly facing, administratively facing uh, for the office to help me um, with the, uh, both the internal legal advice that we give to the city, as well as to uh, the administration of the city attorney's office. The director of litigation in Kim's position is really trying to house under one sort of roof um, coordination of all the external and third party litigation that the city is either involved in because of statutory obligations, zoning, um, or uh, because of liability that the city is either uh, being challenged on action or is taking against a, a third party. Uh, and so with these three classifications, I think we, we empower both of these. We also recognize uh, the two most senior attorneys in the office. Um, and I think it is a great recruitment and retention tool uh, because it recognizes experienced uh, legal training and experience and um, a background as a way of making sure that we have um, the, the best of the best in the city attorney's office. The other position is more of a retitling. It doesn't involve any change in salary and that is the uh position that we're recall that we're calling the public uh records officer and it's essentially a refocusing of this public information position that previously was shared between my office and the clerk treasurer's office the idea is that we're going to put it entirely in my office and it's going to be focused on public record responses uh and the idea is that this person can have function at a sort of higher, higher level of doing a lot of the exemption review and work uh, right out the gate to make our public records responsiveness more timely, more efficient, um, and to avoid, you know, engaging an attorney uh, review of some of these documents, records, uh, or body camera footage, if need be, uh, and just give the, this public records officer sort of a greater ability in recruiting a, a person of greater experience in that to make that efficient um, and to further that. Uh, aim of the office. So those are the three positions. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have. I'd also notice that both Justin and, and Kim are here. They're happy to answer questions. Uh, very excited to give them this opportunity to really sort of recognize the work that they've already been doing uh, and that they hope to do in the coming year. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I know it's been something that's been in the works for a long time. Um, uh, are you suggesting that there's, there's questions you can speak for? Yes. Um, so the floor is open for um, discussion or 
Motion. So I just have a, a question um, on the, so two questions. The first is that on your memo, um, on page two of your memo, I think that there was sort of an internal question that you were asking and then probably I, I presume got the answer. It was sort of like a, um, way at the bottom, right after, right before Board of Finance motion, it said need information about how this will be paid for in FY22. Um, uh, yeah, that is a typo. That was answered by the table above it. Um, okay. All right. Thanks. I, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't something else I was missing. Um, and then the other is... Um, you know, it seems as though the responsibilities of these positions, um, they're not the same, um, but they're, it seems as though they would be, you know, the, the salaries should be comparable. I mean, you're asking one to be essentially and effectively the stand-in for the city attorney, should the city attorney not be there or, you know, for whatever reason, the city attorney is not able to respond. Um, and I guess I'm just trying to understand why there is such a, a fairly significant difference in the um, reclass salaries. If the responsibilities are changing, wouldn't that be an opportunity for then the, the positions to be comparable in terms of reclass salary? Well, if I can answer that, they are comparable in terms of grade, uh, but they are different in terms of step because the current occupants of these offices uh, occupy different steps. If you start with their current status, uh, you know, uh, Attorney St. James is at 24-7, where his attorney servant is at 24-15. So when, my understanding is that when you apply the new reclassification, you, you can't ignore their sort of uh, pre-existing uh, salary because this upgrade, this reclassification has to represent a certain, certain percentage. That said, if we do refill this with, with new people, they will ultimately be the same uh, because they are at the same level and they are above the other three city attorney, assistant city attorneys um, at the same level. So going forward, they'll start to look more like each other, but the idea that they're gonna be precisely the same, uh, I think can't work in the way, my understanding that the um, reclassification and uh, step analysis works. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Further questions, or are we ready for a motion? <laughs> Councilor Paul. Um, I'll take, I'll make a motion to take the action as recommended in board docs. Great, is there a second? Yep, by Councilor Gay. Thank you, Councilor Chairman. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are you opposed? Carries you know, Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Tony, for all that work. Busy time at HR. <laughs> so, next uh, up is 3.10 with authorization to extend contract term. Same contract terms for Park Mobile Park Payment Systems. Uh, welcome back, Jeff Chapin. Want to take this off? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, fundamentally, we have a contract with Park Mobile as a five year contract, and it expires a year from the end. And we are on the cusp of making some pretty uh, big strides in how we use Park Mobile. Um, particularly, we're interested in expanding its usage in the resident parking program. So that we don't have to hand out hard copy permits to thousands and thousands of people and have those thousands of people manage all of those thousands of pieces of paper, all the things that come with hard copy. 
Um, so as we dive into that at the beginning of the next year, we're very concerned that if we make that jump around June, July, August, we would have to go out to bid because this contract would expire at the end of the year. So it would take a couple months for the bid process, and if we, want, if we had a vendor, it would take a couple months of transition. It creates a lot of instability in the environment. Um, so what we're asking for is an extension of two years on the Park Mobile contract that would give us a three-year runway to create some innovative, revolutionary-style products for our uh, residents and visitors to Berlin. Um, and give us the time to really develop them properly, have a nice, solid, honest relationship with Park Mobile, so that you can partner with us um, to develop these products and, and, and get a balanced degree. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff in the memo. I'm happy to answer questions, but that's the, that's the way it talks. How would the board like to proceed? Questions? Tracy. Burlington has a huge adoption. We're at over 60% of our mobile on the streets right now. And we're running a pilot program in the Vermont. And from the start, we called it the marketplace from the start, we were at 55%. So well over half of the people choosing to use Park Mobile. Um, there are people that, that don't want another app. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's a, 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 a perspective, but that's fine. But I don't have that. Um, but for the people that use it and have adopted it, they really have a lot of positive. Um, I got some positive feedback today. Somebody came to my office and said, I really love this because when I go to meetings, I get a notification 18 minutes before my time expires and I pop another dollar. So that's right and in cases where the feedback hasn't been so glowing, or you've been able to address those with Park Mobile even before this, or in this, this, new, this new contract? Well, it's usually, it's usually around just an aversion to using the phone. So we, have, we still have kiosks. We still pay every meter. You pay with a credit card at the meter. You pay with a coin at the meter. In the garages, you can pay with a kiosk. With a credit card, with a coin, and on the street, like St. Paul Street has kiosks. We have multiple ways to pay. And even with Park Mobile, you can pay by text, you can pay by phone. So we've got almost two too many ways to pay. Right? Uh, so that's usually where the discussion revolves around. It's not that they don't like Park Mobile because they don't like Park Mobile, it's they don't like the concept of okay. I'll just add one thing to it. They have been responsive when issues have arisen. We have had issues such as the concern over the, uh, the zero to toe issue. Some people entered zero to the license plate uh, or O's into the license plate, but they're really zeros. And we have found, that, you know, that was an issue that we've had to work with locally in terms of our enforcement team and how we handle it. Clearly, content was a big issue. But in terms of functional uh, concerns, Park Mobile has been a partner. We have evolved our offerings with them. They started this pilot program in 2017. I, prior to Jeff taking this over, I found to be a responsive partner. And uh, Jeff's experience has been something. So. Okay. okay. And then just the last question is just that, you know, to that end of the memo on the Tonight, you reference wanting to continue to work and evolve the market systems. So, does this agreement preserve the, the flexibility necessary in order to, to make further changes to our system and be open to, to working with us? Yeah, they're, they've actually been willing to expand their services to us and retail some of the things that you're doing. They're willing to extend some of their, their services to us, either at a discount or for free. Uh, and we're interested in taking advantage of their services. Okay, that's fine. I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I actually uh, worked with them close for the past month, six weeks, to sort of work through this. I do have a, a, a document from them that's a sort of a scope of work outline on the ability to work through the next couple of years. Okay, all right, thank you. Any further discussion? Are we ready for motion? I think the collaboration with Park Mobile was really made this in the right direction. A number of years now, it's 
support of the for support of this. That's Paul. Uh, thanks, um, Mayor. I'm happy to make the motion uh, as recommended in board jobs. Thank you, Councilor Paul. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Discussion, questions? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. That's all. And that brings us to 3.11. Um, it's a request for an additional $750,000 for property tax by property tax flag issue. This is something Catherine's a number of counters work into. Catherine, why don't you see it off for us? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in September, uh, Cara and I and others came to you um, and requested two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars to help alleviate the property tax. <laughs> excuse me, lag, um, as we've called it, um, and this is um, to account for the reappraisal. Um, and understanding that the state system um, is pro has provided payments um, that uh, are not uh, sufficient. Um, there is this lag. Um, they are providing based on the old numbers, not the new numbers. Um, we've done a lot of work on this um, to make sure that we understand um, the exact population um, that we want to help and that we're going to help. And thanks to um, the CT team, especially Jason Gao and Tracy Paquette, um, they designed a spreadsheet that allows us to see exactly which homeowners would be eligible under which criteria. So um, you'll see just a bit ago, um, we put together some updated criteria based on very useful conversations with Councillor Carpenter and Barlow, um, who've been part of the um, committee looking at um, the reappraisal process um, and hearing um, our uh, our community members um, who need hearings in this process. They've devoted a lot of time to that, and they had feedback for me um, on how we could help the most people. So the ask tonight. Um, is for an additional $750,000 of ARPA money. That brings the fund up to a million dollars. That allows us to help just over, um, it's close to 1,100 property taxpayers. Um, and the grants, um, and I say grants, but really um, these would be credits applied to their tax bills. Um, hopefully in advance of the next payment uh, due March 12th would be no more than $2,000. Uh, because of the work that my team has done, we know exactly who these people are. Um, so we will proactively reach out to them to try and make that um, process of applying as easy as possible. Um, we'll of course also do the usual press conferences, put it on the website, ask all of you to um, get it out via Front Porch Forum. Um, but we're fortunate that we know exactly who it is um, and we can reach out to them one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And um, it's something um, that you know we do have the capacity in our office to work with taxpayers to do this and then to refer them to the RRC if they need additional help. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for your hard work on this. How would the board like to proceed? Questions? 
Okay. We have Councilor Carpenter here who is in front of this. Uh, sir, if you'd like to. I also neglected um, to mention um, Councillor Hansen has also been involved in our conversations and I wanted to thank him for his time and support as well. Um, really, I don't have a lot to add. I want to really thank Catherine and her staff. It was a little hard to wrap your head around how to get to this because there's a lot of moving parts, particularly understanding how interrelated to the tax credit that was supposed to have come from the state. But um, I think we're okay with it. I think it, it, it's about as broad as it can be, given all the moving parts. I appreciate Catherine's willingness to let us play around with it and be plugged in lots of numbers and lots of scenarios to arrive at the one that we're presenting tonight. And I would support us doing that. Councilor Paul. I have a question. Um, you um, you posted a new, um, you know, a new memo, a revised memo um, online, um, actually probably a few minutes just before the uh, Board of Finance meeting started. So I, I just now have had a chance to take a look at it. And it appears as though the, the change is simply the increase in the assessed value. Um, so I, before it was the median median home, and now it's five hundred thousand. Um, and I'm just wondering how you arrived at that number, as opposed to say five hundred and fifty thousand or four hundred and seventy five. Um, if you could maybe explain that the, the the logistical, you know, how you arrived at that. Well, we. A little working group would get we, we plugged in a lot of different numbers um you need to understand that the eligibility is is you're either in or you're out so 350 which is the median home price um seemed too low relative to that was going to be an absolute cutoff if we put it at 600,000, it, it includes more people but it costs more money so it was kind of the strategy of trying to get people that um, would have been impacted. And the thing that's a little harder to grab your head around, there's a criteria that says last year you received at least a $1,200 credit. A lot of people get credit, but it's a small amount of money. So that number should be a determinant of need. The higher that number is, um, the more needy you would have been. And so it was just sort of balancing it. And I think to be honest, it, it was just trying to seem fair. Um, I think a million dollars is a lot of money. And so we were just trying to kind of keep it in that bailiwick, hit who we thought was the most needy. We will hear from people whose house is five hundred and ten thousand dollars, and they're not going to be eligible. Um, um, I would just add to that, counselors. Um, it was more art than science, Councillor Paul. Um, but when we made the change up to five hundred thousand, the one other change we did make, um, which um, Councillor Carpenter is referencing, is the first draft had the minimum state payment at fifteen hundred. We dropped that down to twelve hundred to make a few more people eligible, and. Um, wanting to keep the total ask at a million. Um, I was trying to keep the total liability at about 1.2, um, figuring that undoubtedly we still have mistakes in here. There will be people who say they're, you know, don't want to take it for whatever reason, but uh, I was trying to keep us in the ballpark, as Bob Rustin would say. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I guess what I was just questioning is simply if you're increasing that, you're decreasing something else, it should include more people, um, which means that the 750, which is unchanged, you know, it's sort of like a, you know, any mathematical equation, one thing goes up, one thing goes down. Yep. How do you, you know, how do you keep 
this, you know, and it was seem as though in this case, putting up one thing and something else going down should mean more people, which should translate to more than 750. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll trust that you've, you've, that there's, there's, there's other things at play. And if it includes the people that need it most, then, you know, I'm happy to support it. We have dialed in with people, and I'm sure we'll hear from them. Be mindful of the state credit. It's very complicated. It's effectively a sliding scale. And we actually had earlier conversations about should you do a sliding scale? Should you do a means to an asset test? And at the end of the day, it just seemed it would be phenomenally a lot of work to get a one year short term relief relative to the lack of. People's taxes who now have a much more expensive house or valued house will be paying more taxes. We hope the state will catch up, and some of them will not be caught up with. And that's going to be like a whole different problem. This is really only to catch that lag um, this year. Further questions for the discussion? We, uh, we are still waiting a motion. Uh, before the motion, I wanted to just ask about it's not technical question, but how the property owner who are eligible will be will know about this now. How will we reach them? Great question, Councilor Jane. Can you speak to that, Governor? Sure. Um, so our staff is planning to reach out to them with um, a direct mailing, uh, letting them know that they are eligible um, and making it as easy as possible for them to get the credit. Um, they'll essentially just need to sign a postcard and return it. It'll already be um, addressed and stamped. Um, in case they forget that or lose that, it'll be on the website, Front Porch Forum. I'm sure we'll ask uh, the mayor to include it in a press conference um, and you know all the usual methods. Um, but we do expect um, a lot of people um, by including it with um, in a mailer, uh, probably with a regular property tax bill and then another reminder um, will be a very effective technique. And your team won't require a coordinator of this program. It's just going to be embedded on the job. Yes, okay. uh, thankfully, um, one of the positions that you just approved for reclassification, um, she will be taking this on and can administer it. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, I make the motion as, you're looking for the motion, right? Uh, we are still looking for a motion, yep, if you're ready. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll make the motion as indicated on board. Great, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, President Tracy. Further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the vote, please say aye. 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 Very aye. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Council Carpenter and Catherine for your hard work on this, as well as the others, uh, Council Barlow and Council Gates. Um, we, that brings us through that section of the agenda, I'm pretty sure, right? And now we are at the Board of Finance approval only. We have one item, uh, Council Initiative Funding Request on behalf of the Advocate Committee on Redistricting. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, $9,475 proposal from Council Paul, would you like to speak to it further, Council Paul? Uh, sure, um, tried to um, send out a, a memo that's attached in board docs. It's a request for 
uh, council initiative funds to cover the cost or the charges that have been incurred by CEDO on behalf of the ad hoc committee. Um, uh, the fall as you as you may as all of the count counselors may recall, we passed a, um, a resolution unanimously in June um, about the and that included on redistricting and that included the creation of an ad hoc committee. CEDO did go ahead and place a half page ad in the North Avenue News um, in November to get the word out on the survey and on the work of the, um, the ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee also met six times. Their last one was just a couple of days ago. And um, in addition, they did have um, uh, uh, coverage of their meetings on CCTV. So the total is um, the cost of a contract with third sector associates um, who did the facilitation work, the North Avenue News ad, and the estimated cost for CCTV services. Um, and then it was the request of uh, CEDO that um, uh, given that we, they don't have all of the final costs, um, that we give them a little bit of leeway, um, which is for which is why the the difference between the ninety three twenty five and the ninety four seventy five, and uh, Director Pine is on is um, on Zoom for this meeting. Um, if there were other questions, I would I would suggest they be asked of him. <laughs> further further discussion questions. Yes, it's more for Councillor Paul. Okay. Um, and was just wondering, you know, the relationship that we have with CCTV, um, do we have, you know, they request funding from the city all the time. They have done it already for 2022. And were they in that contract, were they like the number of meetings they need to cover for the city? And w w is this an addition, these six meetings that they cover? I believe it is, Councillor Jang. I, I don't. I don't know for sure. I know that we are. We have a specific number per month, and then also the NPA um, meetings. And you know, my my understanding of their budget, and you also were the CCTV rep um, last year, is that they um, they don't really they don't they don't charge us what they probably should be charging us. They do more meetings than. Then is probably covered in their in their budget, and these were not budgeted for. So, thus the additional cost. And my understanding from Director Pine is that, you know, CEDO runs a pretty tight budget, and it's really not in their budget either. So, um, he came to me and asked me if I would make the recommendation that we take Councilor Initiative funds uh, to pay for this. Yeah, I support it. Thank you. I second. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. So um, I think Councilor Jane may have just said he seconded it, but I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, did Councilor Paul, did you did you actually move it or sort of? I, I haven't, but I can also move. Okay, thank you. Is that a second, Councilor Jane? Yep, second. Great. Any further discussion? We'll go to vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> And that brings us to the final item, I believe, which is the presentation regarding the challenges of the fiscal year 23 capital budget um, uh, with the uh, bond not, proposed bond not getting to the two thirds amount required. Um, I wanted to bring the board finances and the challenges we face as a result of that. Um, so, see, Martha, you turn your camera on. Are you going to leave this part of the discussion? Sure, I actually have Chapin and Norm and Catherine and Brian are all on the capital committee, so they can uh, all come forward and chime in as uh, needed because we're all in the boat together. Um, so we did not succeed in on December 7th. Um, and so looking, the capital committee has been looking really uh, hard at their budget and their obligations and what that means to us. And we wanted to make sure that we brought this forward to the council so that they would understand as we move into the budgeting season and next year, 
what that really means to the capital work around the city. Um, we have been averaging 18 to $30 million a year for our budget. And in the coming year, we have um, about $5 million of revenues available to us. Annually, we get $2 million for the uh, CIP. And additionally, uh, we have been making use of the street capital tax, which is restricted to street sidewalks and local matches. Uh, our perks get their penny for perks and impact fees. And then we do receive um, some general fund dollars that cover uh, our existing master leases. Um, so to go along with that, we have some obligations that are within that budget that, that will limit us in this coming year. Um, we have project management salaries, uh, an MOU with Flynn Avenue, a number of uh, grants that we have local matches for. And then we um, provide dollars to the general fund operating budget through work that is done in the right of way group um, on our sidewalks. So what are we going to be able to do in this coming year? We're going to be able to continue on all of these committed grant projects. So the rail yard enterprise, the Shelburne Road Roundabout, Champlain Parkway, Intervale Park. Um, there are lots of really good uh, Lake Street side path, Man Mansfield side path, and a number of Penny for Parks projects. So there is a lot that we'll continue on. We will have reduced paving and reduced sidewalk, although um, in talking to uh, senior engineer uh, Laura Wheelock, she did let me know that the state and uh, is doing a lot of paving in the coming year. So we actually will get more paving in the coming year than the one mile that we can afford. Um, so that will be a help to us. What won't we be able to do? And unfortunately that list is a lot longer. Um, so we won't be able to do any preventive maintenance on either streets or sidewalks or any curb work. There will be no new fleet purchases or master lease in the coming year, no new fire trucks. Uh, the public safety infrastructure with uh, both radio and video will not be there. Uh, IT is, has their capital budget within our budget and there won't be any uh, dollars for that or um, the facilities budget. Uh, the transportation planning budget with enhanced traffic calming uh, does not have any dollars. Uh, there isn't any contingency. There isn't any room for any park special projects, um, three of which are uh, revenue generating, the Boathouse, North Beach, and Arbor Dredging. And then we just passed an ordinance this past year in public art, and um, we're looking forward to putting that into our new capital projects, and they, we will not be able to do that. So um, with the mayor's support, we do plan to bring forward, we've started work on it um, immediately after uh, the bond did not succeed um, to come forward with a new reduced bond proposal um, for consideration in March and looking at our other options. And I don't know if Chapin or Norm or Brian would like to say anything. I'm just glad that uh, we have major projects like the Resilient Enterprise that is got currently funded at this fiscal year. When that funds are exhausted, we'll be in a, in a position where we're going to find solutions to fund our own match allocation. So, those are the kind of things where 2022 20, is maybe part of 23 is okay, but uh, we're at Kind of the end of funding solutions for that unless we get strategic. Maybe a strategic is like Mark was saying a, a March bond vote, but obviously it takes time to to process something like that and get uh, bond money in place. So it's a, a big thing for us in the other part is obviously we're moving, we're not moving in the same direction we have in the last four or five years because we're not being able to position to invest. Our sidewalks and roads like we, like we have in the past, recent past. But as Martha did know, the positive is the state is doing significant paving that will offset some of those reductions in 
leaving it soft. So just to say a little bit more about my perspective, um, uh, so uh, obviously a setback uh, did not pass. Um, uh, I do think the fact that a substantial majority of Melatonians did support it, um, support it uh, plus the fact that we, uh, we do have the ability we were to come back to the end. Um, we have the ability to speak to some of the questions, but I certainly heard most often um, about the situation we want to put on the touring on it, clarify our position, and then probably do uh, significantly the request there. We need to reduce um, the request in other areas as well. Um, but uh, the fact that a majority, the fact that we have such substantial needs, the fact that we're still getting our hand around the heads around the infrastructure bill, but it does seem from what I've heard, heard, heard so far that um, what we stated before that we thought it was likely that securing federal competitive dollars will require matching funds. Uh, I've seen some confirmation that that is accurate. So uh, we, we can say that with a little more definitiveness than we were able to during this um, discussion where uh, really couldn't be um, got a dial to further this for you. But we have real just because of the nature of the timing, it's very challenging to answer questions about um, how the infrastructure bill would intersect with this need. I think that can be clarified. Um, uh, I think the, uh, there's some, uh, just the action that you took earlier tonight to address some of the concerns, maybe some of the most acute concerns about the the appraisal and the impact that had on some individuals. I think we can have a significantly uh, different um, and tightened uh, proposal to make to the people of Burlington if we were to bring it back. Um, I think we need to do that from um, my sense of this list of what we'll not be able to go forward with. Uh, so I think we are in part looking for some feedback on that initial take in this discussion if you're able to offer any that uh, it is worth it. Is worth it for us to continue to put um, effort into refining the proposal. Uh, in fact, about a month, you know, we would have to nail this down by the end of January, so that will be here soon. So, an early indication from you that you kind of agree with this logic. That it's, you know, I'm not asking for final approval tonight, but some kind of directional indication that the board is likely to support a smaller bond um, uh, launch would be uh, helpful. Appreciate the, the report. It's all going to be really important to let folks know what the ultimate outcome is, because I think people have gotten used to higher levels of capital work taking place and seeing lots of payments. You know, the three miles of central office is significant and noticeable, and the way we have one mile long is still noticeable, but it's just as no, I, I just feel like, it, and also the competitive thing, I think, let's see more positive and things like that. So I just think it's really important to communicate this out to the public. About setting the limitations because I think people need to understand what, what the limitations are. We want to do this work. We all want to do this work. We're not able to. So I think that's key. One of the other pieces, though, that I think is continues to be a, a, a concern, and I'm interested in your perspective, and your involvement with the staff, is that the, one of the questions that we heard after I came in that was kind of out of there and this was around this ongoing question about high school and timing on that bonding. Opposition to the school board or right to this bond, some, some, in pub, some very public ways. And so, how do you see that that conversation taking place? Because, like, as I understand it, they're looking at for a November bond, and a lot of people were, some people were having to, to knowing that that expense was still out there. I know we'll still have a better idea in, in just how, of what that might cost, but I don't know. Yep. <laughs> um, I think I understand your, your absolutely your first frustration. That was definitely one of the additional, the significant headwinds that this um, face was we just uh, you know, was not entirely knowable as we sort of set down this path with the events that happened with high school and uh, the uncertainty there. Um, here, so I mean, the good news is the, with each passing month, there is some additional clarity. Um, from uh, from from the school district about their plans. You know, that said, uh, I don't think 
you know, the next day our target date is correct, you're correct, next uh, November is when they will come forward. I don't expect them to have clear cost <laughs> proposals um, for, for them. So that this will be some ongoing um, uncertainty. I think this is something, you know, one thing that I think made this, one thing that is changing about the school district discussion is we, as I think you all should know, we are going to have a, a joint meeting with the school board for the first time in a while right after the new year on January 6th. Kind of got away from that during the pandemic. I think those have been helping. Uh, I think we'll be able to have some kind of effort to get us all on the same page. I think they certainly will be looking for us. I think they I think what I understood or what I heard most often about potential concerns from the school district was really the Memorial Auditorium proposal, that that seemed to be discretionary in some sense and a large number. Uh, it was hard to, I, I didn't have a great answer, frankly, for how um, we could commit to $10 million uh, when there's such big questions about the school district and the overall school, the high school and the overall capacity there. So what I ended up doing, and it, you know, so you may have heard me say this so publicly as I was kind of working with the days and whatnot, is sort of indicating that we would minimize how much we actually committed of the uh, memorial uh, spending until we had greater clarity about where the high school was fully funded. I think this gives us an opportunity to kind of formalize that, tighten it up, to make it more explicit. Hopefully we could actually, by doing that, um, It'd be great. It was was my goal. If you recall, a few years ago in 2018, we really had an MOU with the school district, and we were all kind of working together about joint capital planning. And um, I think there could be an opportunity to, to do that again uh, with this additional time. We'll, we'll have a better sense. So but it is important that we have greater consensus, and greater sense that we are, are coordinated in about how we're doing this um, uh, before going back out. So. Um, That'll be a, a major focus in the next month is to try to get to that discussion on the second. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, but I, you know, to that point, I think we have to be. I, I do think this will be it's not just the memorial tour, but anywhere else where there's sort of truly discretionary spending, truly spending that can postpone on um, uh, until after that big question is answered and where we know we stand with the overall capacity and we think will be important to people in the district and be really looking at us to, to sharpen our pencils and be clear about that and uh, voters will have a similar concern. So I think this has to be a substantially lower number than the 40 million um, when we go back out and wait for it to succeed. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Any anyone else want to offer any any um, you know we're not having a vote tonight nothing yes binding tonight but it would be helpful to understand um, any any guidance you have for us as we're as we're kind of working on this proposal Councilor Jay go ahead yes um, thank you Mayor and. Um, the first question that I have is how much do we have left from the debt service that was passed a couple of years ago. If I'm understanding correctly, the, the $27 million bond from 2016 is, is essentially fully expended at this point. And then we have, um, uh, and then we, you know, we basically fully committed our annual allocation as well. So that's that's why you're seeing such limited capacity, you know, beyond the kind of evergreen sources that we have on an annual basis that are documented in that memo, which do amount to some millions of dollars. Yep. And will allow us to do something. Uh, we have no very, very basically no other discretionary you know, additional funds beyond those. Okay. Um, I mean, I see a way forward, but I think it also has to be very detailed. And also, instead of just what will we no longer be able to do, maybe to divide it by department. Instead of just this whole list, said these these are the departments. For example, radio, infrastructure, video camera. I feel like that's a police department. To divide it by um, by department and also put a number associated with it. I think it will be helpful for me to sell what we can in order for people, if, if we have another bound, to be able to vote in support. I think that would be helpful. That's 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 one. And I think um, 
two was just also wondering if oh. yeah and 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 also what the the new fleas fuchas that we we are talking about what are their life expectancy current like you know where where are we there and um, I think all of those details, I think I would need it on a document that is also tabled with detail. And then I think people would be able to say, okay, let's prioritize these and the rest maybe can wait until all the years to come. That'd be helpful. Good, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Councilor Chang. <laughs> Any, any other member of the board like to weigh in here? Okay. I'm sure we'd all appreciate a little time before the seven o'clock uh, reconvening upstairs. So um, just, I will, I think we'll close this item by saying um, I think uh, nothing from this discussion has left me thinking we should not continue the work. I think we will do so as much as we can next month. Certainly if you have additional ideas or thoughts offline. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have a little bit of iteration and come back to you with a not totally nailed down plan with some more detail in it, get further feedback from there. But uh, you know this month's gonna go quickly because you know the holidays and whatnot and the deadlines being what they are. So um, hopefully this sounds stands as a pretty good sort of primer for uh, further discussion and action um, in January. I'm sure the rest of the council will be going for, for, uh, for thoughts on this. Um, so with that, um, thank you all. Uh, thanks for round through a lot today on this uh, last quarter finance meeting of the year. Um, close out the year. Hope everyone enjoys the holiday. The CNO call upstairs. But, uh, we won't be meeting again on this. Let me just say happy new year. Everyone enjoy the holidays and uh, look forward to getting back to the Rolling up our sleeves on the other side of uh, that. Without objection, we will adjourn the board of finding six thirty two.
We have Councilors Freeman, Hightower, Hansen, J and Jang on uh, participating via Zoom this evening. And um, we'll also have several, uh, several uh, presenters um, on Zoom as well. Um, before um, we um, get into the um, into our meeting itself, um, I just want to let members of the public who are interested in speaking know that if you're interested in speaking, you can sign up for the public forum by going, if you're in person, by going over to the clerk's table over in the corner there um, and um, then filling out a form um, and then um, pass it over to the clerk's table here and they'll relay it to me. Um, if you are participating remotely and are interested in join, in participating in the meeting, um, you can sign up for the forum at burlingtonvt.gov slash city council slash public forum. Um, and that will take you to a form that you can fill out that will then use to call people. Um, for folks um, who are signing up, we do prioritize Burlington residents um, who have affirmatively in indicated their, their uh, resident status in Burlington. So um, we will um, be doing that. So we'll go first to Burlington folks who are in person, then Burlington folks who are participating remotely, then uh, non-Burlington folks who are participating in person, and then non-Burlington folks who are participating remotely. So we'll be going to each of those. All right, so the first item on our agenda is the agenda itself. Uh, Councillor Stromberg, may I please have a motion on the agenda? Yes, I move to approve the agenda as follows. Add to the consent agenda item 4.34, communication Daniel Richardson, city attorney regarding reclassification of positions within the city attorney's office with the action to approve the motion as written per city attorney Richardson. Add to the consent agenda item 4.35, communication Diana Carlisle uh, regarding agenda Monday meeting short-term rental discussion with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 4.36, communication Linda Tierney regarding Airbnb short-term rentals with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 4.37, uh, communication casual observer regarding defunding the police with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Um, add to the consent agenda item 4.38, communication Ivan Goldstein regarding Lakeview Terrace, Airbnb police event with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 3, I'm sorry, 4.39, communication will uh, coppice, um, regarding defund the police, the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 4.40, communication uh, Christopher Aaron Felkner, Chairman Burlington Republican Party, regarding updated and resubmitted opposition to municipal mask mandate ordinance with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 4.41, communication Barbara Zucker regarding short-term rentals with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 4.42, communication June Lace, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, regarding short-term rentals with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication and place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 4.43, communication Jillian Eaton, um, regarding opposition to alternate STR ordinance with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication, and place it on file. 
Thank you, we have a motion from Councillor Stromberg. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor McGee. Any discussion of our agenda? Okay, hearing none, let's go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously and we have an agenda. Item number two is the public forum. However, it is a time certain forum um, that's supposed to take place at 7.30. We're still well ahead of that. So I will skip ahead um, to some of the other items on our agenda this evening um, that are non, that don't require the council to take action um, so that we can um, move through those items. Um, and we'll, anything that requires a vote, um, we'll wait until after the public forum to address those. So um, we'll move past it to, past the public forum. Um, we'll come back again to that at 7.30. So we got about 15 minutes on that. Um, the climate emergency reports. Does any councilor have a climate emergency report to offer this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on um, to um, the other piece of business, other pieces of business that don't require council action. Item number six, committee reports. Are there any committee chairs um, wishing to speak? Councilor Mason. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. The ordinance committee will be meeting Wednesday the 22nd at 4.30, uh, both in person and on Zoom. Our agenda includes an update on energy efficiency and weatherization. Uh, completing action on pre-qualification of construction contractors and a further discussion on minimum and maximum parking requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Any other committee chairs? <clears throat> Councillor Paul. Uh, thanks, President Tracy. The Public Safety Committee uh, is going to be meeting four times, at least four times in the month of January, and it will be January 4th. Um, each Tuesday, so the 4th, the 11th, the 18th, and 25th, we're going to be going um, section by section through the CNA report recommendations, and we're going to be joined to review those recommendations by a couple members of the Police Commission, one member of the Marketplace Commission, um, and a couple of other uh, groups, um, another couple of other representative representing groups, um, and then uh, as well um, by different areas of the administration um, to talk with each, to talk about each section of the CNA report and the recommendations. Um, those will be posted on the city calendar. We don't, I believe they are all in the Busher Conference Room, um, and they're at 5.15 to 7.30, but there'll be more information on the city website. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Paul. Any other committee chairs? Uh, Councillor Hansen. Thanks. Um, the Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee, we pushed back our December meeting. We pushed it back to January 12th at 5 p.m., and that'll be both in person and remote. Thanks. Thank you. Any other committee chairs? Uh, yes, President Tracy, the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee pushed back its meeting uh, until January 18, 2022. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, um, we will now move into item number seven, which is City Council General Affairs. Any councillor wishing to comment on City Council General Affairs? Okay, seeing none, we'll keep moving into City Council President Council updates. You have a couple updates for the council. Um, so um, the first of which is just a reminder for councilors that if you are present, uh, if you are participating remotely, um, to just please give us some advance notice um, for that so that we can please send you panelist links. Understand that a lot of times that's a, a, a game time decision or gets close, so certainly understand that, but just advance notice is certainly appreciated with that. Um, the other piece is also um, in terms of our, um, I had announced at a couple of the other meetings a, uh, regarding the ad hoc um, reappraisal committee. Um, we only received about six, we only received six applications for that um, and they did not meet the full criteria of each of the, the positions that was laid out in the resolution itself. Um, so I'm not, um, 
feeling comfortable make an, uh, appointing half of a committee. I'd like to be able to make appoint the make the full decision of the full committee. Um, so what uh, my plan is is to be in touch with individual counselors for areas where we don't have uh, folks um, and let folks know um, know of that, um, and then. Um, get a re-advertisement um, for just those positions for which we don't have any applicants going um, in January with it, um, and we're still working on figuring out when the deadline um, for that would be. Um, it's looking like that would be have to take place um, sort of mid-month, just given the nature of the holidays. But I do want to make I do want to weigh out the full committee, understand the the, the full skill sets that are at play um, um, at the. Um, when making the decision or the appointment of the full committee. So um, that's gonna have to wait a little bit because we don't have enough folks to, that have applied for that. And so certainly we'll welcome counselor assistance um, in reaching out and doing outreach to folks um, to um, make sure that we have a full committee um, in order to, to continue with that process. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to um, note for this evening is that you know we've had a series of um, meetings where we've been disrupted. I hope that tonight will certainly be uh, an exception to that and that folks will um, sh will respect the decorum um, in the room um, this evening um, and refrain from the behaviors that we've been seeing um, at the council, whether it's interrupting counselors, whether it's um, using profanity, whether it's um, you know, engaging in, 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 um, in personal attacks. I just really hope that we can maintain that decorum. Um, but um, this has risen to a level where I did feel like we need to, to, to assess our options as a council and understand what um, what, we're, what we are and aren't allowed to do under open meeting law and First Amendment law um, to understand just what our options are for maintaining um, the, a, a well-functioning meeting. So to that end, uh, City Attorney Richardson is drafting a memo for us um, that will sort of lay out those options. It will be shared with the full council so that we can ex assess those options. I see this very this conversation very much as being one of a full council conversation, so not just calling to me to make it, but I really appreciate the assistance and advisement that many of you have given me so far, and I'll be looking to the full council for that. I think it, it may, make, may even make sense, depending on our agendas for those uh, January meetings, to have a work session specifically geared around um, what the council would like to see. So um, we'll be able to have that memo in advance of any work sessions, but I just would really um, I really have have appreciated the the support that I've felt from from counselors um, in trying to handle this. Many of you have come to the table um, really wanting to offer solutions and help, and that's been really productive. So please um, continue to think about ways that we can bring uh, and maintain decorum. And I, you know, it is an issue that I just want everyone to know that I'm actively thinking about and working through. And again, for for those of you who are here um, and participating remotely. Please respect the decorum of, of our body. It, it, it really is important that we're, a, we're we're dealing with major community issues here, and um, engaging in some of the behavior that we've seen is entirely unhelpful and does not move us forward in uh, in a way that um, you know that, that that really respects the the, the the seriousness of the issues with which we're dealing, and um, and and really our community just in general. So uh, that's what I wanted to say this evening. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Tracy. And um, sorry, just to be clear, are you asking me to convene the Board of Civil Authority or? No, or I'm sorry, mayor. Your mayor, your mayoral update. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll get to Board of Civil Authority after okay. we yes, get sorry. into that. Thank um, uh, I think my only uh, general affairs uh, comment tonight is just uh, to um, uh, <clears throat> make to to reiterate um, the statements that um, I made um, on Friday and that was confirmed by the state over week, the weekend that uh, our wastewater testing has confirmed that Omicron is here in Burlington and spreading here, um, what, uh, which is um, not surprising given what we're seeing around the country and uh, news today that Omicron is, is already becoming uh, the dominant form of, of COVID. Um, what we know and what has become clear just in recent weeks is that boosting um, is very, very significant with respect to the Omicron uh, variant. Um, people's uh, <clears throat> resistance uh, to um, infection goes up dramatically um, with getting the third dose, the boosted dose. It is believed that uh, that your risk of serious illness um, also uh, is benefits from, from the boost with Omicron. 
and um, uh, we we just continue to urge, as we have for weeks, people to um, get the booster. If somehow you are not vaccinated yet, you continue to be very much at risk. Uh, and um, uh, this does relate to our agenda. We will be um, extending, uh, asking the council to extend the mask mandate uh, with action later tonight. Um, and. Uh, continue to uh, encourage people to um, use a combination of uh, boosting and testing um, uh, to uh, enjoy the ho holidays. I have been on the phone with Dr. Levine repeatedly earlier today, and I know that people are having trouble that getting um, testing appointments. And I know the state is working hard <clears throat> uh, to expand testing capacity here locally. Um, uh, over the course of this week so that um, as people uh, embark on their holiday plans, they do have testing options. And I, uh, I know this, Dr. Levine is having a press conference tomorrow. And I expect he will detail this further there. So um, with that, I do think it is still possible for people to in, enjoy the holidays this year. If they do take additional precautions, we are in a much better place um, uh, than we were a year ago, um, despite the, the, the news uh, of Omicron that uh, we have just so many more tools than we had a year ago um, for people to enjoy the holidays. I hope everyone will, and I wish everyone a uh, happy new year, certainly my colleagues on the council. With that, President Tracy, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we are still a couple minutes ahead of public forum, but we do have a number of folks who are in the room, um, so I'll just go ahead and get us going with that. Um, we do have a number of folks signed up this evening. Um, before we do get into that, though, I'll just um, state sort of the way that folks can sign up again. So if you are in the room and are interested in, in participating in the forum um, this evening, you can sign up at the, at the table over here. Um, and then once you filled out your form, um, please hand it to the, the city clerk over, over here at the table here, and then they'll get it to me. I'll I, I go through the comments in the order that, or the, the sheets in the order that they're received. Um, we, as I said before, um, also offer remote commenting as an option for folks. So if you are someone who is interested in participating in the meeting remotely, um, you are the comment uh, period remotely, you may sign up go by going to burlingtonvt.gov slash city council slash public forum. And that will feed into a form that I will then um, use to call off the folks who are participating remotely. Um, as we're in this forum, please um, stay close to um, whatever device you're participating in. Sometimes we have issues with folks. Um, I'll try and read off a number of folks who are participating remotely um, just so that you're able to, to know that you're on deck soon. Um, in terms of the um, the forum itself, um, I will be, um, we'll have two minutes for, for commenting this evening. Um, we have, um, for folks who are in the room, we do have a large clock behind the council table as well as one that, uh, that appears on the, 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 um, on this, the uh, public forum speakers table as well with a light system, green meaning you have plenty of time, yellow meaning you have, uh, your time is running out, and red meaning your time has run out, and it will beep um, when you do run out of time. Um, you, um, we will, I'll then um, ask you to, to, to um, move aside or move to allow us to move on to the next speaker because we do need to, because um, everyone gets the, the same amount of time in this, uh, this forum. Um, that's a requirement actually um, of open meeting law, especially on when you are dealing with uh, time limited forums as we are this evening, we've set aside the period from 7.30 to 9.30 for public <laughs> forum. In terms of the conduct for the forum, I would ask that folks not use profanity this evening. Um, also, please refrain from um, commenting on uh, speakers while they're speaking or interrupting speakers in any way. Um, please keep silent also after speakers have, have spoken because it is helpful for me to then be able to, to speak uh, or to be able to, to alert the, the folks who are coming up next. Um, and it's hard to hear if people are, are loudly applauding or jeering. It also um, can sometimes create a chilling effect for people who are trying to participate in those meetings, uh, in our meetings. The other piece is also that we had just asked that all comments be directed to the chair um, and that you stay focused on uh, issues and not uh, individuals um, in, this, uh, in this particular forum. Um, so with that, I will um, get us started 
the two minutes early, and we'll get started again, as I said before, in terms of the order, um, I'll go to Burlington folks who are in the room, so folks who have affirmatively indicated that they are Burlington residents, um, and or that they have listed a Burlington address, for instance, uh, as one way of that. Um, and then we will go to Burlington folks who are participating remotely, then we'll go to non-Burlington uh, residents who are participating um, in person, as well as uh, to be followed by non-Burlington residents who are participating uh, remotely. So that's the order of um, sort of the operations for this evening. Um, and again, if you can just please um, follow the, those, those guidelines and we'll um, get started. Um, the first speaker for this evening uh, in person is Kara Greenblatt to be followed by Beth Seitler. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, and, and one thing I forgot to say is for folks is just speak into the mics um, just so that we can, we can really hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's perfect, thank you. Thanks, my name is Kara Greenblatt. I'm a resident of the most densely populated portion of the North Winooski Avenue corridor between Grant and North Street. I'm an avid biker and I'm very proud of the biking infrastructure in our community. I'm also a social worker working for the Howard Center and I am required to have a car for my job as I drive clients um, to the health center, food shelf and to other services in our community. I'll say upfront, that the current plan to remove 75 to 100 parking spaces is one that will cause unnecessary hardship for essential workers like myself, as well as vulnerable members of our community. I say unnecessary hardship because there is already a northbound parking, sorry, bike lane one block over that I use on a regular basis. On another front, one of the things that's really frustrated me um, during this planning process is that the data supporting the current plan is faulty, deceptive, and outdated. I'll give you some examples. One, the transportation study claims that on my block in the evenings, 50 to 70 percent, only 50 to 70 percent of parking spaces are occupied, making it seem like it would be no problem to remove half the parking. Um, this is absolutely inaccurate and I invite anyone to visit our block any evening to witness the competitive parking situation that exists there. In fact, my partner and I typically have to go around the block two or three times in order to find a space when we get home from work. Two, given COVID, significantly more professionals are working from home, thus more residents' cars are there during the day and night, and I think that we cannot rely on an assessment that was done in 2017 for planning today's reality. Three, data collected for the study noted that 86 households were being impacted in our section of the corridor. We pointed out that this was dramatically understated and the consultants upped that to 131, yet no effort was made to reconsider the foregone conclusion. So, so your time is up? Okay, I'll just say in conclusion. So your time, now you, if you'd like to share your remarks with the full council, you can email them to citycouncil at burlingtonvt.gov and okay. we'll be able to-, to, to I'll just ask the that the them. council reconsider their plan. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Beth Seitler. I also live on North Anuski Avenue. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, I'm asking the council to reconsider or delay the resolution to reconfigure the planned parking removal and the second bike lane addition on my street. The data gathered and used in this study in 2017 is wrong. My neighbors didn't know about it when they heard about it. They don't support it. They, <clears throat> the report didn't meet its goals as intended. Why continue with a report based on bad data with unfulfilled goals with strong resident opposition? A group of six neighbors and I recently canvassed our street about the planned removal of half of our parking spaces to put in a second bike lane. We gathered over 140 signatures, which we present to you here. The data in this report is wrong. The original report based on a parking vacancy rate of up to 60%. It was adjusted to 20%, as Kara said, and that's still wrong. I invite any of you to come to our street and try to find a place to park. The report is, has the wrong housing unit count, <clears throat> so they have the wrong number of off-street parking spaces. They didn't answer their own questions about what kinds of parking spaces to provide because they didn't have the correct data. 
There's no agreement with businesses or apartment buildings about sharing their parking. In fact, most have said they won't. Our petition shows that engagement efforts were not successful. 139 of the over 140 people we spoke to between Pearl and North Street did not know that the removal of half of the parking spaces and construction of a second bike lane was happening. We've heard that there was robust, robust outreach, and there may have been, but it wasn't remotely successful. The goals for the March 9, 2020 resolution were not met. A strategy for balancing parking demand and supply north of Pearl was not met. Meeting essential parking needs while freeing up space for dedicated bike lanes was not completed. Identification of strategies for improving multimodal. So your time is up. If you'd like to share the full statement again, uh, please feel free to write to city council at burlingtonvt.gov. And if you have copies, you can uh, share them with the, the clerk's table as well. Our next speaker is Robert Bristow Johnson to be followed by Amy Magyar and Kristen Baker after that. So. So um, I can't be speaking to you on behalf of the redistricting committee because I was not authorized to, but I can be speaking here on the behalf of me and just um, ask you to not squander the opportunity to meaningfully poll the public on uh, the, the ward redistricting that we have to be doing. That we, it's not realistic for a, a ballot item to be on this town meeting day, uh, the 2020 uh, uh, two town meeting day, but it is realistic to do at least a Doyle survey kind of poll. But I, I see no reason why you can't say this is an advisory vote uh, um, and use the regular ballots to record the information, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, nonetheless, you could at least do something like a Doyle poll where there are actually some maps, maps available on the internet, and maps that you could post up at the poll uh, where they can look at it and uh, voters can say uh, approval, neutral, or disapproval. You can collect some statistics and so that when you make a real decision on what map is really going on the charter change ballot, you might have some idea about how the public is going to uh, accept it or like it. In advance, so you don't have much time to waste. It's it, it, it's coming up real fast, and somehow you know by in a month or less, you're gonna have to decide what's gonna go on the ballot or what's gonna happen on town meeting. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Amy Magyar, to be followed by Kristen Baker. My name is Amy Magyar, and I'm a permitted B&B with the city. I've spoken at length for the past two years on the subject of short-term rental. So tonight I'm going to keep my comments focused and short, as it appears that minds may already be made up about the topic. First, I wanted to say that I fear the city council ignoring the well-thought-out proposal that came out of the joint committee meetings over the last 18 months. The three-year ownership for non-owner-occupied short-term rental units was a great compromise taking into consideration the city's fear of developers, but also the support of Burlington homeowners looking to support the high cost of living in BTV. By ignoring some of the nuanced details in that original proposal, I think you're actually glossing over a very thoughtful collaborative work the committee and the host developed. It's a shame. Second, as the city start, began to tighten the regulations for long-term rental landlords in the last year, those tight regulations are actually discouraging folks from moving from short-term rental to long-term, which is the opposite of what you want. So I want to clearly state, over-regulating short-term rental will not lead to more long-term rentals, more so due to the fact that the long-term rental regulations are seemingly so one-sided and far from supporting a landlord. Finally, when it comes to primary residence requirements for short-term rental, I ask you this. When you have rented a short-term rental through Airbnb or Verbo in a city where you were visiting, did you ask yourself if it was a primary residence before you booked your stay? Was it okay for you to rent from a non-owner occupied outside of Burlington, but you're restricting it happening here? Please consider looking back at the ordinance suggested forwarded by the Joint Committee back in the spring. It's a solid plan and a great solution to a tough challenge. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Kristen Baker, to be followed by Christopher Aaron Felker. Good evening, and thank you for reminding everyone to keep everything, you know, calm and communicate in a very, um, hopefully, constructive way. First of all, I just want to say this is not LA. We don't have people coming in, buying up everything, and they want to develop and whatever. And maybe I don't know. Maybe they are in there. I don't know that, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's a case of supply and demand. I have a, um, an Airbnb here on Main Street. I rented it and to UVM students, and then they leave, and then I'm stuck, and then I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? And then, uh, okay, I'll try Airbnb. I make it nice. I make, I, I make sure, like, I get involved in, in the building because my daughter went to UVM. All her kids went to UVM. Those buildings are not being maintained, and they're, and they're just, it's sad for me because they're beautiful buildings, and what we're doing is bringing people in, we're bringing money in, and they're respectful, and it's what we want for our city, what we want for our downtown is to have people come in instead of my child going and all her friends going to San Francisco. We need a reason for people to come in, and it's disappointing when it's not our fault. I'm just trying to, I'm a middle class person. I'm just trying to make a little bit, I'm just trying to figure out how to make my rent. And I'm also concerned about the other person that has to rent out a room because our taxes are so high. And it's a real problem. And if you want to get rid of people, okay, we're going to have to sell, right? And we're going to have to sell to the highest price of person who comes in from San Francisco and pays 100% plus plus. Fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars over. I work at Burlington Furniture. I see it all day, and I hear it all day long. So this is a supply and demand problem. We don't have enough housing, but to go after us is ludicrous because you're losing us, and you're getting California, Brooklyn. So your time is up. Okay, but Thank I you. just want you to remember yep. that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Every single day. Yep. About Thank you. Your time is up. So our next speaker is Christopher Aaron Felker, um, and that's the last Burlington resident I have in person. So we'll transition to remote um, after this. Last week, I addressed this council regarding the need to restore civility, decorum, and order in this chamber. Once again, last week, we all witnessed multiple individuals launching into objectively offensive, profanity-laden personal attacks directed at individuals in the room and continued interruptions of speakers during the public forum. I renew my request for this council to restore the public forum speaking time back to three minutes to ensure each individual has a fair amount of time to express themselves. And I also renew my request for council president to address the rampant harassment that takes place in this room against members of the public and speakers during public forum. This body cannot continue to ignore these interruptions and how they essentially rob individuals of their time to speak. Last week, I stated the public must do their part to restore civility. It's even more important that our elected officials set a better example. As a Burlingtonian, who is both a member of the public and an elected chairman of the Burlington Republican Party, I pledge to set a better example every day, and I ask you all to join me. I appreciate that some of the counselors have reached out to me in the last week to thank me for my comments I presented on restoring civility. Some of you wished I had said more, and many had recognized that the problems were there but were unsure of how to stop the interruptions. It was suggested to me by a fellow Burlingtonian that the council president should wield a yellow and a red card, much like soccer. And when a speaker is interrupted and an unruly member of the audience, council president Tracy can raise the yellow card, and every time the card is raised, a speaker can reclaim 15 seconds of time. For repeated violations, the council president's empowered to use a red card to have the offender removed from the chamber where they can watch the remainder of the meeting from another room in City Hall. Council's urge to take decisive action to restore civility and decorum, promoting an environment of accessibility and fairness. Thank you for your time. I wish you all a happy holidays and, and, and happy new year. Thank you. All right, we are gonna transition to um, resident, uh, Burlington residents who are participating 
remotely. Um, and I'll read off, as I said before, a couple of folks, um, just so that you know that you're in line. Um, so I have Laura Massell, to be followed by Paul Hendler, Maggie, Randy Seitler, Deb Ward-Lyons, Kent Casella, Chris Rivers. Um, so that's just a few of the folks who have signed up so far. Um, we, I will um, ask that folks, um, if you could please just make sure that you're named as the person um, who, or the name that you signed up as. Um, that's helpful just in terms of locating you. So, um, Laura Massell, I'm not able to locate you. Okay, so I will go, and Laura or others who have signed up whose names that I call, um, I will, um, I will, if you could just use the raise hand function if I'm missing you um, for some reason. Um, that's not, however, the way to sign up. Um, and if I didn't call your name, that doesn't mean that you're not in the list. It just means we're, we haven't gotten to you yet. So just so you know that as well. Um, so I'm gonna look for Paul Hendler now. Paul, I'm unable to locate you as well. Um, so we'll move to Maggie, and I believe I see two signups um, from the same what I for the same person. I think it's Maggie Stanley. So Maggie, I will enable your microphone. Hi, is that working? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, hi. I just wasn't sure how this worked. I um, thank you so much. I can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. I want to wish everybody a Merry Hanukkah, a Happy Christmas, and a blessed Kwanzaa, and whatever else you celebrate. Obviously, we're at a very pivotal uh, juncture with COVID in our city and community and state, and I want to thank you all for your continued work. Um, I'm familiar with a wonderful program I, I wanted to share with you all. That's why I signed up tonight in Austin, Texas, called Community First Village. I do not know if you're familiar with it, but I uh, ask you all to please take some time to look at it. I'll follow up tomorrow with an email. The founder is an amazing gentleman named Alan who um, started his career as a developer a commercial real estate investor. And the program has changed hundreds of lives in Austin, Texas. And I feel like our homeless landscape and our development landscape and need for housing is ripe for this type of project. So I urge you to consider that. My second comment is I am concerned about a number of youth I work with and know given COVID and I understand the city has received some um, federal COVID funding and I would ask you to please consider allocating substantial amounts to bring in additional support for our at promise kids in our community that don't necessarily have the familial support and resources they need to thrive and there was a third point oh i know i'm almost out of time what was my third point oh the airbnb thing anywho i think we'll touch on that later i wish you all a blessed holiday and thank you for your continued service thank you very Good night. much thank you for that our next speaker is randy seitler to be followed by and i'll read off a couple names just again um randy seitler to be followed by deb ward lyons kent casella uh, Chris Rivers and Lori Koderman. Um, I do have uh, one person who has signed up who is not a Burlington resident who will follow after we get to the non-Burlington residents who are here in the room. Um, so I do have you um, know that, um, but I just don't want to call you right now just for um, to keep things clear. So I'll go to Randy Seitler to be followed by Deb Ward-Lyons. Randy, I've enabled your microphone. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, you're a little soft. Okay, I'll try to increase the volume. Um, sorry about that. Is that, is that better? Um, no, it's still really coming through very soft. Uh, it's through my computer, but I don't know how to increase the volume. 
Okay, maybe I maybe try and speak louder. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll try that. Uh, so I'm also here to speak about the North uh, Winooski Avenue corridor uh, study and the parking management plan. I want to say from the um, a few other people have talked from the beginning. I'm asking the council to um, delay implementation of the lane reconfiguration until there is a significantly more robust and successful public engagement process. With the outcome being a parking management oh, plan. I'm sorry that uses a realistic definition of essential parking needs and which does not make the lives of vulnerable people who live and use social services in the neighborhood harder and does not threaten the diverse mix of residences, small businesses and nonprofits uh, that make this neighborhood so unique. Um, Burlington considers itself a progressive city, even if you're not part of the progressive party. And I think we are for the most part, um, but um, this isn't progressive, you know, the idea of uh, people needing to leave the neighborhood because they no longer have parking, small businesses that will have a hard time attracting customers uh, if there's less parking, and especially nonprofits who serve a lot of the most needy and vulnerable, making it more difficult for them to serve them. Uh, previous progressive administrations and taxpayers in the city have put a, um, a lot of resources in public uh, infrastructure into the development of underused and unused areas of this um, neighborhood. North Winooski Avenue has been the focus of a major community development initiative for the past 30 years to create a mixed use neighborhood commercial district that has thrived. I think this plan ignores that history and puts the neighborhood at risk of giving tenants, small business owners and nonprofits a reason to move if they can. The mixed use na uh, nature of the neighborhood is what makes it um, attractive and funky to live here. Um, uh, in my view, uh, this plan to use our street, our neighborhood as a commodity to be used by the few that can arrange their lives to accommodate traveling by bike. And so, so your time is uh, up. What we've accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deb Ward Lyons, to be followed by Kent Casella. And Deb, I've located you and have enabled your microphone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. I'm going to make a prediction. You will not gain much long-term housing with either of these STR proposals. People will instead sell or they'll pivot to monthly rentals for traveling professionals. This isn't much of a prediction because it's already happened. Consequently, in addition to gaining only a handful of housing, the city will lose many thousands of dollars from the rooms and meals tax and gain a reputation as unfriendly to those seeking lodging during their stay in the Queen City. In the name of affordable housing, you are favoring the big hotels in town. It sure seems like some on this council don't care for hardworking, low and middle income property owners and their rights. We are squeezed with no, no cause eviction, told that we can't short term rent unless owner occupied. And if we live on North Winooski Avenue, we'll also have street parking taken away. I'm in favor of safe rental housing and more rental housing. But you are using a sledgehammer on short-term rental property owners as if they are the solution to the crisis. Per the mayor's recent announcement, there's a five-year goal to create 1,200 new housing units. And UVM plans on building up its Trinity campus. How about mandating that college juniors need to stay on campus? Are you going to throw away two years worth of discussion, work, and time in favor of a highly restrictive ordinance that a few counselors have crafted in the 11th hour? Instead, make sure all short-term rentals are registered and meet health and safety standards and put a stop to speculative buying by limiting short-term rental rentals to buildings owned for a minimum of three years. As counselors, you represent all of your constituents, not just the big hotels and renters. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kent Casella. And Kent will be followed by, and I'll read off a couple different names, a couple of names um, of Burlington residents who have signed up. Um, so we have Chris Rivers following Kent, um, as well as Lori Coderman and Abbott Stark. Um, so Kent, I have come to you and have enabled your microphone, so you should be able to speak. I trust you can hear me? Yes. 
Thank you. For some reason, it seems that short-term rentals are being targeted as properties that need to be available for long-term rental because the affordable rental issues Burlington faces. My question for the committee is simple. Has the city determined that short-term properties that are being targeted would be classified as affordable rental, long-term rentals? Has there been documented support of that theory? I can speak for myself and several other hosts and say, no, these properties would not fall into the lower fair market or affordable rental value. They'd be much higher because these properties are very well maintained to a standard that is above average. I know for my single unit, which is a licensed bed and breakfast, and I'm here to support my fellow hosts, my rent would exceed the fair market average so that I could afford the nearly 20% tax increase that was imposed recently on my duplex. Short-term rentals make visiting Burlington affordable for people who cannot afford to pay the extremely high prices that the four downtown hotels charge. So these short-term rental folks, they bring in, they bring in money, tourist money, uh, revenue for the state and the city. My girlfriend's son is visiting from out of town for holiday, and he tested positive for COVID today. He's visiting from out of state, and now he's isolated in a downtown hotel at $229 a night. We did that to protect us. My unit was not available, so I couldn't give it to him, or it would be $100 a night. So short-term rentals are, are actually affordable tourist rentals. Frankly, I think this is very short-sighted of the city, Short-term rentals are making, rental hosts are making ends meet by supplementing their income so they can remain in the city they love. I think that this uh, draconian regulation to help solve an affordable rental crisis is ridiculous. So if any of you are out on a holiday and you choose to stay at a short-term rental, just remember the regulations you're imposing on your fellow Burlingtonians. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Rivers, to be followed by Lori Coderman and Abbott Stark. <coughs> Chris, I've located you and have enabled and have enabled your microphone. Thank you for the opportunity. Is my audio level okay? Yep, you sound good. Great, thank you. I'm a resident along the North Winooski corridor between North Street and Grand Street. I've been following this issue closely since discovering that the survey created and touted by the hired consultants was rolled out after the decision to add a bike lane was made. There is a shortage of parking every weekday, as described earlier by some of the guests this evening, along this part of the road. We have a bike lane, folks. Bike lanes are not a climate crisis solution. I'm a biker. I frequent the city streets on my bike in good weather, just like the many in our city. There is a bike lane already, one that needs better maintenance in bad weather for those that rely on their bikes throughout the winter months. Those that rely on their cars during the winter months need parking. The survey was unclear and unsuccessful in capturing useful data and led to a lack of viable answers to replacing all the parking that would be lost. The committee has not come back with adequate answers on the negative impact on parking on this mixed use avenue. The consultants have yet to share the answers to key questions about parking that were promised earlier on in this process. From my vantage point, the entire process has been flawed from the outset. Myself and other resident neighborhood stakeholders, those that park routinely along this route because they live there, largely were unaware that this had even been a topic, much less something that was acted upon. Late in the game, a couple months back, now neighbors, me included, canvassed our neighborhood and managed around 140 signatures in very short order. To a person, everyone we spoke to was dismayed that this plan had gotten so far without their knowledge. Please put a pause on the bike lane until there is better communication to residents, a pause until the data is updated, and finally, a pause so we can learn more about what is best for this very important corridor in our city. Thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Coderman, to be followed by Abbott Stark. Lori, I've enabled your microphone. Okay, I'm muted now. Yes, you are. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I want to first acknowledge that I understand that you all have a very complex problem that you are trying to resolve here with short-term rentals in the Burlington crisis. I almost didn't sign up tonight because I feel like I haven't been heard. I've told this story many times. I don't know that I could say it any better than Deb Lyons or Amy. 
you we had a solid plan with a great solution to a tough problem and it really was thrown to the thrown to the ground at least that's how it feels like many here in this situation i have a duplex that is off site i'm an off site host and the only way i'm able to cash flow this property is to have a short term rental which we created so we did not take away any rentals my husband and i are hard workers we do community service we hold multiple jobs we're self employed we don't have a 401k or a pension and this short term rental has solved the problem of the high cost of living and has allowed us to to live in burlington the city i grew up in and love and love to share with out of town people and we may not be able to stay here if this bill does not pass um as we had presented um so i will just say that i hope that you are going to hear the pleas of your constituents that we will all feel heard as a result of what happens here tonight um i think that if the proposal is passed as is um on the table now that much collateral damage will be um the result with very little if any resolution to the housing crisis thank you thank you our next speaker um, participating remotely will be Abbott Stark. And then after that, we will transition to non-Burlington residents who are participating um, in person to be followed by non-Burlington folks who are participating remotely. So Abbott, um, I've located you um, and have enabled your microphone. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, happy holidays to everybody, and thank you so much for your service, especially during this COVID time. I know many of you are also uh, either entrepreneurs or small business people yourselves. And, um, it, you know, I recently started a business in Burlington. I've resided in the city for the past 20 years. Um, and although the business is growing very quickly, we now employ seven people locally. Uh, we're still a startup and nearly half the office does short-term rentals of some sort to make ends meet and continue our growing business. Um, you know, as a city, I know we're desperate for additional taxes. It's been a very painful year for many people. Um, the tax finance bonds, any revenue we can get our collective hands on. You know, the country's in the middle of an economic crisis. Rich are richer than ever before. Um, and according to Airbnb, 52% of hosts are low to moderate income. 53% said that hosting helped them stay in their homes. That's definitely true of me. Uh, regulating Airbnbs is also going to hold back the improving economies of local neighborhoods. I know some of them have really thrived over the last decade. The same data show that 42% of guest spending is in the neighborhoods where they stayed. Um, that's really important for my place on Monroe Street. After my divorce, I found myself back on the rental market and it was through STR I was able to reachieve the dream of home ownership. However, I couldn't do it without rental income. If I were forced to shutter my STR, it would jeopardize the low income housing that I'm able to offer to two of my rental units. One is a disabled low income family who've been remained in their home for 18 years. And the other is an elderly disabled low income family. Um, even my conventional long term renters have had frozen rents due to the STR. So if the STRs were canceled, it would force really tough decisions and circumstances that I would um, hate to have to face. So I encourage you to allow for STR in exchange for affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our the Burlington folks who had signed up um, participating remotely. I looked again for Laura Massell and Paul Hendler. Wasn't able to locate either of you. Um, so we'll transition now back to Burlington uh, non-Burlington folks who are participating in person. I have Eric. Han Hanley, um, to be followed by Julie Marks. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for your time for letting us speak tonight on short-term rentals. I just want to talk about the benefits of short-term rentals in Burlington and how, her, how hard we've worked the last two years with the Planning and Zoning Committee to, to 
try to get a fair solution for everybody. You know, we're not all big time landlords in Burlington. We're all here to, to help help people come uh, have another option for staying in Burlington. I'll give you a quick example of two, two scenarios I had in the last two years. I had an older lady, a couple from New York City that couldn't get chemo treatment in New York City. So I put them up in the Airbnb here, close to the hospital for a couple months. She, did, she couldn't stay in a hotel. So if we get rid of the short-term rentals, like what we have proposed right now, with me not being an owner host, uh, I'm not an on-site host, um, you know, that, that would go away. Um, I had a traveling nurse last year during COVID with his family from Virginia, close to the hospital. Their kids had never seen snow. They had a great time up here. Um, I'm just hoping you guys look at, look at all the scenarios too. And with short-term rentals too, everybody has a cleaning crew, you know, that changes over a lot more than a long-term rental, you know, so that we employ a lot of people with cleaning fees and stuff too. I have a, I have a offsite, I have a host that employs her three kids and they have college loans to pay off. But I just want you guys to, to, to look at all the options and, and, and try to keep the short-term rentals in the pool of, of housing in Burlington. Thank you. Thank you. So I have Julie Marks to be followed by Jeff McKee. Good evening. I'd like to draw your attention to the communication submitted um, by De La Rosa from MSK Attorneys on behalf of the Short-Term Rental Alliance. Um, I wanna give you some reasons why this short-term rental ordinance is flawed. Number one, it discriminates against non-resident property owners and favors residents of Burlington without any basis to do so. The short-term rental ordinance likely violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Vermont and the United States Constitution. Owner occupancy and Burlington residency has no bearing on whether a short-term rental negatively impacts the neighborhoods or housing. Reason number two, for a regulation like the short-term rental ordinance before you to be constitutionally valid, it must be rationally related to a valid governmental purpose. With the short-term rental ordinance, resident and non-resident property owners who own land in the same district are functionally the same from a zoning perspective. There isn't a rational basis for the disparate treatment between the rights afforded to two classes as an owner-occupied property used as a short-term rental may just as may be just as impactful and detrimental as one not owner-occupied in the same zoning district. Reason number three, the short-term rental ordinance may also constitute a regulatory taking. The takings clause of the Fifth Amendment and that in the Vermont Constitution provides that no private property shall be taken for public use without just compensation. There are dozens of properties today that are not owner-occupied and which contain short-term rentals and booked into 2022 or 2023. If you pass this ordinance, those owners will suddenly face substantial economic consequences. Reason number four, the short-term rental ordinance also unreasonably and unnecessarily impairs existing contracts. Article one, section 10 of the US Constitution states, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligations of contracts. Please reconsider the short-term rental ordinance. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff McKee to be followed by Susan Bowen. Hello, I'm Jeff McKee. I'm the CEO of Community Health Centers of Burlington. And for the record, I'm also a uh, resident of the city of Burlington. I'm sorry, I filled out the form incorrectly. Um, I know that representatives from our organization have previously expressed concern about the plan to reduce parking on North Winooski Avenue, which does not include a comprehensive plan to mitigate the harm to residents, visitors, and businesses that currently depend on that resource. I understand that this is a conversation that has been going on long before I moved to Burlington, but I think it's fair to say that the priorities we all had when this process started had shifted, have shifted significantly over the past two years of this pandemic. And yet this effort seems intent on taking us backward to meet, the, meet yesterday's needs without regard for what the community needs to grow, to thrive, to be safe, and to be healthy today and into the future. 
Access to health care and support of human services is of vital importance to this community. Our Riverside Health Center sees over 17,000 patients and brings more than 60,000 patient visits to the community each year. Our small on-site garage is commonly at capacity, making accessible street parking an absolute necessity to ensure equitable access to health care. Additionally, we are trying to expand our services to meet the urgent community need, including an on-site affordable pharmacy and expanded clinical services. Unfortunately, at the same time, the city is planning to increase barriers to accessing our care. CHCB is, uh, is very much in support of improving safety for pedestrians and cyclists and encouraging greener transportation options for those with the privilege to make those choices. But there must be a solution that respects the diverse needs of this neighborhood and its most vulnerable members who rely on the multiple community resources within it. The potential health benefits we may see as a long-term goal of this plan are dwarfed Your by time the immediate is up. health barriers it creates and it Your time is up. perpetuates. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Bowen to be followed by Lucas Jensen. Hi, I'm Susan Bowen. I'm here to ask you all to pop your information bubble. Burlington is one of 16 towns that voted for mask mandates. The rest, right now we're up to 72 that voted for no mask mandates or recommendations. 72 in Vermont. You're one of 15, 16. And I found that information on Vermont Daily Chronicle. It's another news source which you might want to look at, vermontdailychronicle.com. And it tells you a lot of news that you do not get everywhere else. Um, another place you might want to look to pop your information bubble is healthchoicevt.com. HealthChoiceVT has a lot of information and the true studies on masks and vaccines, and we believe in health choice. It's our choice on what we do to our own body. We live in America, people. So it's time to pop your information bubbles. Go on to HealthChoiceVT, go to different news outlets like American or One American News Network, which is OAN.com. Um, look for the information and don't get fearful because of our fear-mongering Dr. Levine. So folks could just please refrain from personal attacks. Um, our next speaker is Lucas Jensen, um, and that's the last person that I have um, for non-Burlington in person, so then I'll transition to the last speaker um, who is non-Burlington remote. Hi, uh, my name is Lucas Jensen. I'm a small-time housing provider in Burlington for nearly 20 years. I don't live in Burlington, but I live very close by in Williston. Um, I want to be clear about the unintended consequences of the limits you're considering placing on short-term rentals. Um, because of those limits and those of us who are not owner-occupants, uh, many of us are going to sell the properties that we own in Burlington. Um, or in addition to possibly, we're going to raise the rents on our other tenants in order to make up for that lost income. Um, case in point, I recently sold a property that I own in Burlington because of the increased cost to operate in this city. I'm talking about taxes and a lot of the uncertainty for us housing providers. The day after I sold that property, the new owner sent notices to all of the tenants in that building that they were going to raise rents considerably. In fact, he offered one of the tenants $5,000 to move out of that unit because it was so much more valuable without her living in it. And she called and left me a message in tears uh, because she was losing her housing um, because of that. Um, our ability to operate, our, us as small time housing providers, our ability to operate short term rentals gives us extra income that allows us to offset uh, the rents that we get 
in our other units. And when you take that away from us, housing is going to become less affordable for many more people in Burlington than it will make more affordable if you pass the regulations. It is an unintended consequence that you need to be very aware of, that housing is going to become less affordable for many if you don't allow us. There is a way to figure out a way uh, for us to continue to operate despite what city staff has said. It is possible. So your time is up. Thank, Thank you. you. Our, we're gonna transition back. Thank you for getting that timer up. Appreciate it. Um, so still not able to locate Laura Massell or Paul Hendler. Um, so I'll go to our final speaker who signed up um, remotely. Um, and that is Chris Weinberg. Chris, I've enabled your microphone. Good evening. Um, I spoke to the council on November 8th, and I would like to encourage the council to question the transparency and integrity of Burlington International Airport and the acting director of aviation. So please. Uh, the acting director of aviation, acting director of aviation provided assurance to this body on November 8th that general aviation tenants of the area known as the Valley would not be impacted as a result of the license agreement that was executed with Beta Technologies that evening. And earlier today, one of those tenants received notification that their leases was being terminated. We have proposed a resolution to form a general aviation task force to advise and inform the city council on factors concerning general aviation and the airport at large. There has been great concern about creating this task force. It was actually removed from the agenda this evening. And I would encourage the council to consider this as an example of the very reasons that we're pushing to form this general aviation task force to make sure that all of the general aviation stakeholders in the Burlington community are heard from. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our public forum for this evening. Thank you to everyone um, for joining us this evening and sharing your feedback with the council uh, and the administration. So we will now move in, back into our agenda itself. Um, having completed the climate emergency reports, we'll move into the consent agenda. Um, Councilor Stromberg, may I please have a motion on the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you, we have a motion, is there a second? Seconded by Councilor McGee, any discussion? See, I, I, seeing none, I, go to a vote. I, um, all those in favor, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing none, that carries. And we will move into, um, well, before we get to our deliberative agenda, we just have two quick meetings um, to get to. Um, before that, these are other um, structures uh, under that we um, that we engage with, the Board of Civil Authority and then the Local Control Commi Commission, both of which have short agendas. So um, I'll turn it over, I'll recess the, the City Council meeting at 816 and turn it over to Mayor Weinberger um, for the Board of Civil Authority. I'm going to call the Board of Civil Authority to order at 8.16 p.m. And the first item on the agenda is the agenda. We Thank welcome you. a motion to adopt it. Councilor Mason. So I'd move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> second by Councilor Paul. Any discussion? Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The agenda is adopted, which brings us to the consent agenda by Councilor Mason. I make a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you, is there a second? Second by President Tracy. And any discussion? All those in fo favor of adopting the consent agenda, please, uh, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously, and without objection, the Board of Civil Authority is adjourned at 8, 17 p.m. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. We will now convene the Local Control Commission meeting at 8, 17 p.m. Um, we, um, 
The first item on the agenda is the agenda. Councilor Ma Commissioner Mason. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Tracy. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Okay, we have a motion on the agenda. Is there a second? <coughs> Seconded by Councilor Hansen. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Brings us to item number two, our consent agenda. Commissioner Mason, are you able to offer a motion on the consent agenda? Yes, thank you. I'd like to, I'd move that we adopt the agenda uh, and take the actions indicated. Thank you. We have moved by Councillor Mason. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor McGee. Any discussion? <coughs> okay, not seeing any, so we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. We'll move to the, the only item on the deliberative agenda for this item, um, Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. I'd move that we approve the 2021-2022 third class liquor license application for Sushi Meda, 152 Cherry Street with all standard conditions. Thank you, I have a motion, is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Commissioner Hansen. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. And without objection, we will adjourn, adjourn the uh, Local Control Commission at 819 and reconvene the full City Council meeting at that, uh, at that same time, 819. Give folks a second to just click over into that agenda um, where we will pick up um, at item 5.01. Um, which is a presentation um, from Marielle Matthews, uh, Public Health Equity Manager um, in the uh, REIB, and Scott Pavick, Substance Use uh, uh, Analyst uh, with REIB uh, regarding overdose prevention sites. Um, I know we, uh, we also have uh, a number of other folks uh, on um, who will be also joining the presentation, um, including uh, Ed Baker, um, Ed Baker, um, I'm sorry, uh, Grace Keller and um, Jillian Kirby. So I will um, turn it over to Marielle. Uh, Marielle, let me give you um, the um, hosting responsibilities so that you are able to share. All right, thank you, um, Councilor Tracy. Let's see. Looks like I can share. So let me just bring these into presentation mode. How does that look? Uh, that looks great. Okay, wonderful. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you about overdose prevention sites in Burlington. I'm Mariel Matthews. I'm the Public Health Equity Manager within the Department of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the City of Burlington. And I'm joined by my colleague, Scott Pavic, who is a Substance Use Policy Analyst within REIB, Ed Baker, who is the host and producer of the Addiction Recovery Channel, Grace Keller and Jess Kirby, both from Safe Recovery, um, a program of the Howard Center. This presentation accompanies a report on envisioning overdose prevention sites in Burlington, which was a report requested by City Council via resolution in September 2020. The, res the report is posted publicly on board docs within the agenda for tonight. This report proposes a pilot project, um, but just to be clear, there is no pilot about to move forward right now as of tonight, but more groundwork is being laid via the creation of this report. The hope is that we would continue preparing for um, overdose prevention sites or OPS to be a reality here in Burlington. And I'll propose some next steps at the end of this presentation. So as most of you on council know already, an overdose prevention site or OPS is a place where people can bring pre-obtained drugs and consume them under the supervision of medical professionals who can intervene if an overdose occurs. Um, There's usually. I'm just going to ask you to stop for a second because I'm not seeing it's. Well, it is changing on to the second slide on your pre on um, on the the Zoom. I'm not seeing it also reflected on the screen in the room. Just so that counselors. There we go. Okay. Thank you for taking a pause. Sure. Um, yeah. If it seems like there's a delay, please ask me to pause again. Um, 
So at an overdose prevention site, there is usually a reception area, a drug consumption area, an observation area, and a medical intervention area. There may also be treatment and other services in the same location. And the whole point of these sites is to prevent people from using their drugs alone, since we know that many fatal overdoses happen when folks are alone. And more broadly, the goal of public health is saving lives, preventing premature death, preventing and treating chronic disease and chronic health conditions and promoting equity. When most people think of our public health response to substance use disorder, most people usually think um, of treatment, which would fall in this secondary, um, secondary area on this spectrum. In the harm reduction side of this spectrum, this is where OPS would fall along with um, the very successful low barrier buprenorphine program at Safe Recovery. Harm reduction is really important for us to prioritize because we first and foremost need to make sure that folks are alive in order to enter treatment. I know this is review for many folks on the line, but providing it for context here. And now I've advanced to the next slide, so let me know if that has updated. Yes. Okay, great. Unfortunately, overdoses, overdose deaths have risen in the last several years. This figure shows a national trend from 2015 to 2020. And sadly, in 2021, the trend has continued and worsened throughout the course of this pandemic. Most, but not all, of these fatal over drug overdoses are from opioids. As you can see here, the um, light blue bar is from opioids. And within these, um, most of those opioid overdoses are specifically attributable to fentanyl, which is here, synthetic opioid deaths generally refers to fentanyl. Ed Baker will talk a little bit more about this trend, but the takeaway here is that um, we really only expect overdose death to increase unless we add new harm reduction interventions into our mix of public health strategies. So I have advanced the slide again. Um, and this is regional data from our police agencies who use a software system called Valcor. Um, this slide shows um, the data from Burlington and some nearby towns, and we see op opioid overdoses with police response trending upward in this visual, especially over the course of 2020 to 2021, and as we round out to 2022 here as well. So we're looking at this lighter gray trend line in the back to see the change over time. We also see a slow increase in cocaine overdoses with police response. Again, looking at the same data set of um, police agencies or law enforcement agencies that use the software system. So we see mostly this um, trend moving up from 2020 to 2021 and 2021 on. And then lastly, we also see an increase um, emerging with methamphetamine overdoses with police response as we see this trend line increasing. So all of these things are cause for concern for us and also um, cause for us to take some pause and think about other innovative ways to intervene and make sure that um, overdose is not happening in our community and that when it does happen, it is not fatal. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Scott Hobbit. We'll talk through some of the report details. Thank you, Marielle. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Great. Um, so the vision for an overdose prevention site that we've offered in today's report is fairly similar to those already established in the United States, Canada, and Australia. Like those sites, this is a pilot that's structured around very evidence-based medical practice designed specifically to reduce overdose mortality. Uh, the ways in which the program is unique, um, as a callback to the, the spectrum Mariel had presented, we're framing a lot of these services, not just through a lens of harm reduction, but also prevention and treatment. Our report notes the importance of providing case management in conjunction with overdose reversal services, which would not only benefit visitors seeking access to additional health or social services, but also those organizations and agencies providing the services themselves. Uh, while this policy proposal is often associated with opioid use, services that we presented are designed to address use of any and all substances. 
For example, we saw these sites um, launched in Canada in response to the first few waves of the quote unquote opioid crisis. Um, the poisoning crisis driven by illicit fentanyl now has sort of renewed interest in these. And we're also looking at this program um, as a critical tool in creating comprehensive responses to the things that we're maybe not addressing as well, such as uh, stimulant use disorder or looking at getting out ahead of potentially emergent trends, things like xylazine. Um, a little bit more about those connections on the next slide. Perfect. So if you can see that slide, um, as the research has affirmed across academic studies of sites across countries, um, there's there's quite a bit to be enthusiastic about, about this potential pilot and the associated health outcomes. And the things that we've observed through studies of sites elsewhere are exactly what we're trying to achieve here in Burlington. Particularly pertinent might be that third bullet point, a decrease in found syringes. Um, and it's also important to note the time frame we've sort of put forth as a dream or a vision for this first pilot. And really, that's looking at one to two years, something to offer enough opportunity for evaluation and assessment that would also allow for service revision. Um, while overdose prevention sites can take many forms, um, we're mostly thinking about what you see in the picture in this slide here, really a single brick and mortar location, ideally located either adjacent or within um, an existing health service provider here in the community. We're also suggesting that pilot managers endeavor to make primary services as accessible as possible, as you would with any health program, but to also consider provision of services when other overdose response mechanisms um, might lack capacity or might be unavailable entirely. Look finally at my next slide. Perfect. Uh, so we have three data visualizations here. Two on the left are overdose responses as recorded in incident narratives submitted by police to Valcor. So there's a lot of caveats there in terms of this is a, a great sense of where overdoses are occurring, but not comprehensive. Um, what you'll see, uh, the darker red areas in the left and center pictures are indicating greater frequency of responses. The blue lines, if you can see them, are public transportation routes. Um, and it's pretty obvious just from those two photos that you can see a cluster in downtown Burlington of overdose responses. Visualization on the far right, those are just C-click fix reports of improperly discarded needles or syringes reported to the city for disposal. Of course, we see these reports as proximates of, of where drug use is probably occurring. Um, and taken together, these points of information are things we'd monitor moving forward to guide citing considerations, in addition to what emerges from community engagement. Of course, what are the people who are most likely to use these sites saying themselves? And with all that, um, we'll turn it over quickly to our experts. I think we're starting with Ed Baker from the Addiction Recovery Channel. Thanks, Ed. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Uh, yes, just make sure you speak up. I will. So thank you, Scott, and thank you, Marielle, for an excellent uh, presentation. And um, I'm Ed Baker, and I wanna thank the uh, city council members for their continued focus on this most uh, urgent uh, issue that we face today. I'd like to begin my few minutes a little bit uncharacteristically. I'd like, I'd like to ask the council members uh, to join me and join each other in, in just a brief moment of silence in honor of the many fellow Vermonters who have been taken, taken from us by addiction. So just let's just join each other for a few moments in silence. Thank you. Thank you. So, so for, for my part, 
I, I want to try to describe uh, the, the, the terrible uh, gravity of what is occurring and the velocity, the force with which it is occurring and will continue to occur. In order to do that, we have to take a brief uh, look at 2014. In, in 2014, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, their analysis cited two troubling trends. One trend was a, a steady 15 year increase in the number of um, overdose fatalities specifically related to pharmaceutical opioids. And we know everything about that now. So I won't go into that. <clears throat> the other disturbing trend was uh, a tripling in deaths attributable to heroin, tripling in four short years. So uh, an accelerated um, uh, rate of death attributable to heroin, 2011, 12, 13, and 14. <clears throat> the interesting thing about this report is that in a footnote, in a footnote, it noted for the first time a trending related to IMF or illegally manufactured uh, fentanyl, acetylfentanyl. The Drug Enforcement Administration, their National Drug uh, Threat Assessment for that period, 2014, cited the number of deaths attributable to fentanyl at 700, 700, 2014. If you fast forward to the 12 month period ending April, 2021, the number of deaths in America attributable to fentanyl and its many analogs is 68,000. 2014, 700. 2021, 68,000. This is what we're up against. It is unprecedented. And we should make no mistake about it. Vermont is but a grim reflection of what is occurring nationally. The same period ending April, 2021, Vermont for the 12 months preceding that period had CDC, as noted, Vermont has had an 85% increase in drug overdose fatality from 114 to 2011 in one year. The worst or the highest increase in rate in America, Vermont saw that this, that year. If you look at 2021 reports now, the Vermont Health Department is reporting 150 deaths <clears throat> due to a, a drug overdose with 23 uh, death certificates being um, validated. So you can say for all intents and purposes, up until September of 2021, there's 173 Vermonters, fellow Vermonters who have died of drug overdoses. If you continue that trend, Toward the, to the end of the year, we'll have approximately 230 deaths in Vermont this year of drug overdoses. <clears throat> That's two Vermonters every three days. Two Vermonters, two fellow Vermonters dying every three days. <clears throat> so I'll conclude with this. The need for, for intervention could not be clearer. <clears throat> This is the definition of urgency. It's the definition of emergency. The science, as Scott pointed out, could not be clearer. It is unequivocal that these sites work. The willingness of the most at-risk population in Chittenden County couldn't be clearer. They've been polled, 91%, of people injecting drugs that were polled would use an overdose prevention site. They don't wanna be alone. They're forced to be alone. They would like to be somewhere where they could be saved if they overdose. The funding is available. Thank goodness for TJ Donovan and his um, 
fellow attorneys general nationwide for pursuing opioid uh, wholesale distributors and settling a class action suit. Vermont will be getting millions of dollars per year for 30 years. <clears throat> Thank goodness for T.J. Donovan and his relentless uh, colleagues, because they will bring the Sackler family to justice. <clears throat> And there will be millions more dollars coming into Vermont over the foreseeable future. The funding is here. A precedent, a precedent is set. On November 30th, two overdose prevention sites opened in Manhattan on point. One in East Harlem, the other in Washington Heights. This is a state directly, this is not Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, <clears throat> Canada even. This is New York State, right across the lake. The precedent is set. I'm going to end with the last four words that Dr. Ju Young Park uttered at Mayor Weinberger's community stat meeting recently. Dr. Ju Young Park is a, a renowned researcher and expert in this field from Brown University. At a question and answer period regarding overdose prevention sites, her last four words were, the time is now. So with that, I'll pass it off to, um, and thank you for having me. I'll pass it to, to Grace and uh, Jess, thank you. Thanks, Ed. I'm not sure, counselors, how much time we have left right now, but if we have time, we'll um, hear from Jess and Grace. If not, we'll have them available for Q&A. No, we have time. I, we have time. Let's okay. hear from Justin Gray since we have okay. on the on the line. Appreciate appreciate you being sure. mindful of the time. Um, but absolutely, yeah, let's, let's go to Justin Grace for sure. Um, I can go. My name's Jess Kirby. I work at Howard Center Safe Recovery. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Can you nod if you do? I'm a little laggy. Um, I am the harm reduction supervisor at Safe Recovery. And I'm also a person in long-term recovery from opiate use disorder myself. And I've had overdoses myself where I was using alone because I didn't have another alternative and it was really scary and that's not what I wanted to be doing. I'm lucky that I survived. If that was today, I might not have because um, of fentanyl and how much more likely you are to have a fatal overdose with fentanyl. And I just wanted to, you know, make sure that I said that, you know, working with this population every day, I do think people would use this site. I think that we need this site and, you know, we lose a lot of people at Safe Recovery. When we lose Vermonters, we often know them at Safe Recovery and it's absolutely devastating to us. That's my child in the background, I'm sorry. Um, and we feel like we've helped them with everything we can, that, that we have the tools to help them with. Like, we provide people with Narcan, we provide people with, you know, low barrier access to buprenorphine, we help with housing and case management and connection to medical care and all those things. But in the end, you know, am I uh, lagging? No, you're okay. I'm, okay. Ariel, if you could just please go out of speaker view. I mean, go out of, yeah, there we go. Stop sharing just so that we can see um, Jess. Go ahead, go ahead, Jess. Okay. One of the things, you know, we feel like we've helped people with all of the things that like at our disposable, the tools that we have, like helping people with low barrier bupe and, and making sure that people have the Narcan they need and their family members have the Narcan they need and helping people connect to medical care and housing and doing all kinds of case management and all that stuff. But in the end, the one thing that we can't help with is, you know, one thing that people really need and that's providing people with an alternative to use alone. And there's a lot of times when I'm talking to people, you know, who've had previous overdoses, traumatizing events where partners have overdosed, and, you know, trying to make safety plans with people for alternatives to, to use alone and to not using alone. And a lot of times people don't have it. And that feels really crappy as a provider trying to make a plan with somebody to how to not have a fatal overdose when you're losing clients, you know, weekly. And people are like, I don't, I want to tell you I won't use alone, but I don't have an option. You know, a lot of times people are homeless or in hotel rooms by themselves. Um, you know, they try to use places that they get kicked out of, that kind of thing. And it just kind of feels like, you know, working in harm reduction every day with people who are most at risk for overdose and fetal overdose that 
it really does feel like we're really behind right now and that this is like one thing that we know could save lives and that we could be doing for people. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to take the opportunity to tell you, like, as somebody working in this population every day and somebody who's experienced this myself um, and trying to find ways to not use alone myself and having overdoses myself, like, how badly I think that we need this in Vermont. And I just wanted to, um, to tell, tell everyone that here. Grace, you can go. Oh, it's my it's my life's challenge to always follow Jess. She does job. Um, so I'm Grace Keller. I'm the program coordinator at Howard Center Safe Recovery, um, and I've I've been here before on safe consumption sites. We call them overdose prevention sites um, now. That is really the term of art. And um, piggybacking on what Jess said, uh, I have been to a safe an overdose prevention site. I've visited Vancouver when we were looking at this in the legislature a couple years back. Um, I also have reversed overdoses at Safe Recovery, so I can do a comparison on what happens in both situations. Um, I've used Narcan myself 20 times um, on individuals that have been brought to Safe Recovery, blue overdose and not breathing. Um, all of them were brought in a car by somebody who was terrified. And um, I've used, actually I've used Narcan probably eight of those 20 times. Um, no, I've used Narcan all of those 20 times now that I think about it. And um, and then we had one actual overdose on site. All of the rest were people that were brought to safe recovery. Um, and in those situations, I've done Narcan, I've done rescue breathing. Um, the person is blue, they're not, they're not breathing. Um, and it's, it's one of the most terrifying things you'll ever see, um, especially because it doesn't uh, resolve itself immediately. There's been times where I've had to give many doses of Narcan. Um, and the only reason that we've been able to save people every single one of those times is luck. So we are really factoring in luck at this point um, when we have an intervention that we know can shave down that time, um, that is evidence-based to shave down that time. So when I was in Vancouver, it was pretty emotional um, because you get to see what happens there is if an overdose occurs, there's medical staff, they're right there, they're there within seconds and they're reversing the overdose immediately. With when it's happened with me, um, the person who's brought them there doesn't even know how long that they've been um, overdosed. And that's, uh, that's really hard to assess. Even having done this myself, even having trained thousands of people in overdose um, reversal, you know, time slows down. You can't tell if it's been a minute or 10 minutes. Um, and all you know is that it doesn't look good for a very long period of time. And again, the only reason that we've been successful with all of those is that the person driving them to safe recovery got them there just in time. And so when we look at places like Vancouver, where they've never had a fatal overdose, and it's because that time frame is seconds, not minutes, not 10 minutes, um, they probably won't, hopefully won't. With us, we are in a totally different situation where we are completely vulnerable and at risk for having my entire staff witness a fatal overdose, having myself and, and other people administer Narcan to somebody who doesn't survive. Um, and I think I've talked about this before. We interview all of our clients on, on intake and for a very long period of time, up until 2017, 23 to 26% of them reported witnessing an overdose. In 2017, that number jumped up to 81%. That's in one year. That is what we're looking at with fentanyl on the street. This drug is incredibly powerful. Um, and like Jess said, we are located in downtown Burlington, um, but we're the only full-time syringe exchange in Vermont. So we have clients from every county in the state and sometimes as high as 30% come from outside of Chittenden County. So when you hear about fatal overdoses, oftentimes we know them, we know their dreams, we know their recovery successes, we know their challenges, we know their families, their partners, their children. Um, so it's been very, very devastating to me and my staff and our community to be losing people at such a high rate. Um, what I can say for syringe service programs, the CDC says people are five times more likely to enter treatment. Um, we, as the city, um, especially a, a lot of you there, we all work very hard 
to making sure that treatment access was available. We've, we've given out 32,000 doses of Narcan out of our safe recovery office alone. Um, but as Jess said, the one problem we haven't been able to solve is that making sure, ensuring that there's somebody there um, to save somebody's life. And not only to save their life, but to have wraparound services to offer um, support, to offer treatment, uh, to, to really spend time with people. And the CDC says people in syringe service programs are five times more likely to enter treatment than those who don't. We believe the same would be for uh, an overdose prevention site. So we're here for questions. I, I think it's probably easier to do that and answer, answer some questions. So thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate your attention to this really important issue. Yeah, thank, thank you, Grace. Thanks, Grace, Jess, and Ed. I just have a few next steps to summarize for council so you, that you know where we're going and where um, you can direct any questions. And let me just see if I can get the screen share back. Hold on one second. Um, so in terms of next steps, <laughs> well, that's not what I meant to do. Um, city staff will continue to work with the state legislature um, to advocate for um, legislative change that will allow for overdose prevention sites at the state level. Um, I also hope to report back on a review of feasibility of any um, changes that need to happen in order to ready ourselves for an overdose prevention site here in Burlington meaning looking at um, all kinds of licenses and regulatory structures. Um, and we will provide an update after uh, this legislative session, let you know if there's been any progress made with the legislature. And specifically, I'm wondering, can city council provide a recommitment to overdose prevention sites? It's been helpful to have um, the previous resolutions stating how strongly committed to overdose prevention sites you are. They've been looked at nationally. Um, they're certainly helping, you know, uh, tone the conversation um, to be more towards um, protective public health policies and, and harm reduction. And we also wonder if a letter of support from council um, might be issued in, that supports a previous letter um, that the community stat subcommittee on overdose prevention sites just sent to the legislature um, or the mayor's office sent to the legislature on behalf of those um, folks who wrote it um, last week, just advocating for overdose prevention sites and for the legislators to consider any overdose prevention site bills that come before them. With that, um, I'll end our screen share and can take any questions that you have. Okay, the, the floor is open. Any questions or comments from counselors? Councilor Paul. Uh, thanks, President Tracy. Uh, thanks so much for this presentation. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with some of the people that just spoke this evening, you're getting the A team when it comes to uh, overdose prevention sites. These are people who have devoted tremendous amounts of time to this issue and uh, our, our uh, uh, are strong, strong advocates for this harm, for promoting uh, harm reduction and specifically overdose prevention sites. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, both President Tracy and I are members of, as the two counselors that are on Comstat, uh, we did sign onto the letter um, that will go to the State House and. Uh, uh, with along with I can't even I can't, I can't even remember how many others, but there are a number of others that have signed on to this as well. And uh, the last resolution that we did bring forward in 2020 received unanimous support. Um, if there is a desire to see us do, you know, to have another a recommitment to that, uh, we're certainly open to doing so. Um, I think. I think there is strong support for overdose prevention sites on this council. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. Uh, I'm not sure if this is appropriately answered by Marielle or who um, of our presenters. Well, could you maybe lay out 
the steps that would be necessary, you know, between now and opening, you know, whether that's legislative, whether that's finding a partner agency, funding, uh, just to sort of pull out of the, you know, on the ground to maybe a 30 or 60,000 foot level, you know, and the timing associated with um, potentially moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can definitely comment on that and um, would invite others to jump in as you'd like. Um, I think, as you mentioned, the biggest hurdle here is a legislative change. Um, and so Rhode Island has um, authorized the opening of a overdose prevention site at the state level um, within their legislature. They have not yet, to my knowledge, opened a site. Um, New York took a different approach um, in getting their site up and running. Um, but that certainly the legislative um, the legislative change is a barrier. Um, it, it's a barrier in part um, just for the, the site operating, but also a barrier in part for finding a willing partner who is ready to um, jump in and you know do something that is that the legislature is actively saying is not okay right now. So um, Advocating at the state level and advocating at also the local level are both really important next steps. Um, finding that key partner and having um, partners, um, we think we have um, several partners potentially identified, but having folks um, be at the ready and, and doing the um, operational review to understand what it would take um, staffing wise, um, resource-wise in order to open is another step. We have some citing considerations in the report that we um, submitted last week, um, mostly looking again at overdose locations. I think there are additional data sets that we could look at um, in order to get more accurate on where um, our largest clusters of, of overdoses are occurring. Um, we have also made staffing recommendations within that report about how many staff we may need um, or how many staff may be needed um, and what kinds of, you know, potentially considerations folks would, what considerations would need to be made in, in terms of the whole sphere of harm, harm reduction and service provision um, exist within Burlington in order to find really those key um, times to be open and deliver services. Um, those are only a few of the next steps, but it's a, it, there are plenty um, of next steps. So I wanna see <laughs> if any of the other folks on the line have comments to add there. I don't wanna muddy the waters, but I wanna be clear that we can move forward um, without any consultants being hired, with any, without any legislative changes, just with our own internal capacity to sort of collect those data sets to guide citing considerations. Otherwise, a lot is gonna to wait to be determined until we have a partner for this. Uh, regardless, funding questions or mixes can still be explored well before any commitment is made. Those are great points, Scott, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Mason. Councilor Carpenter? I'm just curious. Um, I know there are communities, or a couple of the models out there have mobile sites versus a permanent site. Um, can you kind of talk about the differences there? Sorry, you may not have picked it up on the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I know that there are, um, some models out there that have mobile sites versus permanent sites. Could you sort of speak about um, the difference between that and, and what you might be looking for in, in Burlington? As uh, we mentioned in the report, this pilot specifically looked at a brick and mortar location. Um, that's based on the fact that a lot of the academic research we've looked at, the vast, vast majority is focused on those sites specifically. Um, I know that mobile sites are something that's that have been in the agenda sphere here in Vermont. We've had legislation introduced in the last session to explore expansion of mobile harm reduction services. Um, and certainly looking at 
the data that we collect through client engagement and over the course of this pilot looking to have the flexibility to meet clients where they're at of course um but basically the the differences between the two models are a van that will take a set route and meet people where they're at versus uh, a location that is open when people come to the doors i think it's also a, a capacity issue that usually a static site can see more people in a day than a mobile site could so um when we were conceptualizing this, we did conceptualize um, what would it be like if a pilot were expanded to include a mobile site. Um, and I think that's still a good option to leave on the table to hit um, multiple needs. Um, but ultimately, if we it came down to what is the suggestion for this pilot that will be evaluated to understand what the needs are in the community and what the community wants. Um, and a, a static site um, has capacity to serve more folks. And also, I think to provide all those additional services that we were talking about, you know, case management, medical staff, like there's more ability to do that at a static site. Okay, Just to clarify, I assume in addition to the um, oversight of, of the in injections, you have ongoing staff that would provide wraparound services and other referral, that kind of thing? That's, okay. that's the model we propose, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Carpenter. I have Councilor McGee to be followed by Councilor Hightower. Thank you, President Tracy. I want to thank you all for uh, putting this report together and um, the, just for the work that you do um, within the frameworks that we currently have available to um, do what you can to prevent overdoses. Um, you know, I think acknowledging the urgency and the emergency as uh, Ed mentioned, um, I think it is vital for the council to take action uh, to redouble our commitment to make overdose prevention sites happen, and I would absolutely support sending a letter to the legislature and passing another resolution. Thank you, Councilor McGee. I have Councilor Hightower. Yeah, and I don't have too much to add. Um, I think, you know, you're hearing from the council kind of one by one, but I haven't certainly heard anything negative towards this again. And personally, I also just want to say thank you as someone who doesn't know but as much about this as Councillor Tracy and um, President Tracy or um, Councillor Paul. Just appreciate you all taking the time to really walk us through everything. I think for me, a lot of this information was new, so I just really, really appreciate it. And like Councillor McGee said, I'm also supportive of re-upping our commitment to um, making this a reality. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, and uh, I echo Councillor Hightower's sentiments. Um, I really appreciate the information that we've received, um, both in the advanced communication and the presentations tonight. I um, have a couple questions. One is, um, the places that I have read about that have overdose prevention sites now are very large cities. And one of the things that large cities often offer is, is more sense of anonymity than we have here in Burlington. And I wondered, um, and this question, I don't know if it sounds naive, I, I can certainly see it being misinterpreted, but I still think it's an important question that I'll, that I'll ask. Who, uses these sites, um, why would somebody, I mean, I can understand that somebody would choose to use these sites if they're afraid, obviously if they're afraid of dying of an overdose, which is a constant threat. But I would also think that there would be a desire to do this in, in private and not to go to a site where it would be known by everyone in this very small community what you're doing. If it's within a um, healthcare facility, 
that might offer more privacy. But I wonder kind of what the, what the vision is and if you can educate me on what the thinking of a user is as they, as they use a site like this. Um, I, I certainly think that something like this is far preferable than uh, it, it's, it's better for the users, obviously. It can prevent deaths. It can help people that are, are literally using on the street. But I'm also wondering what would it feel like for users in our community? I'll take the first stab, but I think Grace and Jess are probably best equipped to answer this. Um, I would contest the notion that there is widespread awareness of who in our community is accessing these existing services. I don't think anyone on the council could name more than five particular clients, if, if that, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what would it feel like for someone uh, to have a safe place to go where they know they might have their life safe? I, I, I would think that'd be pretty, pretty uplifting. Uh, I, I would think that would be wonderful for people who chose to access that. In terms of who is using these sites, anyone and everyone, um, in terms of who the doors are open to, um, if you're looking for more specifics in terms of who are the populations that are accessing these sites as established elsewhere, it's the most marginalized, most in need group of people in our communities. Um, that's probably why it's harder to see them. They're, they're not the kind to come advocate for themselves when you don't have capacity for so many things to then in turn fight for policy reform or say, hey, I would use this. Um, I'll add something, you know, just as a person that, you know, has utilized harm reduction services myself, there was a time that I thought I would never set foot in a syringe exchange, you know, and I ended up doing that really, you know, frequently. Um, and I think fear and need overcomes like the concern of what people might think about you or see you coming in and out of a building. So, you know, because the same question could be asked for people that are utilizing a syringe service program, like, don't people know that's a syringe exchange, you know, we have, you know, hundreds of people a week that come. So I think it's kind of the same sort of thing that people have a need for something. People are really scared. And I think that that overcomes like, will 100% of people use an overdose prevention site? No, but I, you know, 90% of our clients said that they would, you know, over 90%. So I think a lot of it is just, um, you know, fear and need, and that and that really overcomes a lot of that concern. Well, thank you. That's actually very helpful. And and Scott, the connection with the um, needle exchange, which you kindly connected we, me with for for a tour, um, helps me have a better vision of what what this might look like. Um, yeah. The other uh, question I have is like, how wide an area would you expect to draw from? Would people be driving to a site like this or dr particularly driving from it? What's the kind of radius that would be served? I can try and take this one. The, um, yes, it's great yes, from yes. Safe Recovery. Um, the driving issue comes up a lot. It's something that we grapple with um, anyway. I think the driving issue for me is often the reason that people get concerned about having a safe or a, a overdose prevention site. The driving um, concern to me is the reason why you would have one. Because um, right now, what happens for a lot of people is that they are using in places they're driven into the shadows. They're um, hiding from people, you know, from law enforcement. They're in unsafe places, and then they um, oftentimes end up having to drive away or or have to drive themselves somewhere else. Um, we have plenty of unsafe injection sites all over the city, um, where this would allow for um, intervention, observation, support around um, if somebody wasn't okay to drive. Um, there are policies in all of the places that uh, that exist about 
um, a waiting period before you leave. And, and actually that's a great time to offer people services is um, after they've used the site and, and w while people are waiting and seeing if they're safe to leave. Um, and those protocols would all be in place. But to me, that really speaks to why we really would want to consider this because right now what we have is people using in unsafe locations, unmitigated, without support, without somebody that could step in if there was a concern about driving. Um, and this would bring them in in a place that's safe, that with people they trust, just like you're talking about. Um, they, and there has to be a high level of trust in the agency that would do this um, in the population. But it gives the opportunity for intervention, which right now we really don't have in so many of these cases. Um, so I, I wonder if that answers your question and feel free to, and also um, Councillor Shannon did come for a tour at Safe Recovery. We opened that up. We are closed to the public from 12 to, close to clients from 12 to one. So anybody who would like to come by, I know this has been a couple of years, we would love to have you um, just reach out and we can make something happen. But I hope that answered your question. Anybody else can feel free to jump in. Yeah. I would just I would add one thing about you know the people that would probably use this site. I think the demographic would be similar to those who use um, you know our insurance service program in Burlington, Safe Recovery, and the vast majority of our clients don't drive. And whenever this conversation comes up, like I always like to say that most of our clients are coming on foot, um, and it's pretty rare. Maybe a couple clients a day come in a car, but most people. So it's not. You know, just trying when you envision it, I don't think you, you should envision that every person that comes in the site, there's going to be a situation where we have to, you know, figure out driving a car because I think that it, it won't come up as often as people think. So. If, if, if I might add a little bit, would that be okay? Sure, go ahead. Well, going back to the uh, counselor's uh, question about how people would feel, you know, People, people with addiction are have been stigmatized against um, since since the well since the beginning of time actually, but really since the war on drugs in the 1970s, there's been a, a consistent uh, effort built into public policy to dehumanize people who use drugs. The war on drugs was designed to just persecute, prosecute, and incarcerate uh, people with a disease. So people, people with addiction, they're languishing in the shadows. They're afraid to come out. They're afraid to come out because rightfully so, they, they feel they'll be arrested and, and incarcerated. Um, when you have a place like a Safe Recovery, and Grace, if you could just touch a little bit on the level of trust that, that people feel for you and your team members. Um, I mean, I, I can say I'm a person in recovery. I have had a, have a history of injection drug use. I've been in recovery for a very long time. And um, it was Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous and being around people who didn't look at me through a lens of stigma and understood who I was and what I needed that saved my life. And this is what will happen with an overdose prevention site. If it's located in a place where there's trust, where people can feel they can go and not be arrested and not be persecuted and not be looked down upon and not be scorned, and that's Grace's place, then word, word will spread by word of mouth very, very quickly. Very, very quickly, we will have a population that knows there is someplace safe where people understand you, where you can go and not be alone. And that kind of affirmation um, resonates with people. We all know that. And, and people with addiction are people. It resonates with them no less than it resonates with us being accepted. People with addiction just aren't accepted anywhere. If you would, if you would, could create a totem of stigma, the people at the lowest rung, the people most stigmatized against, would be people who inject drugs, and that's the people we're talking about. By and by, those are the people who are dying, and in Vermont, they're probably going to be dying too every three days. 
unless we do something about it. So Grace, could you talk a little bit about the trust that you've managed to create with your your, your, your people at, at, at Safe Recovery? I'll well, so just I, say I, that. Uh, so Councilor Shannon has the floor right now. Um, so Councilor Shannon. Yeah. I, th I think you have actually answered my questions really well. And um, I appreciate yeah. if, uh, I, I actually appreciate the respect you've treated my questions, which may have been a little bit ignorant, but I think a lot of us need that education. Yeah. And you. your answers have really helped me feel more more comfortable with the idea. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. I have Councilor Hansen. Great, just wanted to thank you all so much for all your work on this, um, all the progress you're making for communicating it to us and the public and walking us through that. Um, and just wanna echo other counselors in offering my full, full support for Burlington continuing to move forward and establishing um, one or more safe injection sites. So thank you very much and look forward to continuing to work together on this. Thank you, Councilor Hanson. I don't have anyone else in the queue. We set to wrap up on this item. Oh, Councilor Jang have a question, President Tracy. Go ahead, Councilor Jang. Thank you, President Tracy. And I mean, um, Scott Pavek, you know, I think since I have known you, I know you just, you know, advocating for this. Um, and Grace Keller, your name come up in our line of work. And Mr. Ed, you know, always in CCTV Channel 17, raising awareness about this issue. And Marival, thank you for all you do too for the city. Um, so basically, my, my question is about next steps. We have this in front of us today, but what is next from here? I, I think it, it bears repeating again, um, uh, looking at our internal capacity to gather some of the data that can help guide inciting considerations. I think we've laid out a few roles for the city council uh, to potentially aid in some advocacy efforts related to the legislative obstacles at the state level. Um, certainly, we would need a little more guidance or to reconvene for next steps that could be pursued uh, within our own existing capacity. But um, regardless of who the partners are, uh, I would think a study of commercial real estate and related insurance stuff I know nothing about uh, would certainly be helpful. If I could, if I could uh, just uh, briefly respond to that idea of next steps, that, that I, I personally think it's very important for us to take some very simple next steps. Everyone here, there's been a tremendous amount of support offered for the idea. So each one of us in our social circle to begin to not, not make this a secret, this should not be a secret. This should be something that we're talking about educating people about, talking to our friends and our families about, and getting other people to talk about. The, the idea is to get this on the table, get it into the, like the cultural consciousness so we can take a look at it and make some decisions about it. It's been in the shadows because people who use drugs are stigmatized against. It's time to get it out into the open, get it out of the closet, start talking about it, and, and move forward with it. And we can all do something about that. Every day, people we meet, conversations we get on, um, that's uh, something that I just think is, is crucial, crucial. Thank you. Um, and, you know, talking about the secret that you just talked about also, you know, I manage a grant from UVM um, just to support women with substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And as you all know, um, that we have this big problem about the lack of prenatal care for you we, women, you know, Grace, I'm pretty sure you know all of it. And also we do not even have, we're struggling to access even the data. Basically, we know it's out there and everybody's struggling to um, access the real data in order for us to be meaningfully, you know, bringing solution to this issue. It's a big, that's a big issue. One of the city councils just asked a question about, you know, um, where is it going to be, basically? Right, And I think it would be very important to start to think about now, like all the wraparound services that can come with it. 
not only building it for people to come and use, but also to do yoga, to access prenatal care, you know, mindfulness, those type of things. So in order for, you know, kids can see you've got in, but we all feel that this is just a, a safe place where you can come in, relax, and you, you have so much done. I think it's also very important to think about the hours of operation. Right? This should not be something you, you use Monday to Friday from eight to five. This is 24 seven, you know? And the funding part, I think is the next step from my perspective. Let's uh, get this done and let's do it also in a way that we even innovate, uh, you know, basically compared to what already exists around the world. But thank you all for your work, really appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I'll go to Councillor Paul for a motion on just uh, on accepting the communication. Uh, thanks, President Tracy. I would make a motion that we accept these communications and place them on file as we continue to move forward in this journey. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of accepting communications and placing them on file, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thanks again to uh, Marielle, Scott, Jillian, Ed, and Grace for joining us this evening. Really appreciated your presentation and all the great information you provided. It's been, uh, re it's just a joy to work with all of you at Comstat and look forward to continued collaboration on this issue as well. Hope you all Thank have you. a great night. Thank you, you too. All right. That Having completed the presentation, we'll now move on to another item that is somewhat related, um, item 5.02, um, which is a communication regarding national opioid settlement. Councillor Paul, may I please have a motion on this? Uh, I'm happy to, you want me to, you want the recommended, I thought oh, sorry. you were actually. Sorry, I apologize. I yeah. Sorry, I apologize. I got I, the council wrong. Councilor Mason, Thank you. go ahead. Um, Sorry about that. I would make a motion to approve uh, the city of Burlington joining and participating in the two proposed national opioid settlement agreements as negotiated by the Vermont Office of the Attorney General. First with Johnson & Johnson and Jensen for a portion of the $12 billion settlement to be paid nationally over a period of 10 years. And second with McKeeson Cardinal and Amerisource Bergen for a portion of the $21 billion settlement to be paid nationally <coughs> over a period of 18 years. Further resolving to approve and authorize the mayor and city attorney to draft and execute any documents necessary to report and effectuate the city's agreement to join and participate in the two settle agreement, settlement agreements and to file and report such documents, including but not limited to exhibit K, to the parties and to the forums necessary to perfect the city's interests in the settlements on or prior to the January 2nd, 22 deadline. And after a second, I would turn it over to the city attorney if there are any updates from our last conversation last week. Certainly, thank you for that. Councilor Mason, is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Carpenter. Uh, city Attorney Richardson. Uh, yes, the only... Um update is that we have had communications with the Attorney General's office. Um, obviously, they welcome the city joining the uh, settlements in part as I reviewed last time. This does trigger um, a high likelihood that the state of Vermont will receive uh, the bonuses that are built into the settlement agreement. Uh, so the state will receive the full amount of funding or come closer to receiving the full amount of funding as a result of the council's actions tonight. Um, and the Attorney General supports the uh, idea that Burlington has an important role to play within the abatement fund that will be set up as a result of this settlement agreement. Uh, and I think those are the only two additional factors. Otherwise, the uh, description that I gave to the council last week, um, as well as the briefing, uh, continues to hold, and I would be available if the council has any further questions. Thank you, Attorney Richardson. Any questions from councilors? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Brings us into our next item, um, which is an ordinance um, on short-term rentals. Councilor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. Before I make a motion, can I ask a point of information and a 
I don't know if it's to the city attorney or the planning staff. The recommended action on board docks is not consistent with the recommended action in the memo. So I'm not entirely clear. The, the board docks action is waive the second reading set for public hearing. The memo, on the other hand, says the council's requested to provide guidance to staff on which of the two options <clears throat> it wishes to pursue and then vote to schedule the second hearing, public hearing, and adoption for a meeting in January. So I'm not sure in light of those two what my motion would be. Um, and to that end, um, uh, City Planner Tuttle and uh, Director of Litigation um, Servant will be happy to answer those questions. Uh, okay, so the memo on board docs um, points to the fact that there are actually two different versions of one of the documents for um, this discussion tonight and asks for the council to provide direction on which of those versions it would like to further discuss. Um, the next actions for these are to um, either make further amendments or consider moving them forward for adoption. Each of them have a slightly different path forward for that adoption, but um, ultimately what we're looking for is some vote of direction on which version of these documents you would like to further, and then for you to take action to actually schedule it for a further discussion and potential adoption at a future meeting. So if I'm hearing that correct, all that literally is happening is we are opening the discussion on the agenda item. There is no action that we are seeking until there is direction provided to the planning staff, unless Kim is telling me something differently. Director of Litigation Certificate? Um, no, that's right. I mean, at this point, we're asking for direction and then should make an appropriate uh, motion at that point. Okay. So I'm going to scramble. I appreciate there are two. Um, I favor the third option, which is not up on board docs, which is going back to the Montreal Compromise, which was put forth by the Joint Commission, and I'll give my reasoning and start the conversation off. Before I do so, though, um, as Chair of the Ordinance Committee, I thought for the benefit of the Council as well as the public, I would sort of take us back a little bit as to how we got here, um, and I will be brief. but. Um, Back in the summer of 2019, the mayor convened a housing summit. Um, hundreds of our constituents, elected officials, and others convened in this room. Uh, this was pre-COVID. Provided wonderful thoughts and comments, and out of that, um, the council then sort of moved forward with an ordinate, a resolution that was passed in October of 19 that provided, in essence, direction forward on a number of policy initiatives, one relating to energy efficiency, one about creation of accessory dwelling units, um, one relating to um, city's approach to the minimum housing on transportation corridors, one about increasing the level of dedicated funding to the housing trust fund, and then this last one relating to regulation of short-term rentals. Um, I want to read, just for the benefit of the council, the, the direction that was provided in October of 19, because I think it colors my view on uh, the proposals. What we passed in October 19 was direction to the Joint Committee to create a regulatory framework for short-term rentals, um, protecting the city's housing supply by limiting the number of housing units that be converted, <coughs> excuse me, for short-term rental purposes, and ensuring that those conversions are contributing to the city's efforts to preserve and expand permanently affordable housing, while also preserving some flexibility and ability to earn greater income for Burlington homeowners, and recognizing that some supply of short-term rentals benefits the Burlington economy. So that was the direction that was provided to the Joint Committee, which has met really over the course of the last five years, not exclusively on short-term rentals, but this is really the last piece. Um, the Joint Committee, I think, weighed those competing goals as put forth um, in the resolution and advanced a proposal that permitted some degree of offsite hosting for short-term rentals within multi-unit buildings and for one and two-unit buildings if the host had owned the property for three or more years. Um, that was not necessarily, and, and to, for the public to understand, the Joint Committee consisted of both the Planning Commission as well as the Ordinance Committee. However, the Ordinance Committee didn't get the vote. So, 
I don't want to imply there was, you know, that there was clearly concern within the members of the Ordinance Committee who changed, I'll be honest. We had an election cycle and the Ordinance Committee did change during the course of those discussions. So I think it's fair to characterize the feeling of that the majority of the Ordinance Committee also changed um, based on the election. But what became apparent throughout the discussion was really the policy level lever of owner occupancy was one of two ways to really get at how do we limit the number of short-term rentals in the city of Burlington. To the planning office's credit, you know, we spent an inordinate amount of time asking them to investigate other alternatives, whether that's a cap, you know, look at other jurisdictions, and unfortunately, you know, there was not another solution that came back um, that seemed to be better, or at least had more support. So the compromise proposal that was put forth, I think, and I can't say it better than a number of the public commenters um, who have been, you know, not just those who are here tonight, but, you know, dozens of our resident, our constituents and hosts who have been participants throughout this entire arduous process. Um, and I think, you know, while it was a compromise, I, I think it was, I won't say universally accepted, but certainly by those in, you know, who are actively participating, it was accepted. That then, you know, after first read at this council got referred to the Ordinance Committee, um, it was pretty clear or, or clear quickly at the Ordinance Committee that the compromise was not something that a majority of the Ordinance Committee was prepared to, uh, to move forward. What through, I'm guessing, three hearings at the Ordinance Committee, what came forward was then a slightly modified proposal relating to the host, you know, being there, whether that's the tenant or the owner. Um, that was presented to this council, I don't even remember when, three meetings ago or, you know, before, uh, followed by the work session. At the work session, what the planning office did here was in essence, I think even a lack of support for that option. So what what has come forth before us, and I'm gonna have to let Megan and Scott explain the details because even the details of these proposals are somewhat lost on me, um, is, is a further modification, and I would say even a, a more restrictive uh, and tightening um, going either toward requiring, you know, owner occupancy or something pretty close to it, um, is my interpretation. I understand, and, and we've heard, I mean, the other concern I've heard from a number of people who point to Portland, Maine, sort of as the example of something similar on, you know, that currently requires owner occupancy. Um, it, it has had the unintended a consequence of limiting the number of non-hotel options for those visiting. Um, I'm not close enough to the data to know, you know, what the impact has been. Um, I am cognizant, we heard from a lot, including those tonight, in terms of the unintended consequences, and I appreciate we do not have specific data, but a number of hosts that are using either, you know, the income from the short-term rental um, to, in essence, subsidize other longer-term tenancies within their building or in other buildings, as well as a number of Burlington residents who use that income in order to pay their own property taxes either in, you know, in another home that they might own in Burlington. I was comfortable moving forward with a compromise because of the brilliant way that the planning office with legal counsel have structured this. It's not all in our CDO such that, you know, we're grandfathering everyone in the minute we make the change. The way this has been proposed is that, you know, the most, a lot of the changes are in our minimum housing, which in essence means if we guessed wrong, we can fix it, we can change it. And I was comfortable with that understanding going down the path of uh, trying the compromise and seeing how it worked out. If I'm wrong and the council was wrong, it can be changed next election cycle, um, next annual registration. My concern is if I'm wrong and this compromise doesn't go forward, I think we've heard, you know, there it will have the impact of, you know, a lot of sales going on, and I think everyone thinks, presto, that means we'll have more housing, rents are all gonna go down. I don't personally believe that's the case. So for that reason, as much as I appreciate the work that has gone into both of the two compromises that are up on board docs, 
I don't support them, and I would support going back to what came out of the Joint Planning Commission, leaving aside the seasonal, you know, the, the other minor adjustments that have been made after that came forward. So with that introduction, the floor is open, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. We don't have a motion on the floor yet, so we're still just hearing the, the council's um, the council's direction, correct, City Attorney Richardson? That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Councilor Shannon. Are, are we discussing five, sorry, hang on a second. Are we discussing 5.03 and 5.04 simultaneously? Just 5.03. The, am I confused? Because I thought a lot of what Councillor Mason was speaking to was 5.04. If I may, I, I, I lump them together, Councillor Tracy. I mean, I, from my perspective, the direction is the same. I don't think you can bifurcate one from the other, whether it's the changes to the minimum housing. I, I appreciate they are separate agenda items, but from my perspective, the, the direction right, is the I, same. I understand that. That's why I, yeah. I allowed it, but to Thank get you. the full context, but yeah. All right. We're in terms of like a motion, Councillor Shannon. We we don't have a motion on the table regarding item five point zero three. Was my point. Okay. Uh, then I'll just ask a question. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so with regards to the zoning changes in five point zero three, we have a couple different options. We're looking at going with in terms of the chapter eighteen changes. But is it your opinion that either way we go with Chapter 18, these are the changes that are needed with the zoning? Okay. Yes, yes. There's um, just one version of all of the changes under 5.03 related to the zoning amendments, and they stand regardless of 5.04. Okay, that was my understanding. I just wanted that verification. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Councilor Hightower. Um, yes, in terms of direction, I unfortunately do not agree with Councillor Mason. I appreciate the summary. Um, I, I know that there was also a memo that was passed to us, which I think kind of differentiates what the different versions are, but I'm supportive <clears throat> of the Council's Ordinance Committee version um, as amended um for this meeting by the administration and the planning team um i think that it strikes a balance i think that we've been kind of continuing to search for throughout the last at least as long as i've been on council so well over a year and a half um in terms of like mostly limiting things to on-site owner-occupied scenarios um, which I think is imp important both in terms of limiting the scenarios and then I think for the policy re reason of allowing folks to, whatever that looks like, age in place, stay in place, um, while limiting it on investment properties, I think is really what it comes down to, limiting short-term rentals on investment properties. Um, I'm not supportive of what went out of the the joint committee, which again, to, per Councillor Mason's point, um, the ordinance committee did not have a vote in what came out of the joint committee, and I was never supportive, won't be supportive of what was proposed last minute as a compromise before that came out of it, which was the three-year rule. Um, and so I think it's both, as the administration has noted, very difficult for us to enforce and keep track of, but also I think isn't a particularly equitable way of um, allowing additional uses for properties. So um, I am not in favor of Councillor Shannon's proposal, although I think that both Councillor Shannon's proposal and the current um, ordinance version would be an improvement over our status quo. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. I don't have anyone else in the queue. Need a motion. I believe we do need a motion, Councillor Councillor Shannon. Councillor Carpenter, are you trying to get uh, in the just queue? A, a clarification, I guess. In in um, so 5.03, is that what we're looking for a motion on? Correct, Councillor. And as I understand. 
understand that from Director Tuttle, um, that would be necessary or would stand anyway, no matter what version we might recommend in 5.04. So if we vote on 5.03, that really doesn't impact the discussion around 5.04. It does not, however, as has been noted by Councillor Mason and also planning staff, the, they've also let us know that it, it really is, it, it, it is important for us to move these two items concurrently at the same time. So you, we could choose to not take action on 5.03. However, I think what the, the recommendation that I've heard is that it is important for us to keep them together. So if there is any, uh, if, it, 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 it's just not um, advisable to take action on one and not the other this evening. So, that, does, could, that, does that answer your question, Councillor? Could we weigh in with a point of clarification about what the action is for 5.03? Sure. So the uh, original recommended action was actually not to adopt 5.03. It was to just take action to warn it for a future public hearing and to consider adopting it at a future public meeting. Um, with zoning amendments, that's a statutory process that you have to put an amendment through before you can take action on it. Um, so I think if you wanted to, understanding that 5.03 is unlikely to change regardless of your decision on 5.04. You could take the action to indicate that you want it to be warned for a public hearing. We can hold that then until after you've made a decision and adopted the chapter 18 pieces to actually put that into action. Um, but you would basically be authorizing us to do that after that point in time. So this could be cleared off your agenda for tonight's purposes, and you could move on to the substantive discussion of 5.04. Okay, thank Sorry, you very it's much. really confusing because these are two different parts of the ordinances, so two different rules apply, um, but that's what this action is about. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Councilor Carpenter, are you clear? I, I guess, so if I vote in favor of this, I'm voting in favor of um, having you warn it and um, we, we vote on it in substance another time. So to be right. clear, right. and to be clear, we don't have a motion yet. Okay, I just. Uh, so I have Councilor Hanson to be followed by Councilor Mason. And Councilor Shannon, were you trying to get in? I'm probably trying to do the same thing Councilor Mason, so I'll be first. Okay, <laughs> Councilor Hanson, I'll come to you first because I see your hand is raised, and then I'll come to you, Councilor Mason. Um, well, it sounds like based on what Director Tuttle just said, um, we should just make the motion. So I'll, I'll move to waive the second reading and set for public hearing. Thank you. Mo moved by Councilor Hansen, seconded by Councilor Shannon. Is there further discussion just on this item? Point of information. I'm not sure that's. It, just if we could clarify the the warning for the public hearing would come after the um, chapter 18 uh, changes are effective. Councilor Hansen, is that in your motion? Yeah, please. Thank you. Okay, all set. Is there a second? I think Councilor Shannon. Councilor Shannon, okay. Thank you for that. Is there further discussion of this item? This is just 5.03 and it's just on the motion to waive the second reading and warn it for a public hearing. Okay, seeing no one else, let's go to a vote on this. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. So now we move to item 5.04, um, which has another ordinance related to short-term rentals um, and specific changes to chapter 18 of the housing code. Um, Councilor Mason? What I said before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, this one, I'm not sure there is a motion other than to open the floor for discussion. I think the planning and zoning office is looking for direction in terms of at least the two um, proposed or competing proposals that are on. I, as I articulated before, I would be, uh, my, my advocacy is for the option that's not on board docs, but one that was put forth by the joint commission committee. Okay, thank you. Floor is open. <clears throat> Councilor Shannon to be followed by Councilor Hanson. Um, it was my understanding that 
your desire, President Tracy, was for something to be moved. And then I was going to um, move to amend it, but I can move, my amendment is a strike all amendment. If there's nothing to strike, then it's just moving the ordinance. And I don't know, would you like me to make a motion to move the ordinance as I think it should be moved or does somebody else want to move the move an ordinance, move something else? Uh. Yeah, the floor is yours, Councilor Shannon. If you wanted to make a motion, you're able to make a motion. Okay, that was your opportunity to stop me from making that uh, motion, but. I mean, the floor is open, the motion has not been made. It's my understanding that, you know, a councilor could make a motion at this at this point. So we have not, a motion has not been offered on this. Um, I move to waive the second reading and notice the ordinance that reads, well, actually, maybe we so, should defer. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure what I'm doing is legal. So one second, Councilor Shan. So we do have, uh, Councilor Barlow is on and has joined us. I'm just going to promote Councilor Barlow, sorry. Okay, so, so let me just check. Could I ask? If um, we had we had a first reading, so that's the other confusing thing. There's already been something that had a first reading, so I think I have to amend what was read at the first reading. Is that correct? City Attorney Richardson. Uh, yes, that's my understanding because the first draft has been read, it's been entered, so if you wish to amend it or change it, it would have to take into account what has already been put forward in the first reading. Okay. Um, so with that, I will move to amend the ordinance that had the first reading with um, the version that is on board docs as ordinance alternate read, Councillor Shannon short-term rentals, and ask for the floor back after a second. Councillor Shannon has moved the ordinance. Is there a second? Is there a second? Yeah, second. Seconded by Councillor Hansen. Councillor Shannon, you have the floor. Thank you. This version um, really brings what's been termed short-term rentals back to what it started out being, which is renting out a room in your home, if you have an extra room, or renting out your home if you're away. Um, it was pointed out to me by an affordable housing provider today that short-term rental is a misnomer. What we're talking about here is lodging. Short-term rentals would be weekly or monthly rentals. But we're what we're talking about, for the most part, is weekend rentals, mostly less than seven days. Every person at this table has acknowledged we are in the most severe housing crisis we have ever seen. We need housing units. Every single one. The debate before us is primarily whether we allow people who are owner occupying a unit to convert to a convert a second unit into a lodging unit rather than a housing unit. What purpose or value of this council would allowing these conversions serve? One argument I've heard is that it serves home ownership affordability. So let's look beyond individual situations and consider the market impact of this policy. As a policy, does this make housing, either owner-occupied or rental housing, more affordable? No, it doesn't. This policy will increase the cost of, cost of housing two ways. One, it reduces the number of available rental units. Decreasing the supply of rental units can only drive rental prices up. In addition to being more expensive, every unit that converts is a unit denied to someone seeking housing. Secondly, if you are looking to buy a duplex to occupy one side and rent the other, the bank will consider the income you get from a lease 
in determining if you are qualified to buy the property. They will not consider the income from Airbnb or an STR unless you have a tax return to show them the income history for a period. If that is your plan, your finances will need to support buying the property without that income. And many people are able to buy these properties because they have enough wealth, according to the lender, to afford it without showing additional income. If they can't afford to buy the house without that income, the bank will not make the loan on the property for the purpose of using it as an Airbnb. However, the owner will make more income from Airbnb lodging than they will by providing a housing unit. This makes running such Airbnbs highly appealing for those that can afford to do it without the lender's help. A lot of people are in this category and outbidding those that require more help from a lender. The ability to make more money on these properties will continue to drive up their value and put increasing pressure on others to do the same. The people who will win the bids on these properties are the ones that don't need the income from Airbnb in order to qualify for the loan. Another value we have is property rights. Owning property in Burlington is a privilege and we have always taken the position that the city has the right to regulate the property based on our community needs and values. Our housing shortage has been put up by everyone as one of the, our priority issues. Why would we be sacrificing any needed housing units? It doesn't serve our values, but it's a compromise with hosts, it's a compromise with hosts that doesn't affect that many units. We can't afford to lose any units, but this is potentially hundreds of units. It's a very popular trend. You cannot look at this policy as something that only affects the units being operated today. We have received many letters from people who tell us they don't currently operate in Airbnb, but they want to keep the option op open in the future, as it is a very lucrative option. Landlords have to deal with the full spectrum of the struggles as a landlord. I can tell you some of the issues I have had to deal with that could be avoided by, by turning the units into Airbnbs. Divorce, new partners, people moving in who were not on the lease, drug dealing, drug use, losing a job, inability to pay rent, terminal illness, and even death. Airbnb is a very attractive alternative. Whether or not it achieves our goals and values, it has gone through two years of process and we can't undo it. We are warning this tonight for public hearing. There is still more process yet to come. The council has been asked for input many times over the last three years. And each time I have consistently voiced the same concern about allowing these conversions as have many others around the table. The fact that the committee decided to make concessions with Airbnb hosts does not justify those concessions to me. The only people who have contacted us in favor of allowing Airbnb conversions who are not Airbnb operators are those who want to convert in the future. Neighbors do not consider Airbnbs good for the neighborhoods for a variety of reasons. Neighbors did not dominate the conversation though. Housing providers and advocates are not coming to us telling us we need to allow lodging units, lodging unit conversion in order to keep housing affordable. They came and spoke in the beginning of the process and weighed in. And that input seems forgotten over the many subsequent meetings. Were they asked to weigh in on this final product? Were they asked if this would provide more or less affordable housing? I asked. The answer I got was that they don't want us to allow housing to convert. Maintaining housing is the low hanging fruit. What is much harder is building housing. We cannot afford to lose dozens or hundreds of housing units. We've all lived here for a period of time and I bet every one of us has seen a housing project be opposed by the neighbors. And it takes typically about five years to build a housing project and get through the process. 
We don't really like development in this city, and it's something our constituents and social media reminds us of on a regular basis. Development is painful. It may be needed, and we need those housing units, but we hardly ever like anything that anybody builds. We complain about every tree that goes down. Preserving the existing units is the easiest thing we can do as a council in order to, to maintain housing, not just affordable housing, housing at all. Some of the things we heard tonight, I'm not taking housing off the market. It's an ADU that I built. It was never on the market. This council allowed all kinds of waivers to build more ADUs because we need more housing. We did not change those policies to allow for lodging. We did it to create housing. Airbnb is great because I've invested all this money and it's much nicer than it would be if it were a rental. That is probably true in most cases. We should hold the bar higher for minimum housing. However, this is the worst kind of gentrification. This is gentrification not for the benefit of a new neighbor, but for the benefit of providing tourist lodging, which is, this, which is at a scale increases and destroys neighborhoods. Limiting to owner occupants will probably prevent the destruction of neighborhoods, but it certainly doesn't meet our housing goals. Rents aren't going down with or without this policy, but maybe they won't go up so much and however many units we disallow as lodging is that many units where people can live. I'm glad it's in chapter 18, which gives us some flexibility. When we have a 5% rental vacancy, we should consider allowing conversions and more flexibility for homeowners and property owners. Now we have less than 1% vacancy and every unit counts. Whether we're talking about a dozen units or several dozen units or hundreds of units, we can't afford to lose those units. So I would ask this council to take Airbnb back to what it was intended to be, which is renting the extra space in your house, making good use of it, subsidizing your income that way, renting it when you are not there, and not allowing the conversion of units that we need for housing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. I have Councillor Hanson to be followed by Councillor Mason. Great, thank you. Um, I support this version as well that Councillor Shannon has put forward. I think we have to look at the big picture and what our goals and priorities are. Um, it's often easily forgotten in a lot of these spaces, but 60% of Burlington is, is renters. This allowing Airbnbs is gonna have a clear negative impact on renters by taking away more units in an already extremely tight market. And that's true even under Councillor Shannon's proposal um, where there are potential bedrooms that, that could be rented out long-term that are going to going to Airbnb, but at least we're limiting it away from investment properties and, and reducing the overall amount and also targeting and balancing who's profiting off of this externality. Because I think we all agree that it is a negative externality. It is something that, you know, individuals who have Airbnbs are making great money. There's no doubt about that. You know, our goal isn't to punish them or prevent them from making that money, but our goal as city government is to control when someone's ability to make profit is coming at the expense of the majority of people. And I think those profits and those private benefits that are going to Airbnb hosts should go to the homeowners who are struggling to live in Burlington and who need to rent out a bedroom in their home just to make it work here. It shouldn't go to the very small minority of people in Burlington. Many of them don't even live in Burlington, but the small minority of individuals who can afford property in the city of Burlington that they, that they don't even live in. That is a very small group of people. And it's a group of people that has vastly more economic 
mobility and access by the fact that they own this this incredibly valuable asset you know a property in burlington is really valuable even if you use it as a long-term rental that's in this market you know being a burlington landlord is you're going to make money because it's such a tight market i understand that they'll make more money off of airbnb potentially but again we have to balance the impact of of that private profit and i think if we're going to balance it the way to do it is to restrict it from those with the most means and limit it to people again who are just homeowners um you know they're they're not necessarily they're not landlords but they're homeowners you know renting a room out in, in their own building just just to make it work here so the other thing is, you know, looking at that big picture, looking at the negative impact on renters, it's really important that we start more restrictive with this policy. If it's not as bad as we think and we don't lose as many units as we think, you know, we can look at expanding it further, but it's it's much more difficult to start more expansive and then try to tighten the policy later on. Um, I'd rather start safe and, and try to protect us from losing even more rental units than we need to um, in the situation that we're in. And if it's not as much of a problem as we think, we can we can expand from there. So I really ho hope that we prioritize renters and, and homeowners, um, you know, ability to, to live and work and stay in Burlington, which is really on the precipice right now. And I really hope we prioritize that over extra profits for, for those that own investment property in Burlington. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. I respectfully see this from a different perspective than my colleagues. You're both approaching this as if it doesn't exist, and it does. We're not, Airbnbs have been around, or short-term rentals have been around unfettered with no regulation for years. So this notion that somehow, I mean, I'm not sure I would disagree if we were starting from scratch, but the reality is they exist. And for two years, we heard from Burlington residents about whether it's the flexibility or, or ways that Airbnb were benefiting them and were allowing them to stay here. And we were not able to grandfather them and the compromise was in essence a concession. And in terms of, I completely disagree that we're starting as tight as you can and then loosening. Right now, no regulation exists. So I don't see how a compromise is gonna open the spigot. The spigot's open. It's 256 units and that's not at one given time. We've heard time and time again, that's measured over a course of time. So this is potentially the worst. It only you know goes down from here. So I appreciate we have a difference of opinion of that, but my view is formed by having listened to you know people who have come and testified. And what I believe is, in essence, uh, the the three year restriction clamps down on rank speculation. Um, I want to, in addition to the comments, I I would like to ask. I almost think we have to go into executive session. We received, in essence, a litigation pre litigation letter from someone on behalf of the short term rental. And in my opinion, before voting on this proposal, I would like to hear from the city attorney in, in terms of whether, in, in his or their opinion, there is some risk for the city if we were to adopt uh, the Shannon resolution. So I don't have, and I, I don't really want to go into executive session, but I don't know how we hear from the city attorney that, yeah, this is legit, or no, it's not legit without going into executive session. Is there? Am I correct that there is, we cannot hear that unfettered advice without going into executive session? That, that's correct. I, I would recommend if you want any sort of uh, legal gloss on some of the fundamentals uh, under section 1 VSA, 1 VSA section 313, that's the classic type of uh, attorney counsel that was intended uh, to be given to the council as far as legal uh, descriptions as to rights and, and potential liabilities of any type of legislation. So forgetting, and you might have to help me a little bit, I recall it's a two-step process. The first is a finding, you know, based on, <clears throat> I guess, a pre-litigation letter that we received based on action that we're contemplating taking 
that we'd like the advice of the city attorney's office, or I would like the advice of the city attorney's office. I'm not sure the magic language on the finding, but. It, it, it would be along the lines of that premature public knowledge would cause prejudice to one or more parties. In this case, I would suggest that any um, response that I would be giving either directly to that letter or uh, based off of the uh, issues stated in that letter would be prejudicial to the city if it was uh, given in public session. Can I make the motion based on what City Attorney Richardson said? Because sure. yes. I didn't write it down. We have a motion from Councilor Mason to, on a finding. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Shannon. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to, into a, we'll go to a vote on the finding. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Now, based on that finding, Councilor Mason? I would make a motion to go into executive session. I'm not sure who the participants should be other than the city attorney's office. Is there anyone else that should? Sure, I would recommend both the uh, uh, both myself and Attorney Sturvin and uh, the Mayor and the Chief of Staff, as well as the um, uh, Director of Planning and Zoning. The Manager of the Zoning Division. Correct. So moved. Okay, we have a motion to go into executive session. Is there a second? All right, let's go! Ended by Councillor Shannon. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. So uh, I did not anticipate executive session because I had not heard a desire to go into executive session this evening. So um, councilors, just bear with me, especially those of you who are from, who are um, participating remotely. Um, what I think the best course of action, so we don't have to clear the room, um, would be would be for us to go downstairs, and then we can get the counselors um, who are participating remotely on a different Zoom. Um, so we'll keep this Zoom going, um, and then we'll send the five counselors who are participating remotely um, a different Zoom link for the executive session. Um, so keep an eye on your inboxes for that. We have counselors Hanson, Hightower, Barlow, and Jang, and Freeman all participating remotely. So. Um, if we could just please send those five uh, a link to part a separate link. Um, if folks here um, could hold tight, um, we will um, we'll come back up um, and continue with um, this item and the rest of our agenda this evening.
you're still participating, if you could just please promote me to panelists. Oh, perfect, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have a couple of counselors on. Once, once we get everybody else, um, all the counselors participating remotely, only one more. Just waiting on one counselor. Now we have all the all the counselors participating remotely and everybody um, who is here um, in the room. Um, so I'll reconvene the council at 10.33, having come out of the executive session. By uh, being 10.33, we do need a motion uh, on the, uh, to suspend the rules. Councilor Stromberg? Uh, I would move to suspend the rules uh, to go through the rest of the, the deliberative agenda. Thank you, Councilor Stromberg. Second. Seconded by Councilor Mason. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, let's go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously, and we will complete our deliberative agenda for this evening. So we are back um, in the debate, and we do not have um, where we left off. I don't have anyone in the queue. Councilor Carpenter. <laughs> First question is, where are we? Council Shannon made a motion to adopt the version she presented. Is that accurate? Yes. And that would be a for a warning. For a warning, not adopt. Okay. So, in terms of providing direction, if we vote for that amendment, we're saying that's the version we want for. Yes. Correct. You all set? Okay. Uh, just okay. A, Councilor Shannon, go ahead. Yeah, just to, uh, to be really clear, we're not adopting it, we're warning it. That's the motion. Thank you. So we will have another vote to adopt, which could be amended after the public hearing. We are warning it for a public hearing. It could be amended after the public hearing based on what we hear in public hearing. Yes. Just to be clear, that the, as for the process, um, so a zoning amendment requires a warned public hearing. Um, the amendment to the ordinance um, in the Code of Ordinances does not have that same requirement for the warned public hearing. So potentially you can have it, uh, just a public hearing at the next meeting without the statutory warning period, um, conceivably you could adopt tonight, I mean, because this doesn't have that same requirement. But that was, yeah. Great, thank you for the clarification, but the, the motion I made was for warning it not to adopt it tonight. Thank, thank you, Councilor Shannon. Is there further discussion of the, the resolution? Councilor Barlow. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry I was late to this discussion. I was following along <clears throat> on Zoom. 
and I appreciate all the um, the um, the table that um, Director Tuttle provided us to show the differences in in the various versions that have been presented. Um, I just want to um, give a perspective that I have that I heard. Councilor Hansen say that the people that might participate in this are some of the people, the greatest means in the city, but I know for someone even like me, when I was starting out, I couldn't afford a home. I did have, I did buy a duplex, and I know that I've heard from people who have duplexes who do short-term rentals in the non-owner-occupied unit, and they do that as a way to make ends meet and be able to afford the high housing in Burlington. So I, I know it's sort of circular, but I just want to point that out because I do think it's not necessarily a bunch of, you know, wealthy, privileged people that are participating in the short-term rental business right now. And so I, I struggle to prevent them from being able to use their non-occupied unit as they see fit to, um, to, to make their ability to afford housing in Burlington more easy, easier for them. Okay, thank you, Council Barlow. Council Shannon. Thanks, I just wanna respond to that. And and also, I, I also wanna say that, you know, there are lots of people doing short-term rentals that are providing a wonderful service and they are wonderful people. And, um, and I don't mean to in any way malign people. I, I think that they've made a very reasonable choice um, given that it's an option. But as a policy for the city, it, it, it can be a very good option for individuals. I really don't think it's a good option as a policy for the city. And for those who have an owner-occupied duplex that they have decided to short-term rent, when they're purchasing that duplex, they can't use they can't use the potential income from short-term rentals in order to finance it. They need to be able to qualify to buy that duplex as something that would be a long-term rental. They can then, um, based on that, they could buy it. They could then do it as a short short-term rental, but that wouldn't be considered as their. Um, it, it, it wouldn't be considered by the lender. So you have to be able to qualify without that, that income. So, so a lot of people are buying them because they don't actually need to show income in order to be able to buy them. So it's not really enabling that marginal buyer to be able to purchase the duplex. Once they purchase it and maybe they do long-term rental for a period of time, then they can um, convert it to a short-term rental and they will make more money on it, but they qualified to purchase that without that provision. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Councilor Carpenter. Um, I think we're a little bit confusing the rationale um, Council Shannon's right for a mortgage qualification, you could only count the amount of rent um, probably that would be relative to a permanent rental. And I'm just going to make up numbers here. Let's say the permanent rental gave you $1,000 a month extra and short term gave you $2,000. You can't count the two, you can only count the one. But it's cash in your life, it pays your health insurance, it pays for your child care. So the motivation, like Mark is talking about, isn't just qualifying to buy it, it's qualifying to um, give you uh, an affordable life. And in fact, banks qualify you way too high these days anyway. You, you know, you can get a mortgage at, you know, 40 plus percent of your income. So I just don't think that that's a reasonable argument. I did want to ask um, Director Tuttle just a clarifying question. We have about 250 short-term rentals, we think, in, in that range. Yeah, the number has moved over the time that we've been discussing this, but I think the most recent numbers that we received uh, from the company host compliance that's been helping us keep track of this was just around 250. Okay. And I've heard the figure that 70% of those are single, Family homes, is, is that 
Let me just double check. It's, do you remember this off the top of your head, Scott? It's in our memo, but let me just pull it up really yes. quickly. Um, um, so almost 70% of them are whole unit rentals. Uh, the other third are partial unit rentals. Um, that has increased to about 80% whole units in the most recent months. About 54% of them are in single family property types. Uh, the other 45% are in what they categorize as multifamily property types. And, and a further clarification, the version that came out of ordinance committee um, would not allow any um, offsite hosting. The version that came out of the ordinance committee allowed for offsite hosting in two very narrow circumstances. Uh, one was for somebody owning a seasonal home as is categorized by the assessor's office. Um, and the other circumstance was if someone was providing another unit on a property at a, a rental rate that meets the definition of affordability. Those were the allowances that came out of the ordinance committee version. So if you had a duplex, you, you couldn't meet that, right? Meet. If you had a, a non-owner occupied duplex in theory, you could meet, you potentially could meet that if you were short-term renting one of them and the other one was offered at an affordable rate. Okay, I don't have anyone else in the queue. Oh, I just. Oh, Councilor Mason, go ahead. Um, thank you, I, just to respond briefly to the fact the assertion that somehow the policy objective should be X, I, I, or you know, increasing the supply to bring us back to the October 2019, that was one of three policy objectives. And my concern is if this action is taken, you are going to see the number of short-term rentals drop precipitously as in what has happened in Portland, Maine. I tried to go there this fall not knowing that they had restricted, you know, more restrictive uh, short-term rental regulations. We did look for one that wasn't available. The only available options were a hotel, which was 600 bucks a night. So I hope I'm wrong, but I don't know that this is not gonna have the same unintended consequences if we fully ratchet down as much as this proposal does. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mason. Mayor Weinberger. <laughs> Thank you, President Tracy. Um, so this is uh, this has been a long um, and winding road to to get to tonight. Um, this conversation, in many ways, uh, began from my perspective in the 2019 housing summits, where um, we, after um, initial uh, public feedback, uh, identified <coughs> um, putting new restrictions on short-term rentals as one of five major strategies that we would pursue because we were concerned two years ago um, about the impact of um, that a growing short-term rental market was was having on our um, uh, on our on our rents on our on our uh, housing prices um, and um, the erosion in a city where it has been so historically so challenging to create new supply um, what. Uh, what this new technology and, and new um, market was doing. And um, I appreciate that um, a lot of work has gone into getting to tonight. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's high time for us to, to take action. This conversation has gone on a long time. Um, I uh, um, uh, understand how um, what has been proposed by Councilor Shannon is um, very concerning to some folks, and it is clear that some uh, people who have been um, attempting to serve this market, which is uh, which is a valid um, and as, as a couple of comments have noted, this is something that can make a city a, a positive place to visit. There are definitely positive impacts of having these short-term rentals. The problem is that our housing crisis has only intensified in the last two years. And I think it is very hard 
in a city that is seeing the extraordinarily low vacancies we have today, that is seeing the um, challenges with homelessness that we are seeing today, that continues despite uh, <clears throat> despite the efforts of this administration and others that continues to um, uh, struggle to uh, uh, produce a sufficient new supply of homes, it is, uh, it is very challenging to, um, I think, justify anything other than a very restrictive policy here. And, I, and that is a shame. I think this is another casualty of our decades of very problematic land use policy. It is another casualty of um, really this long road that has, has brought us to this place where we just simply don't have nearly enough homes and we are in this deep hole that is gonna take us a long time to dig out of. So I think the council should move forward tonight and warn uh, Councilor Shannon's language for further public hearing. I think it will focus the debate at that upcoming hearing. There may uh, well be um, arguments we haven't fully heard and flushed out that uh, could justify um, some further further loosening. I think it's an uphill uh, battle, I will say, um, with, with me um, and with others, I think, at a time when we are facing such an acute housing crisis. Uh, I hope we are not always in this in this situation. I don't think we always. I think this we are. This is something that we we and state policymakers can can control, and we can get to a place where uh, you could have a healthy uh, healthier mix, and where you could have more um, of of these options, and where you could have uh, smaller entrepreneurs benefiting from the desirability of of uh, Burlington to visit. Um, but that's not where we are now, and I think we, uh, in until we are there, um, we're going to have to hear. Uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be hard to justify getting there. But I, I continue to have an open mind after we have a hearing. But I appreciate Councillor Shannon's leadership, her remarkable statement earlier tonight, and her leadership uh, bringing forward um, uh, a policy that will, um, I think, have an impact on on the supply concerns that we are um, really currently faced with. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have anyone else in the queue. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Um, will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Barlow? Uh, yes. Councillor Carpenter? No. Councillor Jang? Yes. Councillor Freeman? Councillor Freeman, let me know that they've dropped off. Okay. Councillor Hansen? Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? No. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor McGee? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Strongberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. Nine ayes, two nays, one absent. The motion carries. Thank you very much for the for all your work and, and, and assistance with this, as well as um, just helping to advise us this evening. You know, it's been a very long process, so very much appreciated. So we'll be back in the new year to bring this for you for your official vote and adoption then. Great, or thank the, you. the hearing and the adoption. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we will move into our next agenda item, which is a resolution on hiring a chief of police for the Burlington Police Department. Councilor Hansen. Um, I will move to waive the reading um, and adopt the resolution and would ask for the floor back after a second. Okay, we uh, have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Go ahead, Councillor Hanson. Great, thank you. Um, so Burlington needs to continue towards a public safety system that focuses on providing people with resources and support, um, reducing harm, and repairing harm costs. We need to move away from 
punishment and incarceration, and we need to build towards a system that protects racial justice and not one that reinforces and exacerbates racial inequality. This is these goals and and this direction is is so much of what this council has been dealing with um, over the past few years and, and trying to get on that trajectory. In order to get there, I think it's critical that we have a leader of the Burlington Police Department who's really committed to that transition and that vision um, and is not resistant to it. We need one who is willing to do the hard but necessary work of changing the system from the inside and one who has experience leading public safety models that successfully provide safety through support and resource allocation as the priority. To get strong candidates that fit that description, we need to bring in a search firm that is going to do the type of targeted outreach and recruitment needed to identify those, those candidates. And that's really what this resolution lays out. That is an idea that uh, the administration has also you know, laid out a while back. And, and I agree is that we, we need to take that step if we're going to, to find these, these folks who fit that bill. And what the resolution also lays out is that if a search firm is facing obstacles in attracting specifically those types of individuals, they can come back to the council and let us know what we can do to ensure that these transformative leaders are applying. That may very well be salary. I know salary has been brought up um, a lot. That could be additional positions at the department. It could be um, that a transformative leader would want you know, greater community oversight in order to be effective um, in the role. I think there's a number of, of things that we may hear from these folks, but it really starts with getting the recruitment firm to have those conversations with those leaders. And if, if those folks are refusing to apply, um, the recruiter can really do that work to understand why and, and come back to us. I don't think we need to preempt that work by making larger changes at this time. Um, there's two main arguments that I've heard against this path forward. I think there's a lot of support for this path forward in, in many ways, but there's two main arguments I've heard against it. One is that we've already have strong applicants through the initial search process, and there's really not the need to keep looking. The other is that there's no point even trying to keep looking unless um, the salary is raised and, and the, this new position is added. Those arguments are, are obviously at odds with each other because if it were impossible to get good applicants under the current salary, we, we, wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have gotten them, um, especially not without the help of a search firm. So I, my feeling is that, you know, Whatever applicants we got with the current salary posted and, and without a search firm, I think we're going to get stronger applicants with with the help of, of a professional search firm. Um, and this this really sets us down that path. If the search firm is unable again to, to do that and get those, um, we've laid out in the resolution that they can come back and and let us know what they need. But I think we should give them a chance to get out there, talk to these folks, do that work, um, and really work with them. Um, the mayor obviously has the authority to appoint a chief of police, but the council does have the authority to approve or reject that appointment. And so I think it's really critical that, you know, we need to get to a place where we, the council and the mayor agree on a police chief, and that's gonna take a lot of work to do that. Um, so I'm proposing that we, move forward and hire a recruitment firm and start start doing that work. You know, it might not happen overnight. We're already well, well into this this search um, for, for a new police chief. We've, we've been out of one for quite a while. Um, it might take some more time to get there. There's no pathway to get there overnight, but I think this is something that sets us on a pathway where we actually have a chance at, at achieving that. Um, so that's the idea, and I hope that others will support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hanson. Councilor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, if I may indulge my question is more to the mayor, because we have a memo from November 12th that requested five action steps that needed to be made in order to move forward with one option. Option two was if not all five were not met, this resolution addresses one. So I'm 
while I'm happy to get into a discussion about the resolution, I'm not sure it's worth the time if the administration's position is this is insufficient. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, yeah, this, uh, this resolution is ex extremely disappointing, um, it, especially if, uh, if, if it is intended to um, produce the uh, goals that its uh, sponsor suggests, which is to um, uh, um, successfully reopen the search and secure um, uh, a broad um, applicant pool. Um, the, we are well into this search. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is problematic that um, we are so many months um, in, into this search. Uh, extended search periods are um, always uh, challenging for a, the department um, that is under in an extended period without uh, a permanent leader. Um, and in this case, um, this an extended search prolongs uh, the time uh, uh, B for a, um, the, the department can um, uh, move forward um, with the council, with the public, with the police commission, with a permanent leader uh, to address the many um, uh, public safety concerns that are um, very much on the minds of uh, of our constituents and to address the reforms and the changes that um, uh, we're also committed to. Um, so that's why, you know, I did write that letter uh, a month ago, which came um, after an earlier attempt all the way back in September to uh, strengthen this search was uh, rejected in this council. At the end of September, I wrote to this council, I said, we are having trouble with the search. We are not getting anywhere near the applicants that we got when we did this uh, five years ago. Um, we uh, have um, a fraction of the number of, of applicants that we um, I want to interview that we had years ago. This is a concern. If the council wants this search to be a success, the search committee is unanimous uh, in its feeling that the, the that we um, have a problem here and we need to take action. We need to raise the salary and bring on a search firm. Um, we need the council to move quickly uh, to address this. Um, that was at the end of September. That uh, that first effort was totally uh, rebuffed by by counselors. So then um, uh, when, as predicted, the effort just to keep searching um, didn't succeed, we um, uh, suspended the search and I wrote that, that memo and um, invited and, and, and laid out what um, it uh, is going to be necessary from my perspective, at least my idea is what are going to be necessary for a successful search. Uh, there was basically no response to that uh, that memo for the better part of a month. A week ago, um, we got a request to extend this for another week, um, and what has now come forward is this uh, this resolution, which is essentially non-responsive, which um, uh, sets up uh, a process um, where, at best, we are wasting months more before even the minimal action of clearly taking this step to be, offer a competitive salary to the market might be addressed. Um, and none of the other concerns um, that uh, I laid out and that the council could have uh, taken action um, are addressed here. So um, yeah, this is, from my perspective, disrespectful uh, to um, the, uh, men and women of the Burlington Police Department who we should be supporting now, not continue to waste their time. But most importantly, it is very problematic and disrespectful to the people of Burlington who have uh, serious concerns about public safety and are ba basically just being played games with here. So um, yeah, uh, this is non-responsive. Um, uh, I will be moving forward um, uh, as, uh, <coughs> as, laid out in my memo, regardless of what 
uh, what, what council action happens here, I would certainly welcome uh, councilors striking this down and showing their uh, disapproval for um, this um, really disappointing and uh, problematic um, attempt at setting leadership for, for our, our police department. Councilor Mason, you have the floor. Um, thank you for those comments. Uh, Mayor Weinberger, uh, in light of that statement, I, I don't see the, few, you know, seems futile to move forward on this in light of the administration's position. Um, I will not be supporting this, this resolution. I do, however, want to acknowledge and appreciate attempts that were made by certain members of this council to try and some come to some acceptable compromise, and I'm disappointed we fell short. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mason. Councilor Stromberg. Thanks. Um, a lot of thoughts on this. I guess I'm a little confused because we kind of bring forward this resolution, but if there was agreement with what was just said, I'm kind of, why hasn't there been another resolution brought forward that kind of collaborated all of those things? Um, or not, but just, I feel like that the five steps could have been tailored a little bit better and could have actually been made into a resolution. So I'm just curious as to why that doesn't exist. Um, but I think we do need to pan out, like actually just really rethink why we're here and having this discussion. Obviously, disagreements in public safety are, are, are the theme for us, which is fine because we're having these conversations. It's a good thing. As much as it hurts and it's heavy and it's emotional and we're hearing a lot of feedback, it is a good thing. Um, but, um, you know, law enforcement and our systems that support law enforcement in our country have historically just been horrific to individuals that we care about <laughs> and people in our community um, and historically marginalized populations throughout time. Obviously, right? We've had this conversation. Um, and I just want us to really focus on the fact that Issues in policing, just like they don't go away over time. So while tonight's a cold, dark, quiet night, entering in the winter, tomorrow's the first day, um, and it's not in the heat of the Battery Park protests, those feelings and so, like all of those voices are still here with us. And people have been impacted so greatly and so deeply for, for their lives. Um, I spoke up and told very personal stories, and that matters, and that matters right here tonight. And while we're obviously going to disagree on this, and I understand that, I understand why, um, it's, it, this is a good discussion to have. And I am very proud of this resolution because we're trying. And <laughs> I've been asked multiple times about the defunding of the police and how that went last summer and all of that, not to rehash that resolution or anything like that tonight. Um, but what I say to that, to just the general sentiment about that is that, yeah, we didn't do it perfectly. So, and um, So just stay, can you stay focused to the I, chief? I can, yes, sorry. Um, so I just want to, I do want to admit that moving forward is literally our job and we, we, I'm taking what I've learned throughout all of this, and I am trying to do that. And so why I'm proud of this resolution is that it does allocate up to $75,000 for um, hiring an executive search firm to assist the mayor and, to, and the search committee, which I had the honor to be a part of, um, to narrow down and ultimately find a permanent police chief, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, but this obviously can't just be any police chief. Like we actually do, need one that's specified to the needs of our community. And we wanna just be able to provide that clear direction. And while you have, I mean, sorry, I don't wanna call anybody out. While the mayor has authority, specific charter authorities, and the council has specific charter authorities, I don't see that as two, I see that as two separate actions, but the process in getting there is collaboration. Um, so I honestly truly believe that our city does deserve the best. And I know that our definition of what that is differs. Um, but we do need to tailor our policies to the needs of the city, and that does take a lot of trial and error. Um, and so I just, 
I want there to be more applicants. Um, we need more applicants that meet more than the minimum requirements. Our city deserves that. We deserve that after all of this time. Um, and we do need, you know, real transformative policing in our city. So um, I feel like people have waited and not not only have they waited, but they've had to like sift through years of very strong media narratives on each side and all the sides and all the angles. Um, and that honestly just completely diluted the entire discussion of racial justice and kind of where we began and how we, you know, I don't like where we've ended up because I don't like the process of what took place. And I don't think anybody feels totally comfortable of Know, how time has gone by with all of this going on. So I think we do need to recenter and continue our work tonight. Um, and that is why I am proud of this resolution. I do think it is a path forward. We're not gonna agree on that, I get that. Um, but you know, we're not, we're not trying to start any issues or, or continue any, any negativity or anything like that because that's ultimately, that never was the goal that was never even part of it. Um, so I just, I want us to move forward tonight. And I know that that's not an easy ask, but just putting that out there. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Hightower to be followed by Councillor Barlow. Um, thank you, President Tracy. Um, I think I have to admit that I'm also a little confused. I am supportive of this resolution. Um, and I think we need to do a real search. And just from someone who wasn't involved in the search process is what I got out of it was that it wasn't a great search process. One person resigned. I, both sides of the aisle didn't seem terribly happy with the way that it went. And the first official thing that I heard from the administration is that we need a special city council meeting to increase the salary with not a whole lot of information given. And I think the response was, what, why, and can we have more information and do we need a special city council meeting? I'm honestly not opposed to potentially raising the salary. I think that the question is, is like, are we raising the salary for a reason? Are we raising it to actually get good candidates? Are we raising it to just raise it for the current candidate pool? Are we gonna raise it and then still only have the current candidate pool? I think that there were questions that we had um, I think the memo that we got, I think goes honestly to me like a step too far because we haven't found the candidate. We don't have the candidate. Um, I think it makes sense to widen potentially the salary in order to get more candidates. But I think some of the other things like if the new person that we hire wanted to prioritize one hire and we've already hired a, sal a job description that we've written without them. I'm not sure that that's, as someone who has stepped into an executive role, it's like, it's nice to be able to come in and have a position that is flexible. So I think it's, I think we're putting a lot of carts before the horses in terms of how we're showing support. I think that the police chief is a very difficult job. Um, I think that we have raised other director salaries over the past couple of years. Um, as the memo I think that we originally got showed, I don't think it's unreasonable to raise the salary. And I think that combining that with an executive search firm makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't think that all of the actions make a lot of sense in terms of deciding for a future chief who we don't even know who that is yet, what the organizational structure should look like <clears throat> of the Burlington Police Department before they've even potentially applied to the job. So I don't mean, a, I don't mean disrespect in supporting this resolution. I think that we need to start to do the things that we will need to have a progressive police chief some of all of which I think was outlined by the mayor, some of which I agree with. And I think some of that is in this resolution. So I will be supporting this. I think that I am supportive of hiring um, a firm, which I think the administration has gone to good lengths to interview and give counselors a chance to talk to um, and also um, that if we think we can get new candidates, 
and that requires a higher salary band, increasing that salary band. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Councillor Barlow to be followed by Councillor McGee. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. Um, this resolution, I think, um, fails for me because it, it, it doesn't, it's not a complete package. I, I do think we need consensus on more than just um, a search. I think a salary is important. We need to make sure we have a salary. We've been told by others that our salary is low and to be competitive with other communities are also looking for chiefs. Um, a, a higher salary I think would be helpful. The other thing I think we need is some consensus around um, you know, what the chief will have in terms of disciplinary authority. Um, in the mayor's memo, he said it was a critical leadership tool for all executive managers. I agree with that. I mean, it doesn't mean that we, it doesn't replace the need for re uh, reforms to increase oversight, but I think we need to have agreement on that as well um, going forward. Um, those are two that I'm, that I'm, sort of stuck on and without those my fear is that we'll go and spend seventy five thousand dollars on a search and be in be sort of in the same place i do think and not i think the climate we've created personally i think the climate we've created makes it difficult to find a candidate that would to want to take on that role and i think that may be in part the reason why we only have two candidates um one of which i think the acting chief is doing an exemplary job right now so um, I won't be supporting this tonight, but I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Councilor Barlow. Councilor McGee. Thank you, President Tracy. <clears throat> um, I will be supporting this resolution tonight um, with some reservations, um, most notably that we seem to continue to spend money on consultants that uh, are telling us what we need to do with our police department when we haven't listened to the reports that we've already uh, received. Um, so I, that's a concern that I have. Um, and to the point of this potentially being problematic for us to move forward in this direction, I think it would be problematic for us to pick a chief uh, without doing our due diligence uh, on behalf of the people of Burlington. I think it would be disrespectful for us to pick a chief without doing our due diligence and hiring an executive search firm for this process because we simply don't know that we're getting the best candidate right now. Um, and, you know, I just want to further say that I think our ability to implement so many of the transfer transformations that we have um, heard that we sorely need in our police department is hindered by the fact that our state law and our city charter make it difficult for us to look for qualified executives outside of a sworn officer pool. Um, I think it would be helpful for us to, in the future, look at uh, potentially ch making changes to our charter and advocating for changes to state law that would allow us for a, allow for us to interview candidates that are um, social workers and uh, have adjacent experience to um, status quo policing. I think that is a vital step for us to examine going forward and um, hope that we can consider that. But um, with this being the resolution we have in front of us tonight, I will be supporting it in hopes that we will find a very qualified candidate to help us implement these changes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McGee. Councilor Jang. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, and I think I have more questions than comments about this resolution. And I think I need to start with the mayor and asking him the question about, you know, the previous chief. Did you hire a consultant to find that search? I think it was 2015. First question. Mayor Weinberger, did you want to answer that question? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. No, the city in my 10 years has never used a search firm for a department head um, uh, search 
um, before. So no, we did not use one in 2015. Thank you. Um, and now the second question is about the process. You know, it seems we appointed a 11 member, you know, hiring committee task force and was just wondering, I heard that the process was not well thought out. It was not well done. And to tell you the truth today, I took a day off just to be able to do my diligence about this important issue for our community. I think uh, Burlingtonians deserve for us to come together and to make one decision that we all feel very good about. But from this resolution and also the comments, it doesn't seem that we are there. And it's unfortunate. Whatever we do, you know, it's not a win for me. Because what I was striving for is the council itself in collaboration with the mayor to appoint a perfect person for the job, right? As part of my due diligence, I did talk to some police chiefs around the county. South Burlington, Colchester, Winooski, even the deputy chief at the state level. And to just, you know, uh, ask them questions about one of the candidates we are contemplating, who I think has done an amazing job has done very, very, very well during a pandemic and to keep the booth steady and to also, you know, have an open line of communication with the council and to try to raise as well the moral of the police department. Whatever it is, it's not a great, wonderful process from my perspective. Now, this is a question for those of us who played a significant role about the hiring process. How many applicants have you received? And was just wondering if you vetted them all by yourself. And also, have you um, interviewed the best of two candidates we are talking about? The mayor is, is talking about uh, that has the qualifications. G uh, Councillor Stromberg or Paul, question for you. Councillor Stromberg or Paul, did you want to take that? Do you? Can you repeat the question? Please. Exactly. Um, you know, paint me a picture about, uh, uh, please, about the uh, the hiring process. How many applications were received? Did you look into all of them? And how did you come up that we have only two best candidates for the job? I can I can start, and then if okay. I'm wrong about sure. something, um, I believe we had something in the high teens, right, for applicants. And then it was kind of whittled down to two that met the minimum requirements for what we were looking for. So I'd say two. Is that right? Or there were there were several more who met the minimum requirements okay. um, in going through vetting that was done by the HR director and the mayor's chief of staff. That that number was that number was narrowed down. But there were more than two that met the minimum right, right. Okay. qualifications. Yeah. We, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think okay. the, I think the better the better person to answer that question was the one that actually did the work, and we have either the mayor or the mayor chief of staff that can right. speak to that. Councilor Cheng, would you like the mayor to speak to that? Please, yes. Mayor Weinberger. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I do feel uh, a need to respond to the idea that there was anything wrong or not professionally wrong about the search. I categorically reject that. We put a great deal of effort uh, in into this, uh, uh, into the process as far as it went. I've never put as much personal time into um, a process, and we were worked very hard to keep a large and diverse uh, uh, a committee that represented many different perspectives uh, in the city um, as well informed as we can. Of course, it's always possible to, to, to uh, uh, see, you know, it's always possible to quibble with, with process. We worked hard to respond to any concerns that were raised. Um, the Initial um, advertisement brought in, um, uh, I believe, was either 18 or 19 um, applications. Those were um, <coughs> divided into categories by the HR director and the chief of staff of uh, applicants that did not meet the minimum requirements of applicants of applicants that were recommended for interviews and then a middle group that was sort of uh, not recommended but was sort of uh, 
Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure the committee um, looked at those quali you know, people that met minimum qualifications and see if they disagreed with the original um, analysis, which said that uh, there were four um, applicants that were worthy of, that had met the minimum requirements and were worthy of, of interviewing. Um, there was no, every member of the search committee got all 19 of those resumes and that categorization and was asked in multiple emails whether uh, people agreed with that categorization and I don't, there were some questions that were raised uh, by email and ultimately I don't believe uh, any, any changes were made to those categorizations. So. Um, and we, at one point, there were four people that we had identified to interview. Um, what we had identified, sorry, to f screen further and then interview. The, it is accurate that the screening um, process identified um, serious problems with two of those four candidates. Those problems were transparently uh, uh, communicated to the search committee and no one disagreed um, ha hearing um, the problems with those candidates with them being removed from the, the interview pool. So that left us with um, uh, only two candidates to interview. Um, during that period, sort of parallel with that period, as I recall, I might have this not quite right, but uh, when counselors were not supportive of raising the salary and wanted to re-advertise, we did re-advertise, and I believe we got uh, two additional applications um, during during that period, and um, uh, neither of which uh, were um, rose to the level that they should receive an interview. So. That is, and that is where the process stopped. It is those, those, there's not been a committee interview uh, of the two candidates um, uh, up to date. The only, the, there were these screening interviews that took place with the chief of staff and the HR director, but those were always intended to be preliminary to a uh, full interview process um, uh, by, with, by the search committee and then ultimately for finalist candidates by me and others. Okay. <clears throat> so it seems also members of the committee, some of them did quit. I mean, the, all of this that I'm asking here today, I'm just making sure that I will make an informed decision because all of it, we did not get any update about what was going on. It's a today, eight o'clock that I started just to understand what was happening. But the more I ask questions and the more I'm getting more confused. From my perspective, the search process was not, could have been done better because I participated for the city and it was very well done. Um, but now this is a question, Mr. Mayor, for you, and it is specific to what if we vote in support of this resolution in front of us, then what would be next for of action from you, Mr. Mayor, if we support this resolution today? Go ahead, Mayor. So, Councilor Jang, uh, as as I tried to indicate um, earlier, I, from my perspective, this this resolution is almost completely non-responsive to the memo that was sent, and you know, I, I which was you know the second letter um, that I sent to the council about about the search and about where we were, which is on top of some prior email communication. So I'm. Not quite sure I understand the idea that we have not been communicating about this. We've certainly been attempting to communicate about what's been going on with the search process. Um, this, um, again, from my perspective, we are in an urgent situation. We need to find a permanent leader of the police department. It is a, it is a situation made even more urgent uh, by the broader um, uh, challenges that we are facing um, with uh, public safety in the city and that uh, our constituents are demanding action on. Um, so this is why, yes, I called for a special meeting back in September to try to give this search process a better chance to succeed. I did think it was worth a special meeting to try to uh, re-change the trajectory of a search that was clearly in trouble and was not going in the right direction. Um, my memo a month ago lays out, said, if the council is serious about wanting to, as I think we all are, I think we all agree, it would be good for the city to have a broad pool of applicants to, to select from. Um, if the council is serious about that being that goal, we have to take urgent 
um, uh, action. We have to pull every lever we can to change the trajectory of the search that only has produced two, uh, two qualified candidates. And um, what has come back tonight is, uh, is, is a resolution that does one of those five things, doesn't introduce sort of, it doesn't introduce any new, uh, new ideas, which I also invited and made clear when we had accounts, the, the floor discussion five weeks ago that, you know, these were my ideas. If anyone had any other ideas about how we would, could uh, uh, restart the search and be successful, I welcome them. So, um, you know, basically what I take this resolution as is in the face of like, a call for urgent, urgent action, there's been after five weeks uh, a very um, uh, de minimis response. And I don't think this leaves me any choice uh, but to do the other alternative that I laid out there, which is to uh, move forward um, uh, with the, the, the candidates um, uh, that we have and, and go through the interview process and move towards uh, appointing one of, one of them. You know, I will say, um, uh, just, you know, to, so counselors can kind of totally understand there's no surprises here. Uh, it, is, it is always my position when searching for department heads that uh, the position remains uh, open until filled. Um, and thus, um, uh, if other, it could be that there, there could be some other candidates that could materialize between the time now and when we are uh, moving towards an appointment, I think that would be um, possible. Uh, and so if I don't want there to be some huge surprise if you know another one or two candidates came forward. I have heard from several search committee members who we've always, throughout this process, we've asked for help from search committees and recruiting candidates. It may be that uh, there are one or two uh, more candidates that become par part of this finalist pool. Um, and I would be, we would be moved very quickly after tonight. And my hope would be our, our to, to try to have a, a candidate in front of the council for confirmation um, by by the end of uh, by the end of January. So um, that's that's what we're looking at. And I you know I do just final point on this. Like I, I it is no one should be fooled into thinking that the vote uh, a vote for this resolution is a vote for a broader pool. Um, no. Uh, the, the, if can't count, the, I was attempting to secure a broader pool and have been trying to do so since the end of September, have been trying to deliver what I think the people of Burlington want, which is a broad pool that does have uh, candidates um, of a variety of backgrounds. We had no women in this pool. That was very concerning to me. That's why I, part, so that's what I, I've been trying to secure that broad pool throughout this process. I raised the alarm flags. The alarm bells on this in late September, and that has been for three plus months now, just completely ignored. So the, 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 let, let no one think that the other side is in good faith attempting to secure a broad pool. Yeah. Councilor Jang. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, those were my questions. Okay, if you're all set, I don't have anyone else in the queue. Councilor Paul. Uh, thanks, President Tracy. Um, so I'm I'm disappointed with uh, I'm disappointed with this resolution, um, and I guess the reason I'm disappointed is because we have an enormous opportunity, um, and I think we're squandering it. Um, you know, I've been on. I don't know, I've sort of lost track of how many. I think I've been on five, maybe six search committees in my time on, on the city council. Um, I was on the police commission when uh, we hired a new chief. Um, and this has been a challenging experience. Um, I think most of the reason it's been challenging is because this is not, uh, I don't know if any any department head is is um, sort of ordinary or you know uh, straightforward, but certainly the uh, searching for a police chief right now is by no means straightforward. Um, you know, I'd like to just talk about salary for a minute, and I think 
To a large degree, this is really an economic argument. It's supply and demand. We are not the only city in the country that is looking for a transformative police chief. Um, we all know that. Um, that is not news to anyone. Um, but who is telling us that we need to raise the salary? Um, experts are telling us that. And for some reason, people are at a loss to, inter to listen to people who do this every day for a living. People who have decades of experience, people who have done dozens of searches, um, even in the last year have done almost two dozen searches, and they are telling us people who interact with candidates for this position every day are telling us that we need to increase the salary. And yet it seems as though other people know better. And I don't understand how someone or some ones who are experts um, that their advice is being disregarded. Um, as a member of the search committee, um, I do think that we very much need a search firm. We've never done it before. In the time that I've been on the council, we have not done it. But these are extraordinary times, and I think that we do need a search firm. So I'm not saying that this was some sort of scientific study. Um, it wasn't. Um, I looked into search firms and extended the offer to, you know, my, well, the administration extended the offer to any counselor to meet with a search firm. Some people took advantage of that, some people did not. Um, those people who did, if the question was asked, it was pretty clear that in order for a search firm to take on a search, they want to be able to know that they can be successful, that they can find what, who we are looking for. We have a search firm who is interested in working with us. They did 20 searches last year. Over the course of the time that they have been doing this work, 64% of the people that they have secured positions for have been from people who are represented, they are candidates from historically marginalized groups when it comes to a police chief. And yet somehow that just wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough that you've got an expert telling you that you need, that you need to increase the salary. So it is not a good use of money to to pay a search firm, even if they're willing to take the work, when you know that they have already told you that they can't really be successful at the current salary range. So that's why I say this is an enormous opportunity to, to, to have a robust pool of candidates, and we are squandering that opportunity. Um, because of that, much as I want a search firm, and much as I feel that is our best path forward to getting a really robust pool of candidates um, that we are looking for, I, I can't support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Paul. I have Councilor um, McGee to be followed by Hanson and Hightower. Thank you. I um, did take the opportunity to speak to um, the search firm that the administration has been talking to. Um, he did offer some pretty valuable insight. That said, the figures that we have seen to justify an increase in the salary have come from cities that don't seem terribly comparable to the size of Burlington or the size of Burlington's police department. Um, I don't think we've heard here tonight that there is a absolute unwillingness to raise the salary. I want to be clear on that, that um, there is support for that in this room. 
uh, on this side of the table. Um, and so to frame this conversation as us being unwilling to, to go there, I think is unfair. Um, I think it's important for us to express that willingness to have that conversation, engage the search firm and have them provide us more analysis that shows that uh, what exactly the range should be for us to increase the salary range to, for us to uh, attract the candidates that, that we need. And, you know, I think I also heard some, um, some points from this search firm that um, are in contradiction to some of the ultimatums that have been provided to this council. Um, and so I would hope that we could acknowledge that there have been some flaws in the process. We don't have all the tools that we currently need to uh, attract a police chief in the competitive environment that exists. And this resolution lays us out on a path to contract this search firm to provide us the guidelines and the expertise and the analysis that we need to make certain changes that might be necessary for us to attract a candidate. So for this to be framed as us being unwilling to compromise, it's um, just pretty unfortunate and I hope that we can see this resolution as what it is uh, moving us towards a path of finding a chief that um, will help us meet our goals. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGee. I have Councillor Hanson to be followed by Councillor Hightower. Thank you. I mean, I, I think there's no question that hiring a search firm would, would broaden the pool, especially given that we're, we're talking about providing them with the tools they need. And yes, again, as we've all said, salary very well might be one of those, and we're definitely open to that. There also may be other things that the search firm may run into as they're out there having these conversations and doing recruitment, and we can respond to that and work with that. It's gonna take some time. It might not happen overnight, but I, I think it's, it's unfair and unfortunate that we're being criticized, those of us proposing this resolution, for you know, not acting sooner or not meeting all the demands of the ultimatum. Any counselor can introduce a resolution at any time. We're the first to actually come forward and try to act on this issue, try to move forward on the police chief issue with this resolution since the point in time that the mayor has laid out these concerns. So we're actually acting more quickly than anyone else on the council. And if councilors supported all the demands in the ultimatum, they could have brought forward a resolution with all the demands. But if you're gonna leave it to, to us, or if, if it's gonna be um, Councilor Stromberg and myself that are bringing forward the resolution, we're gonna bring forward a resolution that we support, that we believe in. So I just, it, it's just bizarre to me that we would be expected to put forth the resolution that other people support. If, if you want to do that, just bring forward your own resolution. Um, so that's what we're doing tonight. We're putting forward a resolution that we believe puts us on a path towards um, finding this type of candidate. And part of that means letting the expert, the search firm, tell us as they're specifically recruiting for those types of candidates, what it is they need to be successful and bringing them into the mix because to date we've, we've not yet brought in a search firm at all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Hightower. Um, that, I think that was really well said by Councillor Hanson. I think if anyone else had brought forward a resolution that said, let's widen the salary um, and hire a search for, firm, I would have been, that, that proposal has never come in the form of a discussion in front of the city council, I would have voted for that proposal. I think that this proposal is a better proposal than what anybody has actually brought to the table. Um, if the proposal is you have to say <clears throat> that you will, that you are supportive of the police chief retaining leadership over officer discipline in order to hire a search firm, I won't do it. I will never vote for that 
I will never vote for that resolution. So to say that we don't support the higher salary, um, that nobody who is voting for this supports the higher salary um, in order to to work alongside the the search firm, I think is very unfair. And I think that, like Councilor Hansen said, he and co-sponsors are bringing this forward because this is what they believe in. If I had brought one forward, it wouldn't have looked quite like this, but this is the one that we're voting on. And I think that this is the best <laughs> proposal that we've gotten. I cannot support a proposal that has all of the items that the mayor gave. Thank you. And it also wasn't brought to the table. So this is the proposal that we have. I'm supportive of this proposal because I'm supportive both of hiring a search firm and of considering an increase in salary to the police chief. So I will be supporting this resolution. Thank you, Councilor uh, Hightower. Sorry, I thought you were finished there. I apologize. Um, Councilor Paul. Thanks very much. Um, well, it sounds like that there are several uh, councilors who um, are not averse to the idea of raising the salary. That's what it sounds like. Um, and if that's the case, then I hope that they will make an amendment to put that in this resolution. That's number one. The second thing is, um, in regards to the uh, uh, memo from the mayor um, in November, uh, there were five items that were mentioned in that memo. One was the search firm, one was increasing the salary, one was, um, uh, and it was actually one of the, one of the um, recommendations in the CNA report was the hiring of a public information officer. There was also um, a recruitment and it was a, a better title than that, but an, a, a position to do with recruitment. And then there was also the issue of police oversight. So since it appears as though, um, despite some people's best efforts, um, since it appears as though opportunities to have these conversations as a way of finding a compromise haven't, haven't panned out as I think some had hoped they would, I think we just sort of need to get this out on the table and for people to understand where, where things are. So my question is to the mayor. In the memo that you put out in November, what are the items that are in that memo that you um, uh, still feel are important enough that in order for you to move forward with a robust search, you need to see. Councilor Paul, there's, there's a number of things. Um, first of all, we need action tonight. Um, we've already been waiting five weeks, um, and it needs to be action that allows us to move forward uh, fully and uh, uh, without hesitation or delay to um, have a successful search. Um, Again, something that is not at all reflected in this in this uh, in this um, uh, in this resolution. Um, uh, I've been clear from the start that I was asked by one of the counselors the night we discussed this: Are any of these ultimatums? Are any of these red lines? Um, uh, I don't see how this could be successful um, without. Um, Without a competitive sal salary, a competitive salary, which um, has, it's not correct to say that the only way that um, a competitive salary has been communicated to counselors is through uh, the um, uh, analysis done by city staff. Um, it is also a very comparable range was communicated um, by the um, professional who has. Um, made himself available, uh, who is a professional search firm, has made himself available to numerous calls, can't, can't, uh, also made that representation. Uh, so a search firm 
the the salary and then um, the counselors uh, you know any any candidate who's considering applying here is going to be aware of the the challenges that have taken place in this city over the last couple of years they're going to be aware of uh, the challenges that chief after chief have have faced um, uh, and the way in which their professional opinion has been disrespected the ways in which um, their professional opinions have been uh, ignored and the attempts that have been made to micromanage uh, the budgets of chiefs so I do think it is very important that and if this if there's a true desire from the council for this to be a successful search uh, to sh to signal that the council um, uh, is going to have the back um, of uh, a new chief coming in here and uh, if the council uh, so those are my ideas I laid out the three ideas of how they could do that um, I understand that the uh, discipline is cheap uh, continues to um, be a challenge for some counselors uh, I don't understand that and that what was proposed there was not that the chief remain in total control um, of the discipline in fact I have been um, against that just that there would be some leadership role preserved for a chief uh, the fact that we peers are going to go through another town meeting day now where uh, definitively um, uh, that is um, not going to be on the town meeting day ballot from uh, the council bringing it forward uh, I think does allow me to um, you know I guess we can can wait and continue to debate that another day um, if, if that's uh, what the you know where the counselors are at you know, the other two I think are important and are ones that should be embraced by the council. I, I appreciate that those are ones you feel should be embraced by the council, but what I'm asking you is of the items that you had mentioned in that memo, is it fair to say that the uh, hiring a search firm, giving them the tools to be successful by increasing the salary and agreeing in principle with the CNA recommendation of a public information officer would be that you would be then amenable to having this robust search. Um, I think the, chief, the, 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 the civilian public information officer um, is something called out for by the CNA report. Um, uh, I think it's going to be would be critical. It's a, it's something that was called out as a deficiency um, uh, in the department currently. It's something any chief would would benefit from. And uh, yes, I think that would be an important one to include. There could be other ideas as well, as I've been saying for five weeks. Well, what it sounds like I'm hearing, and you know, again, these are this is. I mean, I, I looked at the resolution. Um, I think that you know there it would be it would it would not be impossible. It would be a little bit difficult at this hour, but it would not be impossible if there is. Um, and I you know before even going through with that, I think uh, if there is an appetite by the sponsors to want to see this resolution pass and to want to bring about a continuation of the search process with the robust search, then uh, there are probably two resolve clauses that need to be included. One um, that would supporting the increased posted salary um, range, which is currently 119,000 to 139. Um, and posting that at 139 to 165,000, which is what the consultant said uh, was a doable range. And then um, for the 
Council to agree in principle with the CNA recommendation for a public information officer. Um, before we would even get into the nitty gritty of doing something like that, um, I think it would, the only reason to do that would be if there was um, a desire on the part of the sponsors to see this pass um, and to see us take this enormous opportunity and, and move forward with it. Um, so those are my thoughts. Um, and uh, I guess so I'll wait to hear from are, are others. I'm not, an amendment, I'm, not gonna, I, I'm not gonna offer an amendment and get into that unless I feel like there is some desire to move forward in that way. And so I'll have to wait and to see if there is. Um, I tried very hard um, over the last week and a half to see if others could find that compromise and it didn't happen. So I'm trying to do that here tonight. Thank you, Councilor Paul. I don't have anyone else in the queue. Councilor Shannon. Thank you. Um, I had reached out to constituents after the, after the mayor's letter to get input from them on how they were feeling about the hiring process and specifically whether or not um, they thought uh, hiring a search firm was a good idea. And I think what came out of that that was particularly helpful was um, there are a lot of people in the community that have a lot more experience than I do with hiring and hiring leadership positions. And people were very surprised to find out that we have two qualified candidates that we didn't bother to interview. And um, when they had that piece of information, they were pretty disturbed that we had stopped the process at that point. There's a very, very strong desire in this community to stabilize our police department and um, hire somebody as soon as possible. And if there are two qualified candidates, as um, one of my constituents who really had probably more experience than anybody else who reached out to me said, every candidate should be treated like gold. And um, what we're doing with this police search is the very opposite of that. Uh, if we don't have qualified candidates, if we have a failed search, then that's when we should look at hiring a search firm, taking additional steps. But until that is exhausted, the fact that the numbers are few should be no surprise to anybody. And I appreciate the mayor's optimism that we should have this robust pool with all kinds of different applicants, but we have not created an environment here where that is a likely outcome with or without a search firm. That was one thing that many people had said who had hired search firms is often the results are not what you would hope. It is a gamble to hire a search firm. They may or may not produce something better than what we have. So let's be sure before we take that step that we have exhausted the possibilities, that we have interviewed our candidates, that we have, um, determined that we, we should be giving these candidates a chance. The idea that we're asking these candidates to stay in the pool, there's a possibility that the end of the process, we have no candidates at all. I don't think Burlington is in a position to wait for a perfect candidate. We're we're very unlikely to find a perfect candidate. And we have good qualified candidates from what we know at this point. So the reason I did not offer something new was because I think what should happen is we should continue the process and make every effort to hire from the pool of candidates that we have. Thank you. Okay, don't have anyone else in the queue. Are we ready to go to a vote? I, I, I want to say something. Councilor Jen, go ahead. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, to Councilor Shannon's point about, you know, we already created an environment. And from my perspective, 
if we do not reopen the hiring search, that environment will continue. Polarization between the council, we're not coming together, and whoever comes, it will be they against us. This resolution in front of us, it was already portrayed that way. They did not bring, we brought. Basically, the reason why it is important for us to bring this process back forward. Burlington City Council, we have a unique opportunity to de definitely demonstrate what true collaborative leadership is about with the search process of the new police chief. This is a chance of a lifetime, and from my perspective, we should not rush it. Yes, we did cause this body, we caused harm by making decisions to slash the police with no due process. Do I want to repeat it? I do not want to repeat that. Right? Some stakeholders might think that, yes, we made progress. I do not disagree. I completely agree. But what I agree the most is every single one of us, we want what's best for this city. The problem we encountered, our problem we created, and we need to move forward. Right? This appointment, you know, of the next police chief should not be by any means politics. Yeah, we have the opportunity to show our best work. Yes, by coming together with this critical decision, by appointing one of the best two candidates for the appointment of this job. But what I have heard from the process of, you know, how did we come down to those two uh, best candidates? I was not happy. But no one, no one that I have talked to today that worked directly or indirectly, let's say indirectly with the police chief, they only said great, wonderful things. But have we asked those that he worked with very closely? From my perspective, I believe that, you know, um, because we talk internally, that acting chief Mirad has demonstrated the commitment, you know, uh, the, the expertise in providing the best policing in the 21st century. Um, and he never shied away also in, in participating in critical decision, he, never. He's a great, great, wonderful person. But the process from my perspective is not well done. And if we allow the mayor to just hire one of those people, the polarization will continue. Reason why I'm going to support the resolution in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jang. We don't have anyone else in the queue. Are we ready to vote? Okay. Don't have anyone in the queue, so we'll go to a vote. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Councilor Barlow? No. Councilor Carpenter? No. Councilor Jang? Yes. Councilor Hanson? Yes. Councilor Hightower? Yes. Councilor Mason? No. Councilor Paul? No. Councilor McGee? Yes. Councilor Shannon? No. Councilor Strongberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. Six ayes, five nays, one absent. The resolution carries. We are now on to our next item, which is 5.06, a request for additional uh, funds to provide relief for property tax lag. Councillor Carpenter. Um, um, I would like to move the proposal as presented in board docs. I don't have in front of me. Uh, sorry about that. Is that adequate or? So are you waiving the reading as well? And waive the reading and ask for the floor back. Okay, so we have a motion from Councilor Carpenter. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Barlow. Go ahead, Councilor Carpenter. Um, just to say, um, first off, thanking CAO Shad and her team for pulling this together. Um, Councilor Barlow and Councilor Hansen and I 
um, over the last week. I've spent a lot of time sort of massaging this. It was really difficult to um, get our arms around. There's a lot of moving parts. The intent is to, for uh, some number of our citizens um, to be assisted with the problem that was created, or wasn't created, that um, comes about when um, getting the homestead credit from the state of Vermont. Um, they base the homestead credit on your last year's income and your last year's taxes, not your current year's taxes. Because we had so much change this year, um, some number of people were really harmed for that. They will hopefully be made whole next year, but we have this one year problem. And there's a lot of moving parts. The proposal um, uses house value. It uses um, the amount of credit you got last year, that being a proxy for um, you having some sense of need. Um, the other proxy is how much money we want to put in it, which we have capped. And that's all laid out in the latest proposal from CAO Shad. So, um, again, Councilor Barlow, Council Hanson, and I looked at it. We, we filled with a spreadsheet, and I think I feel comfortable best we can. This will serve um, reasonably the most number of people that we know how to get to. Because it's got cutoffs, we're going to miss people, and there'll still be some unhappy people. Um, but I think for the minute, this is the best that we can offer, and I, and I just encourage us all to, to support this. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Don't have anyone else in the queue. Council, oh, sorry, Councillor McGee. Thank you. I just had a quick question uh, for the administration and the CAO. Um, if we pass this resolution tonight, how much time will it take for us to roll this program out? CAO Shad, are you available to answer that? Of course, thanks, President Tracy and Councillor McGee. Um, so the way this program is rolled out is there's uh, just over a thousand uh, preliminarily eligible taxpayers. Um, and if you approve this tonight, uh, just after the first of the year, we will mail each of them a letter and we will do everything we can to have uh, the credits applied for the March 12th uh, quarterly property tax payment that is the next payment due. Great, thank you so much. I'll be supporting this tonight. I had hoped that we would uh, get this going faster, but recognize that there was uh, some significant need that uh, um, we didn't initially recognize. So looking forward to uh, getting the support to folks. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, don't have anyone in the queue, so let's go to a vote. All those in- Sorry, I have, Councilor I have my hand raised, sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, I just wanted to thank everyone who's worked on this. This is really critical. People, there's folks really, really struggling economically right now, and, and this is something that is is getting money, you know, directly into people's hands that that clearly need it. And and this formula, you know, ensures that it is folks that are that are really needing that support right now. And so, this is this is. It's obviously not enough and, and folks are still gonna be struggling, but this is a bit of a lifeline that we can provide and I'm glad that we're, we're moving forward and, and using some of this um, federal money to, to, to get directly to folks who, who've been so impacted by, you know, not only the pandemic and the economic crisis, but also um, by the reappraisal process as well. And so, um, it, it means a lot that we're getting this support out to folks. Thanks. Thanks, Councilor Hanson. Anyone else? Okay, don't have anyone, so let's go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Is that opposed or in favor, Council Hanson? Sorry. Support, aye. Okay. Was there anyone opposed? Okay, that is unanimous. Brings us to our final resolution of the evening, the renewal and amendment of the COVID-19 public face covering mandate to encourage safe practices and vaccinations. Councilor Shannon.
Move to waive the re reading and adopt the resolution. I don't need the floor back. Seconded by Councillor Mason. Any further discussion? Yes, I'll just quickly. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that this is a really smart thing to do, especially as we all gather inside. It's getting really cold. Um, our numbers are as bad as they've ever been. Everywhere around us is basically doing kind of the same trend that we are. Um, yeah, it's pretty scary. Everybody I know at least knows one person that is currently like, has a positive oh, case. Um, and yeah. I myself got tested a bunch this week just because of, I haven't been out that much, but of just because of people I know and just quick contact. And um, yeah, it's very real, very prevalent. And I know we all want to be able to see our families in the yep. new year and, and start 2022 off well. So I think we do need to really double down and and be serious about this in the next few weeks to make sure that we're setting up for success. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm very supportive of this and I hope uh, people can, can really kind of follow strictly what it says. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stromberg. Any other councillors wishing to speak on this? Uh, Councillor Hightower. Yeah, and I'll be brief as well. Um, as another breakthrough COVID case, I think I just want to take a second. I know that we have a lot of contentious issues on council, and I think um, this is a contentious issue across the country, and I'm just grateful that we have a council that passed this unanimously, and I hope continue will continue to pass this unanimously despite all the other contentious things that we deal with. So I just want to mark some gratitude for how often we actually do vote unanimously. Thank you, Councilor Hightower. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. We've completed our deliberative agenda and a motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilor McGee. Second. Seconded by Councilor Stromberg. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned at 12.08. Thank you, everyone. Happy New Year. Yeah.